Welcome to the Galaxy Summit 2022. I'm your moderator. First, let's give it a round of applause. Thank you, the organizer Hive Ventures, for hosting today's event. We also like to thank ASVDA from NDC for your support for the second year in a row. So today we not only have a live event, we also have live stream online, inviting a series of great speakers around the world to explore more topics 
on the future of enterprise. Before we begin, I'd like to invite you to think about, to imagine what the future enterprise was like. Throughout the past two years, we've been working from home. Um, a lot of topics have emerged, metaverse, decentralization. Are we going to see more decentralized business models in the enterprise landscape? And today we will discuss, we will focus on key technologies and their impact on business operation. High Ventures has observed that since the pandemic started, businesses have adopted AI technologies to a greater extent. IG and F5G and IoT have also contributed to more applications. Uh, people have been talking about NFT, metaverse, and it seems a transition from a centralized to a decentralized operating model is taking place. So we hope today's event uh, will bring a lot of insights and wisdom to you to navigate the future of enterprise. Now I'd like to invite the founder and managing partner of High Ventures, Yan Li, to give us the opening address. Deputy Minister Gao from NDC, ASVDA, Deputy Chief Executive Ms. Tsai, AI Academy and Mr. Tsai, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Yen, the founder of Five Ventures. Thank you all for being here today at our Galaxy Summit. Starting from last year, we've had this wish. We, we hope through our team of six people, we could help Taiwan from small and medium enterprises to startups to contribute to more exchange and discussions in technology. And this little wish has actually resonated with so many people. I'm very grateful for the support from NDC, SVDA, and a Taiwan AI Academy. We've had this common goal. We all hope that we could bring in new insights, fresh thinking, thought leadership to Taiwan. And with this support, we are able for us, a small team, to do more to scale up our Galaxy Summit. And this year, we hope the Galaxy Summit could be a portal, a portal to the world, a gateway to the world, but also an invitation for the world to know, to understand Taiwan. This year, we've invited more than 40 speakers from Europe, the States, Southeast Asia, Taiwan, and the metaverse. We've had scholars, experts, businessmen, entrepreneurs, people from all walks of life together together to talk about 5G, AI, big data, blockchain, and all kinds of new technologies, as well as best practices and business cases. We've also provided simultaneous interpretation at the same time and broadcast this event live to the whole world. We are inviting the world to understand Taiwan a bit better through this year's Galaxy Summit. We're also taking Taiwan to the world stage. Today, we are having uh, guest speakers and representatives from across 32 funds at the Grand Hyatt Hotel to have a private road show. Through this, we hope 
we could leverage our experience of IPO in the States and help local investors to connect to the world market. But all this doesn't come easy, right? A few days ago, we were still prepping for today's event and the uh, pandemic, the Epidemic Command Center in Taiwan, the CDC in Taiwan, reported more than 80 new local cases. And that got us nervous. And after 16 hours, we came up with a response plan, hoping to give you a really safe and secure event for all of our guests today. And because of this, we have to shrink the scale of our event from hosting more than 1,200 people to a, a smaller event. So here I'd like to apologize for more than 1,000 um, attendants, participants who could have joined us today. We hope we could do a better job next year and invite you to join us at Presence. A lot of companies like us are shrouded in this uncertainty by the COVID-19 pandemic, which has raged around the world, uh, causing a lot of lockdowns and, and business impact. At this moment, companies are especially vulnerable. There are winners and there are losers from this pandemic. We believe that the difference between the winners and losers lies in how they react to the pandemic, how they react to the world situation. At this hour of uncertainty, at this time of challenge, maintaining agile and flexible is the key to taking an enterprise to the next level. In such a predictable, unpredictable environment, if this is going to be the new normal, we need this agility and flexibility to allow us to morph into the future enterprise. This year's theme is the future enterprise, which seeks to explore how technology, how companies use technologies to have that advantage and become uh, the dominant in the future. This year and future Galaxy Summits are a way for us to lead you, to guide you, to explore the galaxy, like the galaxy in the astrophysics. We hope we could all be brave, adopt an open mind to step out of our comfort zone, to step out of Taiwan and connect to the world. I'd like to thank all the support and our sponsors today. And thank you all for joining us today for this year's Galaxy Summit. The event officially began now. Thank you. I hope you enjoy. Thank you, Yen. Now we'd like to welcome, invite Deputy Minister of National Development Council, Ms. Gao Xiangui for opening address. Let's welcome her. Founder, Mr. Yan Li uh, William from the Harvard University. Uh, Chairman Huang. Chairman Yang and Chairman Yang, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. First, I'd like to welcome you to Galaxy Summit, co organized by ASVDA and Hive Ventures. My thanks really go to Hive Ventures, which is a big supporter, promoter for Taiwan's tech industry 
to connect to the world. And I'm very looking forward to all of your insights on AI, blockchain, 5G, and other latest technologies. As you all know, AI, 5G, and blockchain have led to the third wave of internet resolution, which has really revolutionized our lives and had played an important role in a nation's competitiveness. In President Tsai's second term, at her inaugural address, she said, we, Taiwan, need to grasp this opportunity and build a tech infrastructure to build both our hardware and software soft power industries. We know the business opportunities are massive with 5G and IoT. And for the government, we can play two roles. First, to leverage our resources and build a solid foundation, internet foundation for Taiwan as a resilience uh, communication com nation. We've invested in around 50 billion new Taiwan dollars in 5G coverage and telecom infrastructure. The 5G coverage in Taiwan has reached around 90%. We are also working on building undersea cables. We also pledged that this year will be the first year, this beginning point of Taiwan's uh, space development. We are going to launch our own satellite soon in 2026. And this June, The spectrum of LEOs will begin. And I think it also will mark a milestone for us. And the second role the government could play is to uh, think outside the box, to train more talent, to uh, build an enabling environment, to really promote a well-rounded tech ecosystem. As you all know, tech talent is in huge demand across the world. With fast rapid, rapid development of IT and digital industries, uh, this kind of talent is in dire need. So we are focusing on promoting talent training, talent development in these key industries, using university industry collaboration to cultivate more digital talents for Taiwan. We use the model of PPP, a private public partnership to train talent, local talent. In addition, we also want to invite our talent overseas to come back to Taiwan. So we are really grateful to a lot of uh, you today. We've given out more than 4,000 uh, employment, gold employment cards, bringing in our overseas experts coming back to Taiwan and help us connect to um, Silicon Valley's around the world. So thank you all for your contribution, uh, for your investment in startups. We are very grateful for having uh, Ms. Tai today. She said that we now the NDC fund has invested in more than 150 startup funds. 
we've also worked with several funds to reach a capital of 10 million 10 billion new taiwan dollars here at ndc we also want to guide more um, investment from the insurance industry that's why we also uh, came up with a program for eligible uh, startups they could be awarded with a grant from the insurance industry so a lot of companies who uh, might not yet be that mature could also have access to capital and with all these we aim to build enabling environment today we're also happy to have the ceo from svda the project really aims to provide an experiment field for all these startups. So until now, ASVDA has worked with uh, many stakeholders and completed more than 250 smart city projects that could even be exported to the world. So Taiwan is in a critical moment of transition. We could play a so I think we could play a key role here. Finally, I'd like to thank High Ventures for organizing today's Galaxy Summit. Today, we have so many guest speakers, key players in the industry who gather together to find a better way, a better future for Taiwan. Eventually, finally, thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Now I'd like to uh, invite all the guests our three founding fa founding partners to stage and the Mr. Lee from the ASVDA, Mr. Tsai from NDC and Taiwan AI Academy, um, Mr. Kong and the uh, provost, Mr. Tsai, SBTI president, Mr. Yang, Yang Qihang. Please come onto the stage for a group photo. Okay, uh, uh, hold the signs, please. Please stand closer to the middle. So please look at the center at our cameraman. Okay, thank you. Is that all? Thank you, thank you. Thank you all our distinguished guests for joining us today. Now we will uh, welcome our first guest keynote speaker who will introduce to us uh, distributed AI systems. Now I'd like to welcome William Gates Professor of Computer Science and Electrical Engineering, Harvard University. He is a key contributor to Taiwan's AI education. Today, he's going to introduce to us distributed AI systems. Let's welcome him.
I'm very honored to have this opportunity to talk to you today. I know we have a lot of friends online. I thought I was able to meet a lot of my friends, but unfortunately, because of the pandemic, that was not uh, a possibility. But I'd still like to take this opportunity to talk to you all about new uh, advancements and maybe hopefully inspire you. I will only be sharing my own insights. So if I'm going uh, down a rabbit hole or becoming too specific, please let me know. I want to give you a broader vision and perspective. So my topic today is the distributed AI systems. I will only be having this uh, speech for 15 minutes. So we'll just quickly review this. Uh, just a few comments about the AI industry. I think it's uh, very challenging. Two years ago, uh, we did, we collected information and realized that in 2019, there were 120,000 peer reviewed AI papers published. If you suppose that you only read 5% of these papers, you'd have to read 16 papers every single day. I can only read around three papers a day. So the development is very fast. How can we stay on top? Is somebody flipping the sides for me? Okay, thank you. So we need to have um, our own angle and perspective, otherwise, otherwise we will get lost in all this information. So one of the useful angles that I'd like to talk about today is distributed systems. So distributed computing is a very uh, mature technology. In the past decade and two decades, we've seen distributed database transactions um, applied to different databases. Uh, 20, this was 20 years ago, 30 years ago that I've been engaging in this research. I'm sure everybody knows that cloud computing is also very impressive. It's easier to scale management on the cloud. Um, and we also, for example, edit on uh, Google Docs concurrently. Whether you're in the States or in Taiwan, you'd be able to concurrently edit the documents. These are uh, distributed uh, technologies that we are still using every single day. As AI systems become a dominating computing paradigm, um, I think it is very natural for us to uh, um, apply distributed AI. Distributed AI is not um, just for our simple applications, but let me share some with you. Some of these more simple ones, for example, multiple network connected GPUs using thousands of GPUs to train large language language models. This is a very routine practice. Um, there's also federated learning uh, where we can help each other from different sites, for example, using uh, developing next world predictions on smartphones. Uh, information trained in the US can also be applied in Taiwan as long as they share that data. As long as the suppliers know how to use uh, the operating systems and the local preferences. Um, but there are still challenges for distributed AI systems. First of all, how do we reduce energy consumption in training and reference? How do we decrease latency in efference? The prediction latency cannot be 100 minutes a second. It has to be 10 milliseconds or even less. Management has to manage non-IID data which is 
data from different groups and just because it will have different distributions. Um, this is independent, identically distributed data. It has to be non-independent because it will allow, uh, we also have to ease model sharing to allow others to help. And we also have to ease the reuse of models in order to increase efficiency because every single development, every single model requires hundreds of people. We need to try and reuse that model. Um, I'll now move on to um, a pro some approaches to address these challenges. These are example works that I developed at my labs. For example, purpose-built ASIC accelerators, neural networks uh, that doesn't go through every single layer, but we can have a use early exit inference. Um, AI distributed AI can be applied on the edge, and it entirely depends on how complex this issue is. Simple issues can now be resolved on the edge or local servers. Um, with more head-mounted systems, used to be very large, it will grow, it will develop and become smaller and smaller and become to have more functions, which will allow for more distributed computing, even on our glasses. Uh, maybe we'll have four or five cameras on these glasses and each camera will be able to do independent processing. So uh, basically distributed computing on head mounted systems. Now this model does not require a uh, training from the ground zero every single time. What we're considering right now is how do we use trained components, piece them together to create a new model that does not require training or a significant amount of data. This is definitely relevant to blockchain the model fragments or the components can be even sold in the future on the blockchain. So this is, there's endless possibilities. So um, I'd like to dive further into these approaches. Um, we're very fortunate right now because we can uh, we can develop general special computing right now. This is something that we are capable of doing right now. So we develop accelerators for AI and that becomes general special computing. As such, we're able to invest in very specialized domains with very high efficiency. This is why there are so many AI chips in development. This is something we haven't seen in decades, but we've been seeing this recent in the past five years. Many high-tech companies are currently investing in this area right now. This is why um, at National Tsinghua University, I've been teaching about um, AI accelerators, and I will also be traveling to the South um, on April 4th to teach about uh, AI accelerators at NCKU as well. I hope I'd like to invite all the um, circuit companies and other companies to come and listen to this speech as well. I think there are a lot of people that have signed up for the. There are two two hundred people that have already signed up for the conference. Uh, we only have one hundred twenty seats. Maybe uh, we can try and get a seat if possible. So let's talk about the second one. Um, so with the input coming in, we, and the exit, the latency will become very low. 
some computing capabilities are put on the edge or put on the cloud. This is an example of distributed deep neural network. This is could this could be on glasses, having many uh, cameras on glasses is Uh, the key is how to have the processing on the front ends, but then also on maybe on a small chip may, uh, on the on the other side of the glasses. So we need to understand how to layer it or how to cut it up. This has to be. Uh, we need to learn about how to do this through training. I'm sure this is something that you're very interested in. Or how do we use a uh, blockchain to uh, how to how to create AI computing technologies that is that can be reused and even sold on the blockchain? Uh, there are an increasing amount of components that can be captured extracted into fragments that can be pieced together to, to create models of their own. And then the models can be resold on the internet. Years ago, we wrote a paper uh, regarding this approach, how we can, how we can use blockchain for AI commerce. This is um, a little bit far off, but this is something that we're thinking about right now. So th these things are not necessarily um, relevant to everybody, but I think it's uh, interesting to discuss and maybe we'll give you a new perspective. So maybe we can think about this distributed AI systems because computing has already evolved into distributed computing in the past. And now we will see AI evolving into distributed AI systems as well. Now that we have this perspective and angle, we will be able to gain control of a lot of different approaches. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Kung. Last year, High Ventures first issued the State of Taiwan Enterprise AI report and was well received by media. It showed um, everyone Taiwan's development in AI industries. Now let's take a look at uh, Taiwan's latest development in AI industries. Let us welcome Mr. Yen Li to share with us the State of Taiwan Enterprise AI report. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's me again. We are now uh, live, broadcast live. And now I'd like to switch to English to present the State of Taiwan Enterprise AI Report. The 2022 State of Taiwan Enterprise AI Report. AI Report is a project we started last year to try to unveil the mystery surrounding AI adoption in Taiwan. While AI has been a raging buzzword globally over the past few years, its adoption has been relatively nascent. And while many have tried to take that bold leap, only very few have successfully crossed that chasm of disillusionment. So in our second ever edition this year, we continue to help businesses, dis decision makers, and solutions providers understand where everyone is in this adoption cycle and share trends with the industry at large. At High Ventures, we are believers and first movers in this space. We have dedicated our past careers over the past decade, as well as our future upon this space. And we continue to believe that this is where we will lay the foundations of the future economies for decades to come. And that is also why we've embarked on this journey to on this nationwide survey to continue to understand and study the dynamics of the market in hopes of identifying opportunities that exist in these markets. 
And we're very glad to have partners like the AI Academy of Taiwan, uh, the ASVDA, the National Development Council, and many others today that have helped us make this report possible. The online survey, we conducted this survey over about a month between January and February this year, and we collected uh, results from a range of different industries, from manufacturing to semiconductor to banking, finance, and healthcare, amongst many others. And these also come from a range of different sizes of companies. We have about 50% of these companies representing our small, medium businesses, and the other half represents our large conglomerates that are very representative of their economic structure in Taiwan. Now, we then classified these responses into different company maturity levels based on the respective weighted average scores of the component category from data readiness, team readiness, operational readiness, and to help us derive the final enterprise maturity score and level. So what exactly is the enterprise AI uh, maturity cycle? This is a model that we created to understand how businesses think, decide, experiment, and implement AI technologies within the enterprise. So from level zero, where companies are just starting to be aware of AI technologies and its potential benefits, but have yet to take any action, to level one, where they're establishing the data infrastructure upon which future AI applications will be built upon. Then level two, where the basic infrastructure has been kind of completed, uh, then businesses move on to build uh, business cases and POCs or proof of concepts to start experimenting with these use cases. And at level three, these companies have probably improved an investment into the R&D development and buying the tools and solutions or identifying partners to work with together on this initiative. Then level four, where AI is operationalized. More models are being built, more and more are being deployed, and they're starting to see the starting value, the initial value from a business value from within the organization. And level five is where that those, these models and values start to proliferate across various different business units within the organization. It usually starts from one core business unit and starts expanding laterally across a wider area in an organization. And finally, to level six, where AI essentially is part of daily operations and it's already within the enterprise DNA. So while there's much to discuss in the report, let me just walk through, uh, walk everyone through the key salient highlights of the report this year and some of the trends that we see. Overall, what we do see is that there is a huge improvement of the entire ecosystem this year. As you can see on the chart on the right, uh, these charts, rep these bars represent uh, the distribution of all the companies that we've surveyed across the entire en uh, enterprise maturity cycle. So what we, what we see is that on the blue bars, those represent 2021, and the pink bar represents this year's report. We've seen an entire systematic shift towards the right side, which is higher maturity levels across the board. And especially, you'll realize that in last year's survey, about 50% of all respondents are within the level zero to two, the baby steps of AI adoption. And now this year, 50% of them, to be, for, to be exact, 48.7% of them are already in the level four and six, the growth stages. We see the largest change between the level three and the level four companies. One other interesting to note, uh, point to note is that in last year's survey, no companies actually made the level six category. But this year, we have four companies that moved on into this category where AI is part of the enterprise DNA and they're beginning to see democratization. These four companies come from the high-tech manufacturing, banking, finance, and healthcare sectors. So this acceleration and adoption, we think a, a big part of that was spurred on by the fact that the pandemic finally hit Taiwan last year. Uh, as you may all know, Taiwan was actually relatively shielded from the early onslaught of the entire global pandemic. Um, but last year in May, we started to have our first taste of local transmissions and heightened alert across Taiwan. Now, most of us have been able to escape unscathed, but, uh, and probably have done relatively well in this aspect, but many businesses have su suffered in this process. And their global counterparts have actually experienced that pain earlier on the pandemic. 
Now, while this taste of pandemic has really spurred many, uh, many respondents to feel that the company has actually sped up or increased their demand for AI in response to the uncertainty of the pandemic and the market. Now, 58% of respondents uh, have actually that sense of urgency already, whereas there are still 42% that are A, they've already engaged in AI adoption even before the pandemic, and so you don't experience any net new uh, kind of urgency, or they're still sitting on the fence and slow to respond to all of that. Sorry. Globally, we're also seeing that many companies uh, have shifted their urgency. I think acceleration across global companies in Taiwan, I think that's a common theme. But in the rest of the world, we're seeing that many of them actually have changed their focus instead of just accelerating, uh, shifted their focus into building business resilience and deriving market insights from uh, adopting AI. But if we shift that focus to Taiwan, though, we see that most businesses are still favoring uh, revenue generating functions and in production itself. And in another part of our research this year, we also see that a lot of that key concern and objective is towards increasing efficiency or even cost reductions in the production lines. I think it's um, not surprising. After all, Taiwan has been able to build enterprise success in our history based on our ability to manage costs and to control spending, especially through hard times. Now, we saw that manufacturing uh, adoption as a business unit has surpassed last year's leaders of sales and marketing and become the number one focus for most of our respondents this year. But I think the core focus is still in cost control. Now, while we forecasted last year that this trend should start evolving towards from the front end business units, the revenue generation ones towards the rearward back office operations or warehousing and logistics, we expected that trend to happen this year. Well, the trend hasn't been very evident uh, yet, whereas actually we focus even more on the front end. But what we did see is that more and more business units are adopting it, which shows what we call the proliferation. So according to last year's report, there were on average 1.66 business units adopting AI uh, and its applications within the organization, but this year we're coming close to two. Now we expect this trend to continue, obviously, but uh, we're, we hope that enterprises, companies can actually take this opportunity today to really leap forward and accelerate and see more proliferation across the entire uh, industry. Now, one other trend that we do see also is the commoditization of AI technologies and its applications. Um, I think we've mentioned earlier that Taiwan is a very results-oriented uh, culture. And as a result, um, I think a lot of the core technologies that we're adopting actually come from in applications that leverage on these technologies. So for example, uh, in manufacturing, uh, automated Optical Inspection, AOI, or Robotic Process Aut uh, Automation, RPA, leverage on different levels of computer vision, vision AI, and that has allowed uh, many industries in Taiwan to actually adopt this. So vision AI is popularly adopted within production lines to uh, detect yield and or de defects in manufacturing from glassware to printed circuit boards to laptops and mobile phones. And it has already become a very popular and common practice, but we're seeing more and more R&D going into these uh, fields to increase the performance, greater consistency, and, low, and higher statistical accuracy as compared to what humans are capable of. And on the other hand, uh, the abundance of marketing technology and chatbot companies in Taiwan has escalated the adoption of natural language processing and understanding, or NLP, NLU technologies, into the hands of enterprises today. So many of them leverage on these services to automate social media engagements uh, across Facebook, Instagram, Line, and to really uh, leverage on these technologies to understand the sentiments of their users, customer satisfactions, and whatnot. So, uh, that has actually brought NLP and NLU to be one of the most popularly adopted technologies in Taiwan today, too. Now, another trend that we think is really optimistic that will continue to support this kind of uh, commoditization, commoditization of technologies is the willingness for our enterprises to start adopting open source. Now, even our largest and most conservative industries and conglomerates are now 
taking that, embracing this technology, uh, embracing open source, and bringing these into their internal development, as opposed to just leveraging on traditional bespoke systems. And I think that has empowered a new level of flexibility and access to latest technologies uh, for these enterprises. It has been also very encouraging to see that not only many more companies are adopting AI and, uh, and uplifting the entire ecosystem. It is also encouraging to see that many of them have actually taken the bold leap to operationalize it, to really bring it into daily operations across uh, and developing more and more models. So last year, we've reported that Taiwan's model deployment rates, uh, so we call, uh, that were actually higher than the global average of 20%. What 20% what means is that uh, globally, out of five models that are developed within an enterprise, one of them is being deployed into active production. But in Taiwan, this number actually increased even further this year. So we're seeing out of four models developed in Taiwan, at least two to three models are actually in live production. Now, this is a really high number and much higher than the global average. But uh, I think the efficiency, again, partially driven by a very results-oriented culture. So we develop what we know we will use, but also is driven by um, the, the um, platforms that have been built to allow this level of scaling within the, the company. And not only are we developing more, we are developing a lot faster. So compared to the previous year too, survey companies have on average improved 50% in terms of their uh, model deployment speeds. So last year, 38% of the companies were able to deploy models in less than a month. Uh, but uh, sorry, this year is 38%, last year was 25%. And if we narrow this down, there are now twice as many companies who are already able to uh, deploy models in less than seven days. I think the popularization of the concept of machine learning operations, ML ops, its processes and the platforms itself have really expedited this change uh, to greater speed. Last but not least, we see very, very aggressive and ambitious plans in many enterprises going forward. Uh, these companies intend to develop and deploy a lot more and a lot faster in this year going forward. Most companies surveyed uh, across all different types of experience levels and, and um, uh, maturity, they've planned to develop as many models this year as they did in the history of them adopting AI or building models. So that means that within this year alone, we're expecting to see at least a double in the number of models being developed. And if we hold up the same kind of model deployment rates and speeds, uh, that's actually twice the amount of um, models in production that we may actually see. Uh, and for some of the most uh, AI savvy companies uh, in our research this year, we see that they expect to develop and deploy at least 50 models and above. We think these numbers are actually a little aggress uh, overly aggressive in our opinion, but if these companies actually do hold the model deployment rates and the speeds uh, and keep up, then it might just have a good chance of happening. And it will be exciting to see what pans out this, the rest of this year. So while we are very excited for these ambitious plans, we actually share a lot of the concerns that our respondents had this year regarding the challenges of deploying AI and scaling it within their organization. We believe that the fundamental fabric for AI deployment needs to be in place within an organization in order for these ambitious plans to actually succeed. Now, the data infrastructure, the operational processes, and the team capabilities, the platforms for scaling, these must be in place in order to ensure that your scaling doesn't hit the bottlenecks. And if worse, uh, it might actually create system-wide breakdowns. We see that out of all these respondents, including the ones who are very aggressive in their plans this year, over 61% are still wrangling with what we call early stage problems, including data collection, talent supply, and or they're still fine tuning their business uh, cases and objectives, right? So if, if these problems are not solved, we'll hit the scaling bottlenecks that we mentioned on a massive scale. So it is important to sort out these teething issues to ensure that there's adequate data, operational, and team readiness uh, before embarking on these aggressive plans going forward. Finally, 
organizations, we feel that you need more than just technical infrastructure in place. You need the people, the policies and processes and platforms in place and to really devise these policies and processes to keep the entire systems in check. A lot of respondents this year have concerns over performance monitoring, performance of data scientists, and the reliability of their models. And having these uh, problems are essentially the largest or greatest uh, hurdles that they have to cross in order to really scale their operations. And having these policies in place, we believe can help the team and management uh, build greater confidence toward the reliability and the accuracy of their systems. We also believe that greater liberty to empower the people, the enterprise users, is key to really generate greater scale. But we also believe that in order for that to happen, counterintuitive as it sounds, we believe that greater liberty can only be achieved with greater governance. So more platforms and policies need to be in place on data and model uh, monitoring to build and foster that faith in management and the development teams to empower users within organization at all levels with more data, more flexibility to really enhance quality decision making at each level. And the ending result will be greater pro productivity across all levels of the organizations and all facets. Greater governance and monitoring, it will also enable greater flexibility and scope for the AI teams to further develop. We hope that this report has shed light uh, across industries on where each company is within on the journey of AI adoption. But knowing where you are is really just the first step. How far you can go going forward is the challenge that we pose to all our audience today and uh, to enterprises across the world. Through our Galaxy Summit today, you will hear from industry experts, thought leaders, and experienced practitioners share their latest insights and experiences at each stage of these, uh, this AI maturity cycle. From establishing your networking and data infrastructure to building out the AI applications in manufacturing, banking, finance, and uh, semiconductor, to scaling that operation across the organization, as well as liberating your organization uh, through AI and democratization. Of course, you will also hear about how blockchain and Web3 may redefine how your organization works and conducts businesses in the future and beyond. We hope you enjoyed our report this year, and we look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you.接下来的论坛我们则是要从五 你好,那今天Chen要分享的主题是五G专网低轨道卫星的发展现况,还有未来趋势。好,Chen现在现场交给你。谢谢。OK,Let's okay, say... 等一下哈。嗯哼。好。好,那現在可以開始了哈。可以開始,謝謝。OK,我要用英文講哈,比較方便一點。OK。好。好, okay, good morning everybody. Um, it's an honor for me to talk to you about the subject of private 5G, uh, uh, the uh, low orbit satellite and beyond. And given that today's discussion is about enterprise, I'm gonna talk about the a broader perspective of things that will probably cover the private 5G, 6G, satellite communication uh, as related to enterprise application from that perspective. So, before I get started, I just want to give a little bit background for uh, what we're trying to do today. Um, from, from a Taiwanese perspective, we look at the future 
first and foremost from a disruption perspective. And then, you know, after you see an opportunity for disruption, you obviously will look for a preemptive opportunity to get into the market. So from my perspective, I think there are two, these are two major uh, uh, metrics or sticks uh, that you make a judgment in order to gauge where the industry is going. And, and from a disruption perspective, you can look at it from many different angles, uh, but, uh, but from, a, from a Taiwanese perspective and from our industry perspective, I think a lot of them are focusing on really the intersection of hardware and software. And from that perspective, I have um, you know, uh, some perspective to share. Uh, I would say that if you focus on disruption, you really have to focus on what are becoming different and how that affects the industry as a whole. So when we look at um, across the landscape, we look at it and categorize them into a number of different areas. Uh, the first one I, I think I would talk about is the cloud infrastructure. And everybody knows that from a cloud infrastructure perspective, Everybody pays their attention to the public cloud. But the reality is that the public clouds will continue to grow. And what will be actually growing faster is actually the edge cloud. And the reason edge cloud is becoming an emerging area is because it's closer to where the consumption points are. And as they are closer to the consumption points, they possess the advantage of being able to deliver the service much faster than otherwise. And this is the reason why edge clouds becomes the, one of the most important emerging area from a disruption perspective, because it represents the opportunity to move the application and services to, to the edge, the same way the application would run in the cloud. In other words, it doesn't require application to change, but you can move the application closer to where the usage is going to be. And what, what more importantly, I think is the combination that 5G is happening at the same time. And therefore the coupling of 5G and edge computing is an emerging disruption. Uh, as we think about disruption, we then need to think about that um, the applications themselves are becoming container-based. And as they become distributed, they will now become distributed across multiple clouds. The issue of connecting applications across multiple clouds is a very disrupted situation because it doesn't really run over the, today's physical infrastructure well. And therefore it needs something to bring it to the next level. The same thing happened to the physical infrastructure, be it data center at the edge or data center within the 5G or data center in the cloud. And the reason for that disruption is because we cannot afford to have three different networks. 5G runs its own network and the edge runs its own network and cloud runs its own network. We need to look at the network as one because applications don't see them separately. And therefore, uh, there is a disruption going on at, a, at an infrastructure level, namely the need to unify 5G, edge cloud, and public clouds together. And then we have the uh, question of the 5G that when is made freely available from a spectrum usage perspective, such as what's happening in the US with CBRS. Uh, we now see that the private 5G market's taking off very quickly. And that's a disruption because in the past, there wasn't such a thing that the spectrum for cellular is free. So you look at a smart enterprise then I would also divide it up into three different disruptions. One is that we all know about data lakes and we all know about data warehouses. And we know that we're consuming a lot more data and we're, we're generating more data. And the speed of data that's being generated 
is faster than the speed of computation that we can afford to process them. So at a fundamental level, we know data is growing faster than our ability to consume them. That's a disruption. Uh, the ability to consume data is well understood. The ability to protect data when you consume it is not. And so we think that in the general space of data analytics, uh, data warehouses and data lakes, uh, one emerging area that actually is somewhat overlooked is the whole space of data security as a seamless insertion to data analytics. Then further, I think there is a question of the, the, our ability to consume data is tied to our ability to use the tool and the speed that we can use the tool to analyze the data. And that really falls into the space of how do we evolve today's software tools in such a way that um, the data migration and data integration services can be as near no code as possible. And beyond that, uh, what's happening also is that um, most data that we traditionally run on premise now are migrating to the cloud, which is undisputable fact. Um, the issue then is that when you run in the cloud, you no longer have the control of the hardware that you used to have on premise. And therefore it creates a whole bunch of issues that when you need hardware acceleration, how do you accelerate data in the public cloud? And that's a disruption. So that's, uh, those are the three different angles that we share uh, when we talk about smart enterprises, at least from Taiwanese perspective. Now we know for a long time, materials are the mother of all innovation. Uh, manufacturing process, packaging uh, also create new technologies. Uh, we know materials uh, make a lot of impact in airplanes, such as uh, car you know, carbon fiber. Um, and there are, we know that new materials such as, as even um, at a quantum level um, could affect different quantum computers to be created. Uh, but in the process of seeing new material and processes, um, one area that's um, uh, exciting, extremely exciting, is actually the potential of uh, creating computer from the ground up again to get into quantum computing. And that particular area, uh, it's very interesting because it involves a lot of hardware level and even subatomic level innovation. Uh, but it fits into the boundary between hardware and software. And therefore one of the fundamental strengths for Taiwan. And, and, and lastly, but not least, the in a smart healthcare space, uh, obviously we talk about remote healthcare a lot, but, but I would say that there are a number of area which are quite groundbreaking. Uh, one is really, more in the, um, uh, the in-body scope uh, using the narrow robotics technologies. And when you use that kind of technology, you actually tie it to a lot of things that we are accustomed to in enterprise today. You know, for example, the ability to use AR, VR technologies, uh, the ability to do self-guiding of the cable within your body the ability to tie that in a camera together to be able to precisely locate where you are in the body. Uh, and those technologies are fundamentally impacting. And fundamental to our strengths. And the other area I would say, um, you know, inevitably is in AI. But, but, but the area that in AI that, that affects healthcare in the most significant way perhaps is the attempt to understand biosignatures that 
that would that would be used from a biology perspective and disease and drug discovery perspective and crossing them at the same time. And so you can see that disruption is plenty and it cuts across many different disciplines at the same time. Now, um, I said that um, though disruption is important, uh, the ability to preempt and market to take advantage of that disruption is equally important. And this, a lot of time, it amounts to the ability for us to see a disruption is occurring and the ability to assemble a team and with a vision to execute it. And, 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 and quite often, it's also a question of correlation because I think when we do investment, uh, or focus on areas, we like to talk about the fact that if it wouldn't it be nice to be able to do it uh, with a situation that one plus one equals three, and wouldn't it be even better that one plus one equal infinity? Well, I think this is a case, there's a case here um, that is yet to be proven, but it's a practice that has been put in execution uh, that's, that's worth sharing. So but here we are, there are three different companies which were created from the ground up by Taiwanese, each focusing on a complementary space, where Avesha focuses on what I call earlier, the ability for cloud application in a multi-cloud setting to interconnect with each other from anywhere to anywhere over any network and all become aware of the application that are constructed based on container. It doesn't matter where you are in, in a particular data center. It doesn't matter what addresses that you use. They are interconnected and optimized securely. And then you have the three nets.io that focuses on really the mission of creating a universal data network that understand application, that understand 5G, that understand edge, and that understand cloud. It's a unifier for all networks. Then you have a tire land, which instead of doing another 5G that's based on public cloud or public 5G infrastructure, it attempts to try to move forward with a vision that private 5G can be as ubiquitous as Wi-Fi today. And that it will be the first time that networks are used as simple as Wi-Fi is used today. So that's an example of how the three pieces are put together. If we were to run a VESA over a tire land, you will create a private 5G network that's service aware and application aware. You, will, you were to put a base out over three net, you will create a network infrastructure that uniquely understand applications. If we were to use three net in isolation, it would serve to unify the network without anybody's help. So with that in mind, I want to talk a bit about the major tech landscape. Now, one thing that's important to not forget is the 5G and NDO satellite together really make up the ability for the new space communication to go back to the Earth through 5G. And so the relation between them is such that one is in the space one is in between and then connect the space communication to terrestrial communications. This is the reason you cannot look at them in separation. Uh, the other thing that's very important is that the ability for public cloud and edge to collaborate as opposed to public cloud being the, the only dominant force it's very important for 5G to work because without edge computing, all the 5G traffic would have been 
uh, funnel to the cloud infrastructure, which would not address the latency issue that's most critical to 5G services. And then you've got to look at also that traditionally we have the notion that the 5G is supposed to be just a license spectrum and services should be controlled only by the operators. Well, some people disagree with that. The US has done a tremendous job to make CPRs, CPRS a spectrum that can be shared and shared by anybody who would pay to use it. And we have seen in the past 12 months, a extreme rise of the usage of CPI's applications across different industries. So what this really tell us is that once you make something so common, it creates a new industry for us. If we put private, if we put 5G in a, on a wall garden, it's not going to create a new industry. But if you combine private 5G and CPRs together and you make it easy for anybody to use, anybody who knows how to use Wi-Fi know how to use it, what would be the reason that it doesn't take off? So that's the reason that I think a project like this is started. But after saying that, it's important to point out that what you try to do by unifying all the networks together to make it simple, still lies with the need for system integrator on top to make things easy so that they can run over. So, so these are the major things that are happening in terms of technology, as well as um, the, uh, the changes in the ecosystem to be the catalyst to get a new industry going. Um, a lot of time, we don't think 5G and metaverse are connected, but they are. Now, one thing about metaverse is that the foundation of metaverse is decentralization. And one thing about 5G is that all services shall be decentralized. And so it is the foundation to enable services to be distributed. Now, granted, you need to run blockchain over them, but at the infrastructure level, decentralization is the key. Um, the other thing that's also related to 5G is that you need a data center to be distributed too, uh, because it doesn't scale to be centralized. You need to follow the principle of decentralization. And the only way you can decentralize it is that you build a lot of smaller data centers and we call them edge data centers. Um, if you have any doubt whether or not this is the trend, uh, this, the market has shown that by 2025, the market for edge computing is going to grow from 1% to 30%. Now, having said that, the cloud data center will grow to about 45% but it would be growing from a much higher base. Now, just think about this just for a second. You want to spend all the time building more advancement in AR, VR, and MR. You want to live in the meta metaverse world, but all these are dependent upon the infrastructure being able to support it. And for the games that you really like, uh, they are moving from console games to cloud gaming as well. And just think about it just for a second. When you move it to cloud gaming, in order for you to access the games as quickly as possible with low latency, those games and game instances need to be placed closer to where you play it. And that's called edge computing. But in order to do it as quickly as possible, not having an Ethernet wire, you would need 5G. And so that's the combination of 5G and metaverse together. Um, so we have talked quite a bit about uh, low earth orbit satellites and 
um, a, a lot of countries in the world have um, you know, set their sight on this emerging market. And there's a, there's a good reason for it, right? Because um, unlike the traditional satellites, which, which, which are bulky, uh, what you're doing, really now talking about are smaller satellites and, and lower orbit. And they're, 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 uh, they're tied together into a constellation, which means that you don't think of them to be uh, individual satellites doing discrete functions. You mean to say they are tied together to form what we call a space internet. Now the space internet is not here to replace the internet that we know, but it serves to complement it. And that when you look at that, you say, well, you know, what's so different about the uh, NEO uh, communication or space communication that's different from what we know today as 5G? Well, I think it would, uh, at a semiconductor level and the material level, it's gonna trigger a new evolution uh, toward high frequency, high power efficiency, uh, and high power IC development uh, that's not otherwise available today. Uh, because you're talking about, uh, you know, frequency up to tens of gigabits level all the, way to, all the way up to hundreds of gigabits level, gigahertz level, I'm sorry. And then, um, so we call that a space, sub terahertz. And that's very different because it's one order of magnitude higher or two order of magnitude higher from a frequency perspective. But um, not everybody can be in the satellite business and not all the businesses their wife on a satellite, because you can make a lot of money out of the ground station. It can make a lot of money out of applications. So when we think of low Earth orbit satellites, we should not think of it to be hardware. The hardware is to enable software and data services. And that combining them together is what we need to do. But every country, especially from Taiwan perspective, perhaps would more focus on the ground station and interconnect and all the components that are needed to make it happen. Because after all, we are the hub for worldwide supply chains. Then we got to look into um, how do we move traffic coming down from space to the rest of the world? Well, that's 5G. So that's what we talked about earlier. So we're not trying to say, uh, when we talk about 6G or low earth orbit satellites, 5G is the past. What we're talking about is the 5G is a linchpin, especially from a private, private 5G perspective to invigorate a new generation of 5G services that's wireless. We also think that the 5G would serve as a linchpin to tie space communication down to the Earth. Um, so, so in summary, I think what we need to think about is that we need to think about space communication, cloud communication, 5G and data center all together as one gigantic ecosystem that we're trying to build. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about the uh, 5G and and DO communication. What would be the synergy between them? The first we need to think about is that, you know, when you have space communication coming down, you know, it, it, the strength of it is that you see the entire world. As the Earth rotates, it rotates. And so it sees the footprint of the entire, entire world. And therefore it's extremely powerful from a global communication perspective, especially in areas where we have difficulty having internet access. And so in a sense, 5G and dense populated areas um, 
are complementary to space communications from the space coming down. And so they, they, they are designed to complement each other, not to kill each other. Um, the, the satellite ground stations really is, has a lot of complexity in it because it has to serve the function of communicating with space and serve the function of communicating with the rest on the ground. And then you have to deal with the issue of many uh, uh, you know, high uh, frequency bands uh, that need to perhaps coexist together. Uh, you know, where we started from was the Q band, which is most popular. And that will present where the industry is today. But in terms of power efficiency and the bandwidth efficiency, the KA band in the range of 26 gigahertz to 40 gigahertz is actually more effective. Then we got to ask ourselves, when we try to get into the space communication industry, can we focus on one or do we need to focus on both? And the reason this issue is brought up a lot of times is because it takes a lot of money to do both. And, and this is uh, an area where we got to really think about it and say, if this is an area that we place a lot of emphasis and hope that we can lead in the future, then we got to set the assumption correctly. The assumption is not that the QE band will be sufficient alone. The assumption is that QU and KA band need to be in deployment together at the same time. Uh, but having said that, I would also say that space communication today is an open field for competition. It means anybody who put their sight on it with focus, they have a chance to win. And so, so in order to win though, it's important to also point out that what we talk about for high frequency areas for RF and for ICs, actually a lot of time are export restricted. And so in order for you to win a market like that, you actually have to have higher degree of control. Without higher degree of control, uh, despite all the efforts, you may not be able to control the ecosystem. So in summary, I would just say a couple more things to kind of sum up what we talk about. Uh, I would say first, uh, you know, 5G and edge clouds together, uh, it's important for us to use it to connect to the, the Leo satellites. Uh, because without it, the Leo actually serves the rural areas where 5G and edge actually have most presence. Uh, so that they need to come together. Uh, the second point I want to uh, re-emphasize that, that is that 5G services, um, 5G has actually caught a lot of attention by people, but most people have not realized that they need a, a sibling called edge data center to, to be coupled with. Um, a lot of time we don't see that, especially in a smaller territory like Taiwan because it doesn't really make a lot of difference whether or not you have an edge data center in the south and a, and a north, one each, and you don't need a lot of them. But in a continent like US and China and EU, um, without edge data center, it's just simply not going to work. And so, you know, if we have that export mindset, uh, we need to tie 5G and edge data centers together because that will be the only way that you can scale that particular ecosystem. The third point I want to point out is that though today we talk quite a bit about network 4G, 5G, and satellite communications, the days that networks are not application aware are gone. It does not make sense for the network to be built without understanding application traffic. So that's one. And second, application interconnect is no longer a single, single data center issue because applications are now distributed across many, many locations. 
and across many, many continents and across many multiple clouds. So application connect, interconnect has become a multi-cloud concern. That's a, that's a new problem. You know, it's, it's very tough to run over them, run over multiple clouds because you run over many different networks. And, and so you need to be able to see them to be one unified network. And for that reason, 5G and edge cloud and public cloud must be unified for that reason. Thank you. Thank you, Chen. 好，接下来的两场专呃论坛依旧是线上进行。第一场我们会讨论五 G 企业专网。我们看到全球在五 G 企业专网的商业化应用已经是如火如荼的在进行。那台湾呢？电信商也已经都布局好了基础建设，就等着 NCC 在今年要开放让企业申请执照。到底五 G 企业专网的应用场景还有未来的挑战在哪里？这一场论坛，我们就邀请了来自台美的专家一起来讨论。呃，五位。好，现在大家都已经看到我们的 moderator 是我们的五福向子源基金创办人，然后我们有四位嘉宾，包括英业达资深副总陈义平、Avisa 的共同创办人 Raj Nair， 还有 Three Net CEO Abraham p u c h o 以及泰雅科技的 CEO Mark 红。Hi， 五福。Hey, yes, yeah. Okay, the the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Chen. Who already did a lot of uh, work for us. I, I, I guess fine. So we will be try to be on time. Won't, won't uh, impact your lunch time. Hope. Uh, uh, enterprise digitalization uh, is happening in a record-breaking pace, uh, accelerated by COVID-19, as well as Ukraine war. Yes. As a result, data is generating uh, everywhere at, at record time. This, this data must be uh, transported uh, to the right place at the right time for processing and all storage. And networking is the infrastructure for such transportation. And the 5G with its SLA or service level assurance make this task possible and feasible. And meanwhile, the complexity of application grow, and it is it's not sufficient for network today just to provide connectivity services. Instead, it has to provide application service aware services so that application would obtain the best services without dealing with the intricacy of networks. Uh, you, if you are a little bit confused, don't worry. That's why you are here. Uh, uh, today, we really uh, we are very lucky to gather. Uh, uh, I would say the international G five, the gain of five, across four time zone, uh, and and the, the purpose to explore the really sensitive private five G spots in enterprise. Uh, well, without further ado, uh, I will let uh, our distinguished guest to introduce them a little bit, and starting with Albert. Okay, uh, thank you, Wu Fu, and uh, uh, thank you to invite me to join this cloud. And uh, uh, it's a really huge problem. Uh, I'm Albert Chen, and now I work for Inventec. I guess Inventec is like a almost 46 years old ODM OEM company. And uh, to be sure, in the previously, uh, we manufacture uh, roughly 100, 100 million devices per year. Uh, it includes pretty much 4 million of uh, infrastructure, so called server computing, which is needed by 5G ORAN. That's why I'm here. And uh, furthermore, we have a 21 million of computing devices, such as PC, laptop, and finally 75 uh, million of smart devices, uh, that's a, a cellular phone and other uh, wearable 
devices. Uh, therefore, uh, each year we counted like a 16 billion. When the 5G comes, uh, my career was coming from 2G, 3G. I saw it'll be ended in 4G, but now uh, I guess Chen mentioned 6G. And uh, in the States, uh, I work on uh, 5G, uh, four, uh, 3G handset and chipset. Then later on, work a project of the geo satellite. Then now it seems that uh, everything comes together uh, in the 5G domain. Uh, now uh, utilize all application together. So uh, in this 5G network, we've developed some of the uh, 5G in a smart factory, which is I'm looking for because Inventec has a factory all over the world. As I mentioned earlier, uh, it, it spread it in uh, Asia, China, and Chongqing, Shanghai. In the Europe, we have Czech Republic and also uh, Mexico, uh, so as other city. Therefore, smart factory in the uh, by using 5G private network to establish this is my key goal uh, to establish this. And uh, again, uh, initially, I guess I just uh, spent two minutes to introduce my company and myself. I serve as CDO of the company and also a newer technology to establish uh, for future uh, uh, applications in my company. Thank you. Ufu. Yeah, thank you, Albert. Uh, Mark? Great. Uh, thanks, uh, Ufu, for the introduction. And uh, my name is Mark Hung. I'm the uh, CEO and founder of Atayalan. Uh, we're a 5G uh, network uh, platform and services company, uh, specifically targeting the private 5G uh, space. Um, so I think um, uh, previous, in the previous talk, uh, Cheng had already provided some background on why private 5G is becoming more prevalent. Um, but I would like to talk a little bit more about kind of some of the details of why this is. So as everybody knows, um, you know, in order to really uh, survive in this new world, you know, every company, whether it's whether you're a tech company or, or a non-tech company or a more traditional company, you're undergoing, uh, you're embarking now on your digital transformation journey. So on this journey, uh, definitely a lot of the new next, next gen technologies are being adopted more widely adopted, you know, whether it's the cloud, or the big data, or IoT, or some of the mobile technologies. But regardless of the any of these metric technologies you're adopting, uh, I think one of the key things that uh, Chang pointed out in the previous talk is that what a lot of people are overlooking is the necessary to have a very strong foundation at the edge. And when, when we say having that strong edge uh, foundation at the edge. It's really, it's really twofold. One is from a uh, connectivity, a last mile connectivity perspective, and also from a application service and application support perspective. So, and, and, and you may wonder, you know, how has this um, digital transformation uh, been happening over the last few years, especially during the pandemic time? And actually one of the things that we've noticed um, here at Ayalan is that that, um, uh, that progression on, on this digital transformation journey has actually accelerated uh, during this uh, digital post-COVID world. Um, last year, um, I think uh, uh, Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, was quoted as saying that, you know, they've seen two years worth of digital transformation in two months. Um, and of course, as some of you know, one of these reasons is that you know, as uh, with, with pandemic lockdowns, with supply chain issues, companies have found that digital transformation was no longer a nice to have, but a must have in order to survive in this new world. The second phenomenon that uh, uh, we've seen over the last two years is that um, the uh, proliferation of devices, especially in the industrial IoT space, is growing much more rapidly than, than before the pandemic. So, uh, and uh, there's some forecast that, you know, from, from an established phase of about 100 million devices uh, happen, uh, that, that have been installed for industrial IoT in 2020, that that's going to grow to up to 3 billion uh, in, in the next decade, over to 2030. 
The third, um, uh, the third kind of trend that has happened during the COVID era is that there's a, a additional heightened risk and need for cybersecurity. And in fact, both 2020 and also last year, 2021, uh, you know, unfortunately, it's set a new, every year it's been setting new record for data breaches across the world. And finally, um, with uh, uh, the, the fourth trend that, that's continued to happen, uh, not just in North America and uh, but other parts of the world, is that there's now availability of new sources of spectrum, whether it's uh, you know shared spectrum like CBRS in the U.S. and similar um, uh, releases of spectrum in places like uh, Germany and the rest of the EU, but also the availability of unlicensed spectrum like say, circuit six gigahertz. Um, and so all all four of these trends, right, the acceleration of um, digital transformation, the proliferation of devices from uh, industrial IoT. The heightened risk and need for cybersecurity, and finally the availability of new sources of spectrum, that's really uh, driven the need for something like uh, private 5G. And in fact, um, some forecasts have called that uh, just over the last uh, the short uh, you know, last few years, between 2020, just pre 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 pandemic, to next year in 2023, so in uh, three short years, uh, the industry expects uh, the private solar market to more than double to $8 billion uh, in, in next year. Um, so that's kind of some of the impetus for private 5G I've, I've outlined, and um, a little bit about what we're doing here at Payala. Pass it back to you. Okay, yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, okay, uh, Raj, next. Well, thank you, thank you, Wufu. So I'm Raj Nair, I'm the founder and CEO of Avesha, and uh, what we are building is a, a technology that will let applications to be able to have a distributed deployment, like Cheng was mentioning in his talk, applications cannot be confined in one place anymore. They, they have to have, uh, there is a reason, real business reason why they need to be distributed, whether it is for resiliency, whether it is to give low latency, which is what 5G is all about. You want to have that ability for these applications to be deployed easily. And what we are building is uh, something we call an application slice. And we borrowed the term slice from uh, the 5G space with network slices. But what we are talking about is that in the application world, there is now the proliferation of Kubernetes, which is a orchestration software where you can take your application, put them in containers, and now you can scale them and they become resilient automatically. And so, this Kubernetes is now available everywhere and it's ubiquitous. So in fact, most of the 5G networks are also built using Kubernetes. So the, the, uh, the CNFs that are running 5G are all Kubernetes applications. So you have this wonderful opportunity where you have a completely software defined infrastructure that you can now take advantage of and you can make that infrastructure more uh, tailored to the application, like Cheng was pointing out, you know, make it application aware. And we are playing a role in that in the sense that we are the bodies of the application. We sit in, we're peering with the application and then we are uh, able to uh, sort of help the under, uh, underlay, whatever that might be, to be programmed properly. So to, this is what we call as a slice. And the slice is a, a concept that we came up with, which is a sort of a virtual cluster. So imagine a cluster is where you have application deployed typically in uh, Kubernetes in, in the clouds. So when you go to Google or, uh, or if you go to AWS, you, you, you get clusters. But now you have, instead of having the clusters have a problem in the sense that they, they, you kind of get locked into that cluster. They, they were designed to be a single entity, but clearly that's not enough. So if you have to have an application that spans these, now you have to either work very hard on creating those connections, or you could use what we are building, which is an application slice that helps you virtualize that and gives you the surface on top of which you can deploy. So that that is the tie-in. And why are we doing this? What are the uh, use cases. Well, look, if you look at the, uh, as uh, Mark had also pointed out, the modernization is a huge trend. 
And in that, if you look at uh, hybrid, that's about 40%. So you, you need, uh, for many enterprises, whether it is for regulatory reasons, they need to have, or security reasons, they want their data to be resident in one place, but maybe access from different places. So that becomes a hybrid uh, situation. Or you know, if, if, you, uh, if you wanted, for example, the low latency for, uh, as somebody had pointed out, metaverse, you know, a uh, lot of meta applications are, uh, you know, with AR and you, you want to have that ability to get the low latency so that you get quicker response. So, and, and then of course there's the edge inferencing and many such applications that need that low latency. So th for this new breed of applications and for the ones for that are undergoing modernization, uh, you do need to have this kind of a distributed deployment, but something that can be controlled. Something where you can control the uh, applications, even if they are in different places. So for example, the access controls, the resource limits, all of this, you want to control it from one place. And this is the reason why you need something like the mechanism mm -hmm. that we are talking about, like an application slice that can go across clusters and grow across locations and allow you to have the same degree of control like you would if you were in one cluster. And this is what uh, the, we are able to achieve with this technology that we're calling as an application slice. And uh, th there are uh, even the 5G uh, providers are actually interested in using this, for example, uh, in, in separating out uh, because if you want to have multi-tenancy, so what you're doing is you, you, you want to have many network slices, one for each customer, for example, but uh, say in a private 5G deployment, but you want to keep their CNFs separate for obvious reasons. You don't want to mix them up. And so from that standpoint, again, we are able to do something to create that multi-tenancy. So this is this is the tie-in from the application down looking into the network and allowing the applications to be able to take advantage of a distributed deployment, whether it is for giving you the low latency or for in, in their own, or whether it is for resiliency, to be able to uh, express that in a way that, uh, that can be then taken by the network and then optimize uh, like my friend uh, Abraham will be talking about in when he in from his company's uh, viewpoint, and so this is this is how this ecosystem uh, at least with some of the companies here come together, and it, it, it's a very interesting uh, opportunity, and obviously something that's growing uh, uh, like really good. Like if you look at just the hybrid market, it's growing at 16% uh, CAGR and reaching 150 billion by 2027. So this is a huge market and uh, obviously uh, something that is very exciting. So with that, uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, thank you, Wufu. <clears throat> okay, thanks, Raj. Uh, okay, Abraham? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Wufu. I am uh, Abraham Kucherel. I live in one of the beautiful parts of the, of the country, um, sunny Colorado. Um, so uh, greetings from Colorado to all of you in Taipei. And um, I'm the president and CEO of Three Nets. And, um, you know, it, it is a great event where Chang kind of framed how the technology is evolving and what is the need for this technology to all come together to serve the enterprise as we know today and will be more so in the future. So uh, Mark talked about a bit about the 5G and the private 5G, how it, how it is going to help the, uh, the enterprise. And we know, based on what Cheng talked about, based on what Raj just talked about, the new applications are going to be built around microservices, which is smaller uh, software units that, that is enabling you to build a very scalable application and for that to happen, you need Kubernetes, which is what Raj talked about, where Avisha is building this tremendous platform that allows this application to scale, not just from one place or one cloud, but 
multitude of clouds, multitude of um, um, areas, or even containers that spread around the globe. Now, that is all in the application level. That is all happens in the application and you know the Kubernetes layer, pretty much at a very high level in the OSI uh, seven layer architecture. For that to uh, efficiently traverse across the globe, like Raj talked about, there has to be some kind of underlay that enables that communication to happen or that transfer of data to happen. Uh, the, the great court that uh, Chen just mentioned was three nets can be a great unifier, regardless of what application it runs, regardless of what infrastructure it runs, or what kind of application pattern, the software pattern, architecture pattern that uh, that application may use, regardless of what it is, three nets can bring that all into um, a, a universal way to, to support that application. And also Chen kind of alluded that the, the service unaware or application unaware network that we all used to is pretty much dead. It, it, you, you cannot sustain that kind of a network any longer. So the new network is gonna be application aware. Uh, we, we need to know where the service are coming from. The network need to be aware of it so that the appropriate transfer of data and information can happen and the application can be served appropriately. So with that, um, uh, Bufu. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, we, uh, I think the following one is that uh, some of you may cover it already, uh, but still I'd like to see everyone's view on this today's main topic, uh, which is the, uh, your, well, in, your observation and view on private 5G network in enterprise applications. And uh, I, I, so I will start with, the same, same offer to start with and probably try to keep it uh, in three minutes. Uh, uh, actually, I lost my clock. <laughs> anyway, let, let's, let's do it to make sure we get it out. Okay, yeah, okay, yes. Uh, thank you for it again. And uh, yeah, I learned from uh, all the network layers folks uh, to talk about 5G so-called uh, uh, network slicing. And uh, I'm happy to see that. And also uh, talking about observation of 5G private network. I believe from my experience from 2G, 3G into 4G, now it's 5G. I guess big difference of 5G is IP network. They can go to cloud or virtualizations. And second, maybe there are something so-called software defined. Previously the software defined network, now software put in the RAN. Again, that's a challenge work, especially recent open RAM. However, in these two trends, it brings up, as I mentioned earlier, smart factory without uh, AI, without all the autonomous uh, so-called applications. And not even saying that, uh, I guess Mark, I mentioned uh, after China-US trade war, we all go into so-called digital transformation. That's a needed because we have all companies spread all over the globe. And we eagerly also, uh, we were asked by uh, how do you sustainable to provide with all the products or in everywhere. Therefore, with all the uh, life cycle, product life cycle, uh, 5G in the smart factory, which can, enable the industrial 4.0. That is the view that I can see. Therefore, from communication theory, and that's a challenge. However, it's ongoing. I saw a lot of operators in Europe in this year. Uh, there are 22 uh, uh, mobile virtual mobile operators. They try to deploy this open RAM. And again, it's good things. It's ongoing. And I'm hoping that uh, in our side. Then later I can share more on how to deploy down into our smart factory because a lot of applications, even uh, I guess now SAA, SAA standalone network can really provide 
as I mentioned earlier, the first we are looking for so-called EMBB, the, the bigger bandwidth, previously 5G, pick, you can call that is a 10 gig. However, I guess it, it's impossible to get to lot uh, the speed. And second, uh, low latency. Uh, compared to 4G, it's like a one tenth. So we are looking for, say, if you are talking about one millisecond, then yes, based on that, uh, we can deploy uh, many applications in, in, a, in a factory, then definitely mass IoT in the future. So uh, all along, uh, we all embrace all these uh, good and equip us as a future of our smart factory by doing digital transformation type of applications. So that's my observation. And I'm hoping that uh, with all the innovation in place, the 5G network in our smart factory, now we, 2019, we really put into a POC in our smart factory. And yes, we all follow what Chance mentioned, I believe uh, we have edge servers. Uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have many servers because Inventech manufacture a lot of servers. Then we put the AI, we do the training, we do the inference locally. We are trying to connect so-called OT, CT, and IT. That's a challenge. Operation and communication, also uh, information, all these three together. Uh, then again, uh, facing a lot of uh, stability issues. And again, uh, maybe later I, I will share a little bit uh, more on our application. Uh, by all that, I believe 5G private network uh, is a way for us in the smart factory that we can adopt. So we put a SI team to really integrate uh, from the bottom to the applications or even to the cloud, uh, adding edge. But cloud, now we haven't done the, the 6G yet, the, uh, up to uh, Leo. Uh, but uh, again, uh, these are very good uh, directions and all combine all the technologies together. It's a challenging, but I'm looking forward uh, to uh, welcome these uh, applications and successful. Thank you. But thank you. Uh, Mark, uh, next, could you just express your view the main topic? Yeah, so uh, thanks, uh, um, Ufu. So I think, you know, uh, it's interesting, right? Uh, we hear from, from Albert, you know, obviously at Inventech, uh, they've actually, are, they're a practitioner of uh, private 5G and they're one of the main applications for the for this technology, which is smart manufacturing. So you kind of heard a lot of the benefits that 5G brings, um, you know, higher throughput, lower latency, perhaps greater scalability to be able to support, uh, you know, a much larger number of uh, endpoints and devices. But I think repeatedly what you've also heard Albert say is very difficult, it's very challenging, and it's just generally very, you know, it's, it's hard to de deploy. And so I think, you know, one of the things that uh, the industry needs to address uh, when it comes to private 5G is to make sure that um, it is as easy to deploy, if not easier than your typical enterprise Wi-Fi solution. So in order to do that, you know, what does it take, uh, what does it take, right? So I think at a minimum, uh, you know, the 5G network cannot be, you know, running in parallel with the rest of your enterprise architecture, right? It needs to be fully integrated um, um, uh, into your existing IT infrastructure so that you can make the best use of that, you know, um, whether it's from a traffic management perspective, whether it's from a security policy enforcement perspective, um, uh, you know, all of these things are, are kind of um, um, table stakes when it comes to implementing private 5G. Because after all, there are gonna be very few scenarios where you have a, a, a greenfield, a brand new deployment that's gonna have private 5G built in. Uh, most of the time, uh, you said you're gonna have private 5G coming into a brownfield or existing deployment with existing infrastructure and making sure that every, everybody plays nice with each other. That's the first thing making sure that in, in integration with the existing enterprise architecture is easy to do. Second is really um, the overall uh, user experience, uh, the user interface has to be very simple from the initial uh, installation and deployment to the 
subsequent um, uh, management of the overall infrastructure. So being able to have a single pane of glass in order to monitor your network traffic, not just from private 5G, but for all your network traffic, it's, you know, it's uh, paramount. Third is that you need to make sure you have the uh, right performance for the right application. So what I mean is that besides just the typical, you know, feeds and feeds, you know, gigabits of throughput, you know, milliseconds of latency, you want to make sure the right performance is available um, um, uh, when needed. So for example, for mobile applications like AGVs or robots, you want to make sure that uh, wherever they're moving to, you're able to make sure that the handover across different nodes is, is, uh, is adequately achieved. Um, the fourth is, you know, I think both, um, you know, Abraham and uh, Raj have already talked about how important it is that uh, you are able to uh, be aware, uh, be app aware uh, for your overall uh, network. And so definitely besides putting in this brand new, super high performance network into your, um, uh, into your, your site, you want to make sure that you provide an easy way for your existing applications to take advantage of that network. And finally, uh, as I mentioned in terms of one of the trends that's been happening uh, during the COVID era, is that you want to make sure that for all these things, right? Whether it's the enterprise integration, whether it's the high performance, whether it's the uh, simple UI, or whether it's the app aware framework, underlying all of this is that you want to have a very robust security framework so that by introducing private 5G into your enterprise, you're not introducing additional attack vectors that put your enterprise um, in harm's way and make them more vulnerable to external attacks. So I'll stop right there and uh, perhaps I'll pass it on to the other panel. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, I'll close three minutes, uh, Raj, on, on, on the uh, your view of this uh, 5G, five minute, five minute work applications. Absolutely. Uh, so as uh, both, uh, you know, uh, Mark and also Albert had pointed out, the important thing is to make this easy for applications. And so that, that is like very important. And so, because a lot of application guys don't know anything about networks. So you, you have to make this dead easy. So that is what we've started looking at and saying, how do we take something as rich as the private 5G and the application that it can enable, but yet make it uh, again, as again, Mark had pointed out, for the application guy controllable from one place and this deployment and give them the right quality of service, again, that you can select from the network, you know, through the programming that you can do of the network and make that easy for them to consume. So this is very, very important because they are used to, you know, a, a GitOps way of deploying they just want to be able to, you know, have Helm charts, which they download and rest of it is just, they want it to be like magic. So, you know, you, 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 you annotate that, you allow them to deploy. And this is why we came up with this um, application slice so it can deploy onto that. And now all of a sudden they can get their deployment, which is spread into many locations, but at the same time, get the quality of service and, and the latency that that application needs. And again, uh, it varies from one to the other. The needs are not the same for every application. So there needs to be some prioritization and so on and so forth. And this is, this is the kind of um, uh, uh, specific area that we are addressing and, uh, and, and it'll help scale this uh, very nicely to large number of applications and manage them even though they're distributed and deployed in many, many parts in different locations, different clouds, different data centers, uh, whatever might be the uh, uh, actual uh, footprint. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Ufu. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, Abraham? Well, I think, I think we've been just talking about how, you know, three nets can help these applications that Mark is building and, and Raj is supporting from their companies. So we, we know clearly that 5G is a very latency sensitive um, application. Well, uh, 5G can support much latency sensitive uh, applications. The URLLC is one of the main uh, capability of 5G. 
to, for that to, to be supported, applications has to be distributed. And, and for those applications that are distributed to be enabled to be supported, you need to have a, some kind of unifying fabric that needs to come into play. And that is a really an intelligence where you know, this intelligent machine, for example, is fully aware of what's going on in the domain that this, this, um, uh, this network or this application is, is being uh, deployed at. So regardless of where the application has to go, regardless of where the workloads are deployed, this unifying fabric has to support very effectively, effectively multiple path, the most optimal path for this application to get to. And that is what we support. That is what 3Net support. Back to you, Rufu. Well, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and I, I guess we're not a good question to follow, but time's kind of running really short. Uh, before that, I, I really like to, like to take this opportunity to appreciate uh, to the responsible, responsible party in Taiwan government to make sure the speedy release of 5G uh, private uh, spectrum and in such a way that as soon as possible and then reasonably priced, also a least restriction in its usage as long as it's not used for public 5G service. Uh, well, with that, uh, we, uh, we, we had, uh, we'll follow some question, maybe just give everyone a minute to, to do a quick answer. Uh, to start again, Albert, uh, you are the only one actually uh, from user space in this panel. So you should know the best. What are the key challenges that enterprise early adopter are facing in private 5G? It's your one minute. Okay, uh, thank you again. And yes, uh, one minute, I cannot address all the challenges. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, okay, let me, <laughs> yes, yes, let me summarize. I guess basically if you are to integrate all the communications, including Wi-Fi, including 5G or RFID or zip, all those things into a, a, a factory, so-called heterogeneous network, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not uh, mentioning all the wire communication and TSN in the machine, then you need to connect them. And also on the top, you need to talk with IT people saying that, how do you do your security? Is that secure enough when you connect to the internet? When you do the operations, you are facing that. Now, uh, how do you pay for it? Who is doing service? Is that too expensive? When you talk about ORM, software defined so-called architect, then definitely the, the price is half. For example, you have a RU, you have so-called CUDU, you have core network. Then on, on top of that, you need to hire many uh, knowledge people to operate that to begin with. These early adapters that they need to be aware. Therefore, all these challenges, I'm not mentioning all the applications, Raj and uh, Abraham mentioned, and including uh, Mark. So uh, I believe challenge is still uh, on there. All the applications, we need to have stable environment to deploy all the AGC, AR, VR, and uh, security, et cetera. Uh, okay, I guess okay. one minute is up. Wait. Thank you. Uh, well, uh or, or it's dinner time in California, I know. But as a startup, uh, you, uh, you always stay hungry. I mark, uh, your company is building the best solution for private 5G. And could you a minute talk a little bit about what's the most likely or the, the most uh, high interest in those early adapter of the network? And also maybe a little bit quickly about the difference between Taiwan uh, in 5G industry compared to other geographies. Okay, Mark? Sure, sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to say that. I'll, I'll try to leave some time also for the other panels as well. Um, so, you know, I think in terms of the verticals that are most interested in private 5G today, you can kind of think about what are the characteristics that make private 5G stand out, right? So a very robust and resilient network, right? That can perhaps be a replacement for the existing wired network, a very secure network, and also a network that provides not just high performance, a very deterministic performance, right? So predictable performance. So given those characteristics, I think it's not hard to imagine kind of what some of the initial vertical markets are, which are in the areas of manufacturing, 
uh, and also a lot of the supply chain and logistics related markets as well. But one other market that you know actually now has seen growing interest um, in private 5G is the, uh, those that uh, are currently exploring metaverse types of applications because for whether it's AR on the manufacturing floor or VR in, in the corporate enterprise for remote and hybrid meetings, uh, private 5G comes in very handy with those characteristics uh, to be able to support those applications. And just really quickly in terms of the difference between the Taiwanese market versus the, the, uh, the global market, I think there are a lot of similarities. First of all, in terms of the vertical markets we talked about, obviously Taiwan has a very strong manufacturing sector uh, and logistics sector. So definitely there's a lot of interest there. But what has been um, a, a little bit unfortunate and which, you know, thanks uh, Wu Fu for pointing that out is that while uh, other countries like the US and Germany and Japan have already designated uh, the spectrum to be used for Pi 5G and outlined the rules surrounding that, uh, Taiwan is a little bit late compared to those other economies in, in getting that pushed through. So hopefully that will be expedited soon. Pass it back to you. Uh, okay, thanks. Raj, uh, it's, I know it's late, uh, late night in Boston, but thank you for staying up late for us. Uh, now, could you help us with uh, those two questions you know, with, uh, question with quick answer? Um, what are typical enterprise hybrid cloud use cases? And uh, what are the challenges faced by people or the application adapting uh, hybrid, uh, hybrid cloud uh, deployments? Quick. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I mean, the, the main things, uh, the main uh, applications that we see uh, that people want, you know, uh, the hybrid application because they want to maintain their data in some location like on-prem and uh, in some under their control and yet be able to uh, provide, uh, use the cloud, for example, for scaling up uh, some of their use cases. So in these cases, they, they want to use a hybrid uh, infrastructure, which is uh, again, uh, as, as just like it was pointed out, they want something that will retain the security, but it's also easy to use and automatable. So that's why we did this application slide that we created. It's, a, it's got the zero trust security and it can automate all of this uh, network connectivity and, uh, and, and usage, I should say. Um, and then uh, the other thing was that uh, they want, uh, the challenges are that, you know, the, when they try to connect clusters, uh, which are in two different locations, there were a host of uh, problems like IP address overlaps, the fact that you have to go through firewalls and they want to mess with this firewall rules. So they want something that is simple. They don't want to have to deal with all of that IT infra. They want it to be automated and at the same time be able to control this from one place. If you have it in different places, then you have the a problem of policy drift across these locations uh, and then uh, the uh, managing the uh, namespaces across these locations. And finally, you know, the workload itself, you know, how much of workload can, are you putting in each? Is that the optimum uh, distribution? You know, you need some help there maybe, if, and we are using AI for that to optimize that uh, distribution. So uh, it, it is a set of problems, but if you uh, are able to address this, you can uh, uh, see a great uh, adoption because there's a lot of interesting applications here. Thank uh, thanks. Uh, uh, hello, Denver the capital of Rocky Mountain oysters. Unfortunately, I'm a vegetarian. Um, well, I think, yeah. I think we yeah. are running out of time. So <laughs> I would just say that um, if anyone has any questions, reach out. Um, I'm sure that the conference will make available our contacts information. Mm -hmm. And I'm also available on LinkedIn. So please reach me. Um, we can help you with whatever questions you may have. Thanks again. Um, back to you, Spufu. Okay, really, thank you. Uh, we have a lot of stuff to cover unfortunately the time is not enough but then, anyway uh thank you everyone uh for attending uh really the enterprise network objective is really just provide an uh, integrate simple reliable and a secure service with high cp value that's really the purpose and all those three companies are really building uh toward that, that goal and uh uh today i really uh uh all you have to if you're not you are confused again this is a new area uh, just take away uh, a few jargons, then you will be ahead of other, most other people. The microservice, cluster, container, and Kubernetes. Okay, uh, with that, uh, actually, uh, my, my trademark uh, 
Now that you see, unfortunately, they, they say they cannot do it real time. Well, I was just, um, the time's running, I'll just read it. Uh, and well, for those who don't know, I will, could ask for translation with the charge. <laughs> anyway, uh, that is a uh, IGG5, Lun G, Chiye Zhuang Wang, Xin Shang Ji, Bai Pai Taiwan Yi Chen Di, Hong Pai Si Tong, Shi Bao Li. Well, it's basically saying that uh, we have ICG5, the Indian and Chinese, <laughs> Chi Gen of <laughs> for discussing 5G, right? And then the enterprise private networks is really the new opportunity. And uh, Taiwan white box is already the king of the world, right? So what's needed system red box is where the insane profits are. And that's where we, I encourage Taiwan industry to move toward that sector. Okay, well, again, thank you very much and uh, see you Maybe sometime soon. Okay, bye bye. Thank you, Wufu. Now we're going to transition to data. So, how do we translate data into value? So during this process, how do we interpret data to meet corporate demands? And so this uh, panel will begin from the corporate perspective to see how the industry is creating value from data and the challenges they face throughout this process. I see that we have two of our uh, panelists already. First one is uh, Howard Chi from Canner Data and Yuningning, the Vice President of R&D for Tavula. We will have two people online with us, Pukut Kana from Gojek, as well as Instill AI CEO Zhang Bing Ling. Thank you. I can hear an echo right now. Are you guys hearing this? Okay. No? If that's okay, then... Okay, how? This is a Nini Yu. Okay. This is... I participate in the panel from Southern California. The panel is from three continents. Currently, I am the Vice President of R&D. Um, at Taboola. We serve uh, over a trillion uh, recommendations of articles, blogs, videos, and apps monthly to over 500 million active daily users. So the conversation today is very close to my heart. From data application down to the data stacks, the pipelines, and data source new solutions are emerging constantly to, uh, to meet the needs. So today, I will ask four panelists for their views on the topics. Firstly, let me introduce my four distinguished speakers. Uh, by the way, I know that we are between you and the lunch, so we're definitely going to speak much faster for this panel, okay? So let me start with the uh, uh, Phuket. Uh, Kana, and he's the vice president at Tech Data Partnerships and Monetization at Gojek. So, Pukat, can you uh, talk about yourself for uh, one minute? Thanks, Ningning. Hi, everyone. So, Gojek, for those of you who would not know, is an on-demand service provider in Indonesia and Southeast Asian markets. We provide 20 plus services across food delivery, transportation, e-payments, etc. And we have recently been merged with the biggest e-commerce in Indonesia called Tokopedia. So now it's called the go-to group. So it's pretty much all knowing all about what consumers want, when do they want, and what exactly do they want. And I look after data monetization, data partnerships, because when you have such a big user base of consumers and so many services, taking care of the data is pretty much the most important task for the consumers. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, next one, I will introduce Howard Chi. Uh, he's the CEO of Kenner Data. Howard, 
Hello everyone， 我嗯，我叫我叫 Howard， 然后我是呃 Canada CEO co-founder。那我们公司 ，I am Howard， I am the co-founder and CEO of Canada Data。We are a data platform。We help、uh, companies accelerate data access， which means that we help them accelerate decision making， as reduce the cost of compiling spreadsheets。And help them automate workflows and processes, and make sure that、uh, the data is compliant with regulations and can be applied to their different clients.、Uh, we are currently serving finance and big data clients. We help corporations、um, achieve a centralized data platform and help them with digital empowerment. This is a brief introduction of our company. Thank you. I'm very honored to be here today. I'm sure that all of you are ES Light members because everybody that saw me、um, has always said that they're loyal ES Light customers. We have、uh, locations in Taiwan, Suzhou, and we're currently、uh, planning a new store as well. We have、uh, a flagship store in Tokyo, and we hope to enter Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, as well. A few years ago, ESLite has、uh, recognized digital transformation as a trend. We become prepared、um, in 2020. We've already launched our e-commerce platform, and last September we also developed our own app. App that was launched at that time too. So during the pandemic,、uh, we've been able to utilize our apps and help corporations bridge through this area、uh, through this time. And、uh, hopefully, we'll be able to share some more later. Uh, the CEO of Incel AI. Hey, Ling. So, hello, yeah, hello, everyone. <coughs> Thank you for having me in the panel. Um, I'm Ping Ling, I'm the co-founder and CEO at Incel AI. My background is robotic vision PhD, and I'm also a serious entrepreneur. Incel AI is actually my second startup. So, what Incel AI is up to? Uh, we are on a mission to make vision AI accessible to everyone. We attempt to achieve this goal by building easy-to-use tools to process unstructured visual data. You might be surprised by the fact that、uh, the majority of data generated a day around the world is mostly unstructured visual data, occupying roughly like 70 to 80 percent. What can be even more surprising is that these unstructured visual data are generally ignored or even untouched, just because there is still no off-the-shelf tooling to easily process those data. That's the reason we see, you know,、um, unstructured visual data and its tooling need some more love, and the, the democratization of vision AI is a way to fulfill this huge market demand. Right. So in terms of our TA, we basically target all industrial sectors with all size enterprises, as long as you know they have the intense visual task in hand. And by the way, we are a fully remote startup based in London. Okay, so、uh, everyone can tell we are actually coming from three different continents. So this is really a very unique opportunities. So let me start、uh, asking some of the、uh, the the basic value questions. So I would like to start with Phuket, and the what are the key use cases for your enterprise consumer users, and what are your KPIs? All right. So I think the first important thing to note is that with such a large user base, which is in multi millions of users. And of course, enterprise merchants and brands want to make use of that data and the users, but we have to be very, very careful in terms of how we follow a very strict guidelines and the data regulation. So we are very, very strict GDPR and PDPA applying. That's number one. Number two is that all these enterprise merchants and brands they spend a lot of money, multi-million dollars on marketing activities, but a lot of that is still guesswork. And it's surprising in today's world with so much technology available, a lot of the marketing dollars are still based on guesswork or gut feel. So where we come in is to look at the real behavior of the users on our ecosystem, help these enterprise merchants and brands understand what do consumers want, when do they want, and how do they want it. And once you understand the user journey through these data analysis, 
you are able to better spend your marketing dollar so driving efficiency in the marketing dollar is the biggest uh, sort of a provocation that we provide to these enterprise merchants in the turn we also have to make sure that our users are also guarded so we always try the fundamental principle of our partnerships are how to enhance the user consumer journey how to make the user journeys on ecosystem shorter simpler and how can they get the most relevant promotions and offers being shown to them at the right time so the enterprise merchant have a efficiency in their marketing dollars the users get the best in terms of share user experience and hence it becomes a win win so that's our driving principle when it comes to data monetization and data partnerships awesome um i think this would be a similar question i want i want to ask frank also and what is your key use cases and what are your kpis for your data um, actually, we can see that corporate data, especially uh, ESLi, with a long companies like that have a very long-standing history that formerly had actual uh, physical data. How do we compile this data? Is the most important question right now. Who are we trying to serve when compiling this data? First, internal users. How do we allow, how do we compile this data for integration uh, for internal users to create models and compile spreadsheets? But there will be a major issue or challenge that our data is in different databases uh, based on our traditional uh, data cleaning processes. It takes a long time. So that's why we've used the Canner Data Solution where we can use uh, different heterogeneous uh, heterogeneous databases to rapidly integrate this data for our internal users. But another fundamental question is uh, the data governance. How do we how do we ensure the accuracy and cleanness of data? It's not just about data integration at that point. We need our RD we need to see whether this was developed by our R&D department or by outside parties. We need to define all the columns, all the um, fields, so that we have meaningful data for our internal users to access. Um, another big key user is our members and our customers. After uh, organizing this data, we'd like to um, be able to apply it to different scenarios because uh, ESLite is incredible with brick and mortar stores. But I want my members to have, uh, we want to be able to collect more information from users online and offline so we can provide the best service at the best timing. So ESLite not only has uh, bookstores, but also department stores, theaters, uh, performance halls, as well as hotels. So these are all opportunities where we can integrate our data to create an ecosystem. This will allow our consumers to uh, receive better services. Um, suppliers will also have uh, better business opportunities. Right. requirements of those data. So I would like to ask to two uh, major uh, vendor here. And let's start with the hardware. So what are the key considerations for your partner and users? You know, you can talk about anything, you know, uh, uh, privacy, transparency. What are their major concerns and considerations? Right, so at Canner, we focus on three major aspects on data. We need to be fast, in other words, uh, as the VP has mentioned, that everybody wants access to more information, but that data is messy and it's uh, very large. What they want to do is get more to be able to accurately target their end goals. So it's a big problem now. Now we have so many, so much data, complicated data. How do we achieve effective decision making? Second concern is security. Uh, the VP mentioned the value of data comes from effective use of data. You need to have data in the hands of the right people. And it's complicated. You need to communicate better. You need to 
have effective reporting. At the same time, you need to ensure security. And thirdly, due diligence. How do you ensure security while uh, ensuring everyone uh, is responsible for the set of data it has? How do we ensure everyone gets the right set of data that he is accountable for? So there are uh, quite a lot of uh, issues when it comes to data usage. And now for us at Kenner, we, we found that data is not the problem. The most important thing is a people. Uh, in the past, we've provided one uh, search engine and the client said, we got the same results from you and internally, you need to do better. So how do we deliver faster in a secure and effective way for our clients? That's uh, what our main goal right now at Kenner. Great, so the safety is also the uh, key. Okay, so I will ask the same question to uh, uh, Ping Lin. And the, from, from your uh, experience, what are your partners and users are, are their major key consideration and how you can help them? Yeah, I think, I think for our user, um, yeah, since we are dealing with the very, you know, essentially different data than Kenner and uh, s -Lead or, or Pocket's company, yeah, we are dealing with unstructured visual data. So, so basically, um, what I care the most is that how to really um, adopt vision AI with a uh, a high usability and the uh, affordability way. Yeah. And the, these two factors are not necessarily also going to each other. Yeah, to be more uh, specific, usability has to do with the BGS accuracy and speed. And the affordability, on the other hand, is related to the cost, you know, both uh, times and money-wise. Yeah. So, um, you know, these four factors kind of uh, mixed uh, over time. So if we, for example, if we want to increase the usability, perhaps we will need to compromise the affordability a bit, you know, at the same time as well. Yeah, the holy grail, of course, uh, will be to have all these factors fulfilled. Yeah, I guess everybody would love uh, such a cost-efficient solution. Yeah, but however, in reality, the status quo of the industry is that having even one factor fulfilled, uh, fulfilled for vision AI is already pretty hard. Yeah, so yeah, like uh, Howard mentioned about you know, governments or like security, that kind of issue for unstructured real data, we are not even there yet. Yeah, we are just dealing with that how to really have a, a solution, a affordable solution that can, like can onboard a vision AI for enterprise data, yeah. So, I mean, there's still quite a bit of challenges. So I want to ask the uh, Phuket and Frank, uh, a, uh, do some ranking, okay? If for your data, we talk about speed, scalability, scalability, simplicity, security, and a cost, what matters the most for you right now? And, uh, uh, and then I will ask the, the two uh, uh, distinguished CEO and figure out what type of solution they have. Okay, so start with Phuket. What matter to you? The, all the S, speed, uh, stability, yeah, go ahead. I think uh, just continuing from what I said earlier in the discussion, security is by far the most important aspect. I, and I heard Howard and Frank also mentioned that, how do you share, how do you use that in a secure way is by far the most important attribute or factor. And again, I go back to the kind of volume we're talking about, and it's also about users' uh, confidential data. So I would say security is by far the most important parameter. Any solution which can help us use that in a more secure manner, store it, organize it in a more secure manner, is by far the top priority. Great. How about Frank? What are your priorities? Uh, well, priority is just security. The, uh, For me, it's the same. Security and then security speed. Security is like fundamental basics, right? The technicians should get it right. But for front end users, for users, they have all sorts of demand. They want it fast, they want it effective. So for me, security and then speed. Now we have two providers of solutions. So I will start with Ping Lin. And from your point of view, talk about one thing you're really good at and how you're solving that problem. 
Um, you mean you mean how 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 is Steve really good at? Yes. Well, and I, the I think, fight if yeah. you can solve the 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 the, the five S. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So for for us, um, uh, particularly for our use, I think the uh, simplicity is the most you know um factor matters. Yeah, because uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, at the moment, you know, that if you really want to onboard a vision AI, the process of building that solution is just way more uh, complicated. Yeah, so so um, I think the modern data stake needs a tool to really simplify uh, this process to, to start to, you know, um, process the unstructured visual data. Yeah, and uh, the visual, this tool had better be as easy as we use Git, you know, for version control or the SQL, no SQL database for managing structured data, right? And 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 if you ask me that what's the, what what the solution will be again, I think I think um, uh, this is all about you know uh, how to how to build the right tool or or maybe this is more you know precise how to build the tool right. Right. So at Institute, we are, we are building a tool called the visual data preparation to try to streamline you know, the unstructured visual data processing so that you know, the different, uh, uh, different um, uh, users, uh, like uh, data scientists, data engineer, data research engineer, can all benefit from uh, this kind of uh, 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 tool. So at, as a data platform, the visual data preparation, it will be able to solve you know, all the concerns uh, when processing unstructured visual data. Yeah. Awesome. That's, the, that, that's to achieve the simplicity in the end. You know what, uh, a, a, a simplified solution actually will help the security. I agree with you because then you have less uh, security hole. Uh, then definitely, yeah. I will, yeah. uh, definitely I want to ask Howard because uh, NVIDIA just announced, uh, you know, they have an H100, right? And start T100 and the GPU, then they have an A100 and they just announced h 100 so those are the uh, the heart rate improvement on speed. So from your point of view, uh, when you talk about fast and speed, how your solution would differentiate from others? Okay. Um... So the speed for us, we talk about the speed of accessing data. When you connect to the data source, heterogeneous data source, we need to standardize it, normalize it into a, a, a homogeneous platform. And you need to discover access data effectively, then to transform it into uh, data of different granularity. And then we talk about deliver, right? Now, BI, doesn't only include visualization, it's business intelligence. It, it covers all kinds of data apps, BI apps, analytics apps. So how do you get an MIS at a company to understand all these in order to deliver? If you can shorten the query time from 10 minutes to one minute, it doesn't matter. So, so now the data solutions we are providing aim to help cover the full data life cycle from the source to the value. We are defining the speed as not in the speed of CPU or, or memory, but how fast we could deliver the life cycle. Faster machine and they can really achieve. And why really what you're just saying is the entire workflow and data flow matters. And those are going to uh, slow down the entire uh, deployments and the solution. So absolutely right. Uh, so for each of you, uh, I will give you a, a, a sound challenge. What are the key trends and the challenges you have observed right now in your uh, uh, deployment solutions and uh, your offering? I would like to start with uh, Paquette. So you, I didn't get the question, Ning Ning, could you repeat the question again? So what are the key trends and the challenges you have observed in your current business? All right. So I think the, the biggest trend that we have seen is that 
while you the brands and merchants enterprise merchants do want to target the customers in the most efficient manner you also want to understand their behaviors in more detail so they they can anticipate the needs and the trend of the future in advance you know so they can be ready for the future so that's a very very emerging trend and what we have been doing is that we've been trying to understand at aggregate level overall level what does each customer segment want from a category or a merchant or a solution and trying to predict using machine learning and ai okay this is the kind of trend we are seeing from a macro perspective and zero down to a micro perspective so sharing these kind of learning and insight with the enterprise merchant and brands helps them to create more offers or more brand products for the future which can better fulfill the needs of these consumers and to answer yes. your second part of the question what is the challenge in doing this i think it is good back to what pingling and even how i mentioned earlier all this data is so unstructured because it's being collected at such a huge volume from multiple sources online sources offline sources to combine that aggregate that and to structure that to make sense of it is by far the biggest challenge so any solution which can automate it make it faster and secure is what we all are looking out for uh, actually uh, definitely agree uh, frank this is the same question for you and what are the key challenges you have observed observed right now in your business uh so i started working at yahoo e-commerce i have a digital background i think the biggest challenge for us working here is uh, people and culture and organization i think for all kinds of technologies 5g ai big data they are quite mature right now compared to what we had 20 years ago the the, the got come bubble right and at that time a lot of technologies weren't mature but now this is the moment where we can use technologies digital technologies to transform the world and for all kinds of industries um marketing manufacturing businesses need to understand what technologies can enable them to do and then they promote this organizational change to embrace these technologies new values new value creators and it cannot happen over time they need to go through a series of trials and errors to enable digital transformation Digital transformation actually mean two things, digital technology adoption and organizational transformation. So uh, technologies are easy, but the key lies in organizational change. I can tell you, yeah. That's awesome. Okay, I, I know Pukera having uh, after meeting, so I want to ask them, a, uh, each of you gonna ask you a, your specific uh, uh, question how your organization can bring the uh, data to value. So I want to ask Puka first, okay? And uh, uh, go to, you know, that's a company, Gojek, and uh, Tokopedia just merged, so congratulations. Now you have more than 2.5 million registered drivers and over 40 million registered merchants as uh, September, 2021. How does Gojek's intent to provide value to data partners? Looking internally, what are some of the Gojek's biggest data initiatives after the merge and the value you have seen? All right. So I'll probably start with a three-step framework that we always follow in providing value to our data partners. And the number one is enhancing the user experience in our ecosystem, which basically means whatever data initiative we undertake, we will always prioritize the user experience or ecosystem as the number one priority, because we don't want to have any sort of dissatisfaction from the user perspective. Number two, the objective is always to make the user journey shorter and faster so the brand can reach the user much, much faster and more efficiently. And number three is connecting the right target audiences with the right brand, the right offer, the right promotion at the right time with the right uh, user journey. So I think these are three frameworks that we always follow. Now, what is the benefit for the data partner is that they're able to reach out to the customer at the right time by anticipating, anticipating the needs using our AI and machine learning model. So they don't have to waste time to look at a campaign, high perform, and then try to deep dive into it. You can actually, on the in real time, optimize your marketing dollars to understand your customers better and get the most out of your current marketing efforts. So that's number one. 
Number two, you're not doing any more guesswork. You're not doing a probability-based marketing anymore. This is real purchase behavior shown by the consumers. So it's actually deterministic marketing, which means that you know what people have bought in the past, you know what they want to buy in the future, and you're trying to provide a promotion or offer to fulfill that need. Hence, if you reach the right person, or right user at the right time, the conversion or the uh, sales are much, much more effective than doing a bit of guesswork as was being done in the previous times. So there's more efficiency in how you spend your marketing dollars. It is a very good balance of performance marketing and brand building because we can't do one without the other. So we have the, our merchant and data partners to build a brand with the users, drive performance marketing, but at the same time, build loyalty from their consumer's point of view. This helps to extend the consumer lifecycle value so that the user is not only trying you once because of a discount or promotion, but coming back to you again and again in the future because you have a better product or a service to offer to them. Awesome. So, you know, I, I learned something too. Really shorten the user journey also precision uh, targeting, that those are definitely the, the, the biggest weapon. So I the, definitely uh, look forward to uh, uh, seeing the combined uh, uh, companies, uh, their success. Thank you. Um, so next question I want to ask Ping, Ping Ling, okay? Uh, because you talk about the, uh, the how to using the massive data. So when most people today have focused on structured data, instead AI is tackling the 80% of the enterprise data today that is unstructured data. So how do the requirement for data access and application very different between structured and unstructured data? And what value do you think can be unlocked from, from it and where? Oh, oh, cool, yeah, this is a very good topic to explore. Yeah, so basically, you know, unstructured data is essentially very different from structured data as far as their processing is concerned. When we process structured data, the data are already in a fairly well-defined form, right? Like we can just use the data's attributes, schema, or properties to manage the data further. In contrast, unstructured data is nothing but a chunk of binary file, which cannot be processed by a computer, you know, for the content directly. To check the content of unstructured data to make a computer really understand and be able to process it, we need to resort to advanced algorithms. Well, you know, to be more specific, the, we need to resort to deep learning and data-driven approaches. Building such components is in fact, extremely resource consuming. Yeah, however, you know, the, um, this is the reason why most of our shared tools in modern data stack are still for only structured data, right? Unstructured data has been unfortunately ignored in the data tree for a long period of time, even until today. Let's say if we can actually have a converter Right, a, a very intelligent transformer that can effectively put unstructured visual data to the structured representation. The unstructured visual data can then be straightforwardly used exactly the same way the structured data is used nowadays. For example, like the, the structure, the, those structured representation can now uh, exploit the tool like uh, Kenner's uh, data uh, platform as a as a form of uh, uh, structured data. Now then the requirement for the data access and application for both the structure and unstructured one cannot be pretty much shared. Right? They can actually share some common uh, you know, modern data stack tool. It's no matter it's for data warehouse, BI, or whatever tool that's already built for structured data. I think that's the most you know, ideal future for the data industry. There must be some sort of a tool or a way that can bridge unstructured data and structured data together and to start to, you know, um, extract the value from that huge amount of uh, unstructured visual data. Yeah, and just to give you some more you know, concrete example, imagine that you can, if you can like drag, drag and drop an image or video in the app, the app will extract the content of video or image you know, for you automatically. You can then access the visual content in the structured data way. You know, this, this will unleash uh, many possibilities to distill the value of unstructured video data, right? Like you can, for, for, for Pocket, uh, you might be able to start to understand how, you know, customer likes to a certain a picture of items or products and, you know, put, merge every, every uh, fills all the data together and to, you know, maximize the, the value of your enterprise data. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I definitely, I think the uh, compare the structured data versus the unstructured data, you really open up the entire horizons. You know, you, you mm. were able to see much more insight. So I think this is a challenge, but that's also uh, very fruitful. So I think that definitely, I think that will, is the future. Actually it's not future, it's right now. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, uh, next, Howard. And uh, first of all, con congratulations for just raising pre-A $3.5 million. 
You mentioned that Kenner has focused on delivering seamless, fast, and now secure data access for enterprise users. So let me quote you, okay? This is why you say, okay, I only can see the, uh, in, the, in, in the Chinese. So, so compared to uh, last year's products, Kenner now focuses more on having the right people have the right data. So in addition to data access, data authorization. How does that differ from the various industry you work with today? When we talk about data management, actually this, this field has seen a lot of changes. I, I want to talk about it in three ways. First is application, and second process, and third organization. So first application. As I said, BI doesn't only include visualization. We know Streamleave, which was acquired by uh, by another company. It is a solution provider to build data application. BI now has so wide in application and now in the next three to five years, we're going to see a surge of new applications of BI. That's the first thing. Second process. Recently, uh, a new trend in data management is data analysis engineering. In traditional software management, uh, testing, CI/CD, or versioning, these applications will all be shifted, uh, migrated to the field of data management. If we want to scale up data management, we need to have stronger or better control on the process. Third is organization. To empower all units, all BUs have better data autonomy. That's why we call data match. The data now is centralized in most companies in the IT or MIS because data access uh, needs to be secured. People, teams need to file um, requests to get access to data, to migrate data from A to B, so people at B could have data. Why? Because people want to avoid risks related to data use, right? And these are all topics in data management. If we look at the bigger picture, data management will be smarter in the future. Whether it be data storage, data warehouse, they are all scattered. They need to be managed manually right now with the access control, metadata, or um, record auditing. These are all done manually, right? But in the future, we will have intelligent data management solutions with uh, uh, real-time alerts. For example, when someone is not should not be authorized, there will be an alert in the system. That's how you can have data autonomy in a company. So I feel that now with all these manually controlled processes, we can have a lot of mistakes and errors. These not these are not a result of the algorithms or the query or the technology, but from how the company is managed. We already have good solutions that can be scaled. So the 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 challenge in data access is the organization. Thank you.
enterprise, especially traditional enterprise, okay, and they uh, when they are doing the digital transformation, they all have to deal with this, this problem. And I think that's uh, really uh, remind me why Frank just talked about it, Zhuzhi and Wenhua. Okay, so I think I would like to ask Frank, because you probably have the, the toughest challenges among all of us. Okay, so uh, let me quote the, uh, the S-Fly CEO, okay, at the end of 2020. 在产品规划里，会员经济与文化观光设计生根，品牌顾问将是带动产品未来成长的四大支柱。其中，会员经济在今年成为产品重要的一个支柱。在疫情爆发前，会员消费贡献整体营收五成，疫情达七成。那现在
好，我们现在下午场的活动要正式开始了，请大家可以入座，谢谢。Welcome back to the 2022 Galaxy Summit. Summit. Our afternoon session will start right now. Our topic in the afternoon would be AI. There has been a multiple fold of investments in AI over the past year. There have been unicorn AI companies growing from 16 to 50 or so companies. So, where are the opportunities and challenges in this future trend? We will be inspecting that across different stages. The first, um, the first speaker will be Jeff Chen, a professor at National Tsinghua University. He has previously written a book, two books, Industry 3.5 and Blue Lake Blue Lake Strategy, which have been critical to companies formulating AI strategies. For the future, please let us welcome him today to share with us how companies can utilize AI technology for digital transformation. <clears throat> um, Chairman Yan, friends. Good afternoon. I'm very honored to have this opportunity to be here and have um, a speak, have a conversation with everyone. Uh, and to you, Professor Li Jiayan is also here today and will be sharing with us later as well. Um, so I recently wrote a book to uh, I, which I spent two years developing the Blue Lake strategy over the past two years. So what this strategy means is essentially we need to find our own niche market. So we are always fluctuating between blue ocean and red ocean, but blue lake, the blue lake is actually um, something that a lot of our successful Taiwanese companies have grounded themselves in. A blue lake is a small market with a high profit margin that allows them to sustain, that allows companies to sustain their success. Another uh, inference or another meaning between, uh, behind this blue lake is an opportunity is for us to retain our manufacturing share. There is a saying by Mencius that we have to uh, fill out all these ponds, these lakes, so it will overflow into the oceans. For example, the water will flow down from the Jane Mountain that will maybe flow into uh, the Sun Moon Lake. I would like to use this as a metaphor for our industries and talk about how we could retain value. So um, the Industrial, for, industrial uh, Revolution 4.0 actually can segments the industrial era into four segments. I would like to argue that from one to four, this is not a consecutive process. The first and third industrial revolution had enabling technologies. First one was steam-powered mechanical uh, manufacturing facilities. The third was IC and IT. But the industrial 2.0 actually took a significant amount of time. Um, an industrial 4.0 is slated for 2025, but we know that will be delayed from now. The, industrial, the second industrial revolution started from 1840 to 1860 and ended at World War I. So it was a gradual process that took 80 years or 60 years. The fourth industrial revolution will not necessarily take that long, but uh, it will take time for us to gradually apply AI because we've had AI for uh, a very long time. 
it's about how do we develop and apply it in the future. This is not a technological problem because as we scale up, there will be problems with scientific management as well. And this is something that I'd like to highlight. So every single industrial revolution is the redistribution of value, whether it's for companies or countries. Uh, Germany proposed the industrial 4.0, industry 4.0 in 2013, 2014. Um, and claims that uh, the Western Europe has lost 10% of their manufacturing and they aim to recover uh, that 10%. If we consider the entire manufacturing sector around the world to be 100% and the US and, the, and Germany wants to take back 10%, um, the impact to Taiwan and emerging countries will be greater than 10%. Taiwanese manufacturers produce not only in Taiwan, but also in Southeast Asia as well. So what is the best strategy for Taiwan? That's something worth discussing. In 2014, uh, during a conference um, where everybody you know, brought up ideas and inspired, I proposed Industry 3.5. I thought uh, that would be a, the end of it, but there was a newspaper that headlined Industry 3.5 and it's gradually um, became more prominent. I ended up writing a book called Industry 3.5, and was which was recognized by uh, the Memo Set Ministry of Science and Technology as well as the Ministry of Economy. This was inspired by my industry observations. Um, from 2015 to 2018, I worked with TSMC. After that, I returned uh, to National Tsinghua University, but then was reintroduced to media tech as a consultant. Um, during that time, there were a lot of Shenzhai or like fake phones. Uh, we know that at that time, uh, 3G technology was just launched and media tech actually developed uh, industry 2.5G. So uh, 3G was actually developed and launched in 1998. Media tech chose to chose to develop the 2.5G. Even though at that time, iPhone started having 3G, but 3G technology was simply a growing technology at the time, not as prevalent. That's why MediaTek decided to adopt a hybrid strategy between 2.5G and 3G, which is 2.5G. It is using existing 2G infrastructure uh, but also provides 3G functions. It was very successful, and so they further upgraded it to 2.75G. So with the rise of a new generation, we will see the decline of the previous one. What 2.5G and 2.75G allowed was an opportunity for media tech to profit from that interim period. Media tech also had other strategies. They would uh, provide reference designs, as well as turnkey solutions that uh, allowed customers to build their own ecosystems. This has allowed um, the mobile phone manufacturing sector to develop and flourish. So this is kind of like the angle there. It's like this S curve at the beginning of this S curve. Um, this is like the blue ocean strategy where we should be the first to invest in new industries. Um, for, but then once you succeed in that area, a lot of people will start investing in the same industry as well. So in this media tech example, the S-curve is uh, waiting for the 3G market to saturate. And so they entered with their own approach and their own technology. With uh, new technology, media tech continued to evolve as well. I would like to use uh, uh, the example brought up by Zhu Sheng, a scholar in the Ming Dynasty. He, he advised that we must build entry barriers, accumulate assets, and take it slow. It is very difficult. And we always tell people to define new markets, but and then tell them that the market would then be theirs, but this is in fact very difficult. But media tech chose to take a more practical approach and they decided to take it slow where they continued to maintain progress. 
within existing foundations, which helped sustain corporate growth. Taiwan is very familiar with horizontal division of labor because Taiwanese people like to be their own boss. But a lot of these industries have a lot to do with ATX standards. This is my own computer, actually. I think at National Tsinghua University and in Taiwanese colleges, uh, students or graduate students will go to uh, supermarkets or uh, tech markets to build their own motherboards or computers similar to IBM standards because there is this thing that we call the ATX standard, which allows people to build an IBM, um, IBM style computer. So the barrier, the entry barrier is reduced now. A lot of companies might only build the case or just the motherboard and they're able to um, achieve success in that industry because the market is so big. So in this EMS uh, seg industry as well, the margin is quite low, but they have so their stock prices are so high because the quantity, the volume is simply incredible. But with Industry 4.0, they're talking about smart production. This will affect our ecosystem. And that is my concern. But let's take a look um, at these impact. Since we have this impact, somebody needs to propose an idea because it will benefit them. Was this IBM's idea? IBM was also uh, replaced by new technologies as well. We have a lot of people here that know that this was actually developed by Intel. Intel at the time was an IBM vendor. They had this vision to propose this idea. As we can see within these standards, so even with DRAM, we know we can replace it if we don't have enough memory, but he knows, but they knew that nobody would uh, swap out their CPU. I don't know who uh, kind of propagated that idea, but essentially now if we're changing the CPU, we're changing our entire computer. So these have been clear, so these things that have been clearly defined, uh, companies compete And so all of these uh, components become cheaper and cheaper, but that profit is not necessarily transferred to customers because customers are still buying the same product. It, Intel has uh, these hidden margins, which means that they don't have to compete in terms of price and they still get to retain their margin. But this is not a model that I think a lot of Taiwanese companies are able to replicate. Um, I'd rather talk about uh, companies that have been successful in Taiwan. We always uh, idolize them, but we forget to find out why they succeeded. So I wrote these I wrote these books because I wanted other industries to be able to apply the same approaches and to build upon our own hardworking um, nature with new ideas. So I'd like to ask everybody, um, Intel has a high margin, over 50% profit margin with CPU. Why are they trying to still make PCBs? Or why do they still produce PCBs? Taiwan used to be very strong on PCB because of pollution. We actually had to um, outsource it to different countries. Obviously we still do have PCB uh, manufacturers that are very, very strong right now. But why is Intel producing PCB? Because it's not, there's no profit margin in this. The answer is very simple because everybody that is competing in this industry will give up. But then Intel we be, will be able to win out and it will force these PCB manufacturers to continue using Intel CPUs. Who benefits? Yes, consumers, definitely. But also, this will drive more demand for CPU as well. So this is a strategic decision. So when I was uh, writing up this case study, I had a really good friend, Christensen, that talked about the value distribution. When we see this uh, personal computer uh, industry, 
they've been able to find a lot of success. But Taiwan CRAM and PCB is not great. We have not been able to gain value from this. Uh, it's mainly the other peripheral industries that have been able to um, be being profitable in this industry. In my book, I also quoted an MIT professor as well as a good friend, Charlie Fines. Uh, theory, he studied Taiwan, uh, the US's ICT industry and the evolution of it. There's this double rotation, double rotor. It is kind of like what we say in Chinese, the only constant is change. Based on my own experience, I've concluded a, diff a few different impact factors because if there's something that drives uh, vertical integration, there, there's something to drive horizontal division of labor. Our vendors, our upstream suppliers, they also want tr change as well and they will have their own strategies. But this is only to describe the process of evolution. Our industries have multiple layers and it's like running a, a, tr running a race there are different tracks and those tracks will create gaps. We are doing well in semiconductor and ICT, but then our bottleneck right now is in PCB or other industries as well. The gap is an opportunity for entrepreneurs and for different potential solutions. We can see that the global supply chain has worsened because of COVID-19, but I think that was already the existing trend. Everybody in this tract are trying to develop smart production, smart manufacturing, using um, smart control over their inventory and small lot sizes. But this is very unstable and very unreliable at this time. For example, it's like driving in Taiwan or Taipei rather. There's so many people, it becomes very um, unreliable and predictable. But if it's just you on the road, it's very easy. So with the death of supply chain management, we will see short and fragmented supply chain. But I predict that there will be more a bigger issue with the supply chain as such. I propose the PDCCCR uh, model. As Morris Chang says, a CEO's job is to bring in the outside uh, buyers and then establish strategy, mobilize internal resources to make profit for the company. So Taiwanese companies are great at getting orders, but when you have um, a great product mix, a very diverse product mix, you might not be able to allocate your resources the most effectively. I think the key right now is how to optimize resources as effectively. This is not just ap applicable to uh, major companies. I mentioned a case study that was actually a small vendor in a night market in Southern Taiwan, and it was uh, applicable as well. Now we also know Moore's law. This was proposed in 1965 that the number of transistors fabricated in an area will be doubled every 12 months and later said 24 months. So I'd like, we need to continue uh, looking for technological development. We're now up to seven uh, nanometer, five nanometer, but the price will continue to reduce as well. Why is this pace important? Because it will lead the industry to follow the same pattern and will strengthen the industry so that it does not end up becoming a red ocean strategy, a red ocean market. So why is every generation ends up uh, in this curve? Because there's uh, the most appropriate product as we call. We can use incredible machines for uh, simple products, but that won't be the most effective strategy or approach. How do we allocate and optimize allocation of the resources involves the uh, company's management capabilities. We have to 
in the past that relied on people's decision making, but now we have to also apply um, data as well. So Taiwan has this uh, leading advantage. In the past, uh, we were trying to make transistors smaller and smaller, but I've developed this layer for different approaches and different uh, methods and this, these different layers. I think my time is up, but maybe just give me three more minutes. I'll just talk about, uh, I'll quickly review the next few slides. So even expanding this structure, you'd be able to find a lot of different approaches in the future as well. I've talked about how to uh, ramp up the overall way for effectiveness. A lot of industries don't have this idea because they're creating uh, hundreds of thousands, billions even of products. So they have usually a really steep learning curve. And how do we do this uh, blue ocean market? Well, you have to have a small diversity of products with a large quantity. So there is a lot of different approaches. So in the Blue Lake strategy, this is not just a strategy, but also to how to enable these strategies. I think this is something that all the different companies can look into. TSMC has done a lot. Harvard has also reported on this. But right now we're talking more about uh, real-time decisions, just like our TCM, traditional Chinese medicine uh, physicians are talking about it. You have to look for past reasons, know why it's incorrect, and then uh, try not to make the same mistakes again. So the whole industry ecosystem exists, uh, has gaps. If you look at the semiconductors uh, evolution and industry, we can see a lot of different models, business models emerge. There's a lot of new industries, for example, driverless cars would like to uh, also use this horizontal division of labor. They think they can replicate T TSMC's ecosystem, but if they don't, or the TSMC model, but without the same ecosystem, it will be harder for them to succeed. This is something that is worth uh, discussing and considering about. I also propose an example, which is uh, TSMC as well as its subsidiary, GUC. Uh, it is. It has a vertical virtual integration, and now it's developing flexible ASIC. Because of the BIS model, they've been able to evolve. The reason they're evolving is to actually fill in the gaps in the semiconductors ecosystem. So I think there's a lot of SMEs and or even major companies in Taiwan that may not necessarily be able to um, breed their own AI team. Obviously, in this community, there's a lot of teams that want to fill in that gap, fill in that space that will help facilitate Taiwan grow in the future. Um, during tech conferences, I've always talked that we need to develop this AI, smart AI service teams. I just wanted to prove that I really uh, walk the talk. We developed such a company in Tsinghua University um, to provide these smart AI services or consultations to major companies in Taiwan. So Taiwan may have a really high flexibility, but we have poor standardization and SOPs. They may want to develop that, but AI technology is not the end all be all solution to achieve that. Um, I think that MediaTek's hybrid strategy with Industry 2.5 is a great template for companies to look into using existing infrastructure to apply or develop and progress the companies as well. Taiwan, ha Taiwan has a lot of hardworking uh, people, managers, engineers. I think Industry 3.5 essentially is this Iron Man concept where we can use technology not to replace people, but to reinforce our people. I think we should be able to apply this to emerging countries as well. We have a lot of industries that are transforming already. 
um, I would hope for these countries, uh, for these companies to develop solutions and to even sell those solutions as well. Um, I have written this song. Unfortunately, I won't have time to share it with you today, but thank you very much for listening. And now we are going to explore AI further through different industries. First up, manufacturing. How does AI promote a intelligent transformation? This first panel is moderated by Richie Tsai, Provost of Taiwan AI Academy. Joining him is Mr. Duan Xingjian, Honorary Chairman of Inalux, and Li Jiayan, Professor from National Taiwan University. Good afternoon. So the panel discussion will be around 35 minutes. I just lend five minutes to Mr. Jian, our previous speaker. So I wanted to continue the topic of the Blue, State, Blue Lake strategy. And today we are very honored to have two of my good friends, uh, guest speakers. The first one is Honorary Chairman from Inalux, Mr. Duan Xingjian, and Professor Li from National Taiwan University. I'd like to invite them to briefly introduce themselves. Good afternoon, everyone. I uh, established Inalux in around 2003, in 2016, I handed over to my successor and started self-learning in the area of AI. I now also lead a small team at Inalux on AI automation to um, launch a few projects, do some learning. In 2003, when I started Inalux, I saw a, a quote from Michael Porter. He said, if a business wants to outperform to beat other companies, the first thing is you need to differentiate. And then you need to maintain this differentiation. And that is pretty cool. And I thought uh, I wanted to differentiate our company through our management uh, about information, about data. And now looking back, for us at that time, data was compiled, still need to be an analyzed manually. But now we have uh, SaaS, and at that time, what we did mostly is ICE. And with the advent of industrial IoT, AI, we probably would have covered ICE and SaaS and have it all. We also set up a BU on automation and IIoT. also developed in, sorry, in around 2015, in AI 2018. And throughout these years, when I was doing data collection and uh, data management, I had a guideline at that time. to have data transparency, etc. And when it comes to execution, my rule of thumb is to have one touch. You cannot copy and pass, copy and pass. 
And now, as I started to learn about IIoT, data security, I feel like there should be a zero touch policy for data to ensure security and accuracy. And that, that's all for me. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, before I was serving as a professor at Chenggong University, and I've been uh, in the fields of fasteners, uh, hardware before. I've also dabbled in the semiconductor industry. And now I am a uh, professor at the National Taiwan University. I've known uh, Mr. Jian, uh, our previous professor, for quite a lot of time. I'd like to um, echo what Mr. Duan said. When we look at AI today, we look at data collection, and uh, from standardization process, uh, digitization, smart solutions, you can see we are moving on a learning curve. And I've heard so many speakers talking about the solutions, the algorithms they provide to enhance AI's performance. But I also would like to remind all of us to take a pause and look back. Because we, we might want to look back and figure out what's the meaning of our previous steps. A lot of our students uh, these days say to me, the quality of data is key, but how do we evaluate the quality of data? As a user for so long, sometimes we don't know how to identify or determine the quality anymore. I believe many of you uh, have heard of the term metadata. For us, gender is a, a simple variable. But gender now is not so simple anymore. We did collect data, but do we think about what do we what we collected it for or uh, the, the bigger picture? I think I would just stop here. I think we three have something in common. We all have an engineering background. And um, then we started our own path, but we are all quite practical as engineers. We thought about the whole design thinking, the process when we design uh, AI solutions and smart manufacturing solutions. And I'd like to first pose a question for the two gentlemen. Prior to smart manufacturing, uh, the idea of Industry 4.0 was proposed at the Hanover uh, Expo. And big data, the concept of big data has thus evolved into all kinds of things, smart factory, um, smart solutions. We saw a lot of companies investing in such, but few really achieved the vision of Industry 4.0. We need to evaluate the maturity the progress of each factory, we can dive really deeper into these things. So I now I would like to start from Professor Lee, who has uh, extensive experience in smart manufacturing. I'd like to invite uh, him to share uh, his views on smart manufacturing. I think looking at the history of smart manufacturing, uh, we all focus on data, right? Because AI has to have data to work. So we actually now spend quite a lot of time uh, looking into data. 
So in the evolution history, data is a key enabler. For me, I also focus on process because they are intertwined. In a project, I would think about why we need AI. Is AI necessary? Can we deal with the problem with traditional statistical methods? And this has a lot to do with the working process because there are a lot of moving parts in a process, right? In each step, there are key data to collect in each step, each phase. And when you introduce AI, you might discover that uh, a part becomes a black box because AI has taken care of that. But sometimes we cannot elaborate why we need AI here, right? So in this process, we need to first think why. Why do we need to collect this data or introduce AI here? And um, A lot of students would say uh, we want to operationalize this AI project and tell me they are having difficulty doing it. The AI's performance is just not as optimal as human. And I would say for AI to perform as well as humans do, uh, it, it's, it can be difficult because AI is not as flexible as we humans. So if the performances of the two are similar, then I think it's, it's good to go. But then I would also ask my students, why do you want to initiate this project? If this is the right project to do, then you should go ahead with it despite all the challenges, right? And you go through trials and errors. Thank you, Professor Li. My next question goes to Mr. Duan. We were having dinner. Um, earlier at, at one day and then he he is now a uh, chairman and an engineer and i want to invite mr duan to build on his decades of experience and share with us his views on smart manufacturing i, I want to quote another famous man the founder, uh, Terry Guo of uh, Foxconn. There's a quote I like, really like about him. He said, strategy is about direction, timing, and the extent you do. And I feel that uh, IoT, AI are the right direction, but each company uh, is at a different stage. So the timing would be different. I feel like we should look at AI in a bigger framework. AI is the umbrella term, right? Uh, I and we talk about digital transformation. But for me, I have my reservation about this term. For AI, if we narrow it down, I think uh, uh, I've launched quite a few different projects in the field of AI, SquidNet. SSD or OCC. And I could tell you quite frankly, not a single project I do 
really carry through because in the midway i would find out that there's something wrong with the data there's something wrong with the process so uh, these projects are about iteration to continuously improve and um, adjust so ai and big data are the right direction to go earlier we heard a presentation about the status of enterprise a speaker said that um, for every week a company can build a new mold well i i have doubts in that regardless ai or smart manufacturing is about um, having a standard process ai is not a thing that you achieve ai is a tool that helps you achieve things it's it's a piece in your strategy and you need to discover your pain points and address them through IT. And we need to evaluate based on different companies' situation. Uh, Chairman Tong, in continuation in the question, uh, for AI, we consider data scenario algorithm processes and uh, the definition of the question. So in continuation of your response, when uh, introducing AI into scenarios, we have the technology, we have the management. Which one do you think is more important between uh, management as well as technology? Uh, and then also why? Also give us a brief explanation um, on how you've been helping companies to digitally transform uh, in terms of how which ones are the most important processes? This is definitely a very old question. There's a lot of people asking, which one is more important, technology or management? Everybody thinks that it's both equally important and that's the only correct answer. If you're forcing me to rank it, I would say management is 51% and technology would be 49%. Uh, during lunch, I was talking with Professor Lee. When a company develops an AI model, how do we view this model? Is it simply a tool or is it an internal product? For me personally, implementing AI, developing AI, is very similar to manufacturing. And now data, which trains the AI algorithm is the most important thing. That's basically, data is basically the input. And if the input is poor, your product will also be poor. Now, what is algorithm? Algorithm to me is like the equipment. What about the hyperparameters um, in the algorithms? I think those are what we refer to as recipes. So we have the input, we have the machine, we have the recipe, but we also need to have a pilot run, reliability testing. So if you view a model as a product, I think the management is, of it is very important. So I think all the companies will need to develop a process like for uh, producing models. We have to have feasibility studies. We have to define the specifications. Uh, that would be for DR1. DR3 will be the samples. 
and then DR4 might be, or DR4, DR5 will be pilot run, DR6 will be mass production, and then DR7 will be uh, increased yield and end of life. So some companies will have six to seven people. Um, if you just build the model and you call it successful and you're building 30 to 50 models but with poor management, I would say it's very, uh, very, very dangerous. And developing models has also, um, you might also have a poor yield rate as well. Models that fail goes against the yield rate. It is not a successful yield. Also, some models might be successful for predicting certain data sets, but not necessarily for other data sets. Thank you. Per Professor Lee, do you agree with the 51%, 49% distribution allocated? Um, actually, in school, in the information technology department, we're always talking about uh, that 70% of it is technology, 30% of it is management. Not sure where these numbers come from, but as we know in school, we, th we learn more about theory and so we care more about technology since management requires practical experience. Um, as uh, Chairman Tuan mentioned, that machines have a lot of parameters that we have to fine tune and adjust in order to create a, a successful product. Um, now we have hyperparameters, momentums. How do we adjust these? We can see that it's very similar. Models and products are very similar. And so in school, we teach students how to uh, consider building a model from a very theoretical standpoint. As students enter the workforce, they start realizing that to a certain degree, they need to, uh, when they're trying to apply the model to actual problems, they realize that there is a gap, a knowledge gap. So there's a, a gap. They don't know necessarily how to apply the models. And so I very much agree with uh, Chairman Tuan because we have to uh, elevate, we have to value management more. I think we need to increase that 30% to 51% focus on management. That's why we have this industry and academic gap. I think we need to try and uh, mitigate that. Now, during this transformation, I think a key uh, aspect is what I just mentioned. During this transformation, AI, uh, AI companies want to create a model and then be an applicable model that can already, that is already ready for market because that gives us a great sense of accomplishment. But honestly, it requires time as well as domain specific adjustments for it to be uh, well coordinated. Thank you, Professor Lee, for talking about the technological and management percentage and fine tuning it based on your own experience. Um, I'd like to ask Professor Lee to ask Chairman Tuan and for Chairman Tuan to maybe ask uh, Professor Lee some questions that you have for each other. Um, I don't, this is quite challenging for me, but I do have a question for Chairman Tuan because we were hearing a lot about a lot of different AI tools and models. I'm just wondering with all these new AI models and products, it seems like we need to have a management model or maybe even a platform to help manage such AI tools. I'm not sure what uh, your thoughts are on this, about this. I've talked about this uh, a bit. From DR1 to DR7, I use this kind of approach to um, propose a management model, essentially. Um, I think the model needs a model name, just like products have a product name, because it's easier to manage. 
It's the same at the end of the day, I think. Um, in English, we have a saying that there's no panacea, which is, means that there's no end-all be-all resolution. And AI is not an end-all be-all solution. So management has to try and balance AI. And I think that balancing AI means that we don't necessarily um, fully trust AI, at least not right now. Um, I'm always asking people, I know that AI is a wonderful technology, something that we must learn to use and apply in our lives. But I'm always um, asking, do they really think that with AI, they don't have to learn physics? No, you still have to learn physics. You still have to, you can improve the processes of certain equipment and machines, but it will not tell you or teach you how to make or develop these machines. So honestly, I think that, uh, we need to learn to manage AI tools and technology. We need to learn to apply them. But just because we're applying AI doesn't mean we can ignore fundamental science, such as mathematics, science, statistics, and so on and so forth. From a practical standpoint, um, Taiwan is kind of declining, going on a decline when it comes to fundamental sciences. If AI is creating an ecosystem or a landscape where people can, people are starting to believe AI as the end-all be-all solution, I think that may um, actually facilitate a decline for our fundamental sciences. And that is definitely very concerning um, on the other hand, uh, if we were to manage AI tools, big data, IoT, I think it requires talents that are able to integrate because in order to integrate AI and big data, that is a cross-domain application. People need to understand AI as well as big data. Maybe AI talents don't necessarily don't have to know that all the details, but you have a you have to be able to come up with the full propagation and backward propagation of the entire AI technology to determine whether you are overfitting the model or whether you've developed a naive model that is absolutely incorrect, that perhaps looks beautiful. So I think we need these integrative talents with fundamental sciences. Now, um, when we implement automation and AI, I continue to stress that we need to apply scientific management. That is the foundation um, that supports AI. We need to use management and science to support IoT, as well as automation. Without the fundamental sciences, your technology is empty. You can create beautiful scenarios and case studies, but your yield will be low and it will not be reliable. And so um, a few of our former speakers talked about how AI is developing rapidly. But for me personally, the challenge for AI is whether um, we are consistent. Are you, is the model successful this week? Is it successful next week across different parameters, adjusted parameters? I think that kind of consistency is far more important. Um, in the existing landscape. Thank you, Chairman Twin, for bringing up this uh, consistent improvement for consistency in the future. Uh, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask Professor Lee about uh, studying in school, academics? No? Uh, let me just share some thoughts uh, on Chairman Tuan's perspectives. When we teach at school, the way we define an engineer 
is actually based on science, somebody that solves problems based on science. That's something we always talk about. First of all, they must be grounded in science. We don't necessarily base it on our experience or practical uh, ex our experiences. Those experiences are still going to be based on science. We need to be able to solve ex real problems, real life problems. So given this definition, that's how we are, are teaching our students. We want to come from a scientific perspective and teach our students that they have to understand the fundamental reasoning behind it. So let's say we've developed a model that is 97% accurate and 96% accurate. Is the 97% one uh, better if we base it on statistics, which uh, we have samples, there's a standard deviation, there's a mean. So we'll see that, okay, for example, maybe the mean uh, indicates that it's 97% accurate. And then we look at the standard devi deviation and we see how we run different tests. We realize that it's not significant then the 97% one may not necessarily be better. So in continuation of uh, Chairman Tuan's response, yes, we need to focus on consistency. We want the model to be consistent over this week and next week. Um, and one of the keys to this is characteristics. During the early years, we spent a lot of time exploring models, but right now, we are dedicating more time to data, the preparation of data, and then characteristics. The characteristics will shift over time. You know, for example, there are four seasons in a year. Each season has different characteristics. The same applies to model as well. As times shift, the characteristics model will also shift. Sometimes you have to add the characteristics or take it out or increase its weight. This is what we call a concept drift or domain adapt adaptation. So how do we adjust this? How do we shift our characteristics? in our model based on the different scenarios. If we're able to achieve that real-time updates to our models, then I think we will be able to achieve the consistency that Chairman Tuan achieved. May I ask a question to Professor Li? I, I feel that uh, we in the industry often talk about things that are limited to our own company or uh, due to confidentiality, we can't talk much. And you in the academic field actually um, can learn about different things in different companies. Can, would you please share now the, the challenges for people uh, when they introduce uh, AI and data. The biggest challenge is people. I, I feel that a lot of people would think that way. When you get the people right, a lot of things will just fall into the right place. So people is, is key here. Do you mean young people or old people? I, I wouldn't say who is to blame. But we have talents regardless of age. We need talent. Companies are poaching talent from each other. And um, it doesn't matter if you're old, if you're young. If right people are put in the right place, they shine. They generate value, right? Let's say you have a data science team. Um, I used to work in a semiconductor company. 
working in their data science team. It's interesting to see how the team evolved. At the beginning, um, you would think uh, you need data scientists who are trying to be. But that's not true nowadays because high schools now are teaching courses in AI. A lot of high school students are learning about AI now. So AI talent can come from different departments, not only limited to the data science departments. And it would be great to have that um, mix. So maybe part of the team members from statistics, part of them from economics, and you can have different brainstorm effects, right? But some people would say it's not really a real interdisciplinary team. An interdisciplinary team is made of people who have two or plus skills who are able to learn to span across different fields and not only to learn but also to uh, generate new insights or new sparks from what you learn from the two or more than two fields and that kind of spark and that new insights would be super beneficial to the company. So in the process of uh, cultivating talent, another thing is we often talk about, we often say that engineers should also be good teachers. They, they should teach what they know, right? But when we really start teaching, we only start learning when we start teaching. So I would say people still remain the, the, the biggest challenge. Thank you for both of your uh, insights from management, talent, to practical issues, to interdisciplinary talent. Now with the last three minutes, I'd like you to use 30 seconds to respond to the following question. In the future years, what do you think is the most important investment in the field of uh, AI or data? Again, people, because prof as Professor Lee said, people are the, the most important piece. So what do I mean by investing in people? What qualities to invest? Investing in people is the, the, the right strategy. We might employ different people, different members, but uh, a key from what he said is not only we need do we need to put people together in an effective mix, in a quality mix. We need an integrator, a, a person who has six or seven desired qualities who knows a bit about IT, AI, domain, uh, and several qualities. In a company, such talent is hard to find. But what about uh, a senior employee who has good education in uh, science, who is about retirement age, this kind of person is suitable to be an integrator. To 
learn these new technologies and play that role. I think it's important to have such interdisciplinary uh, expert. Back to, yes, you need to train people, but what do you train these people for? Industrial engineering? Because IT and, and OT, to integrate them in operational technology or improving process technology are the field of uh, uh, industrial engineering. But I think information management department could also contribute to that. What is algorithm? Basically a set of steps to solve a problem. And I think we can train more people uh, in these two fields. Thank you. Thank you both gentlemen for bringing such a wonderful panel discussion. And here I wish all of you health and happiness in your future endeavor. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'd like to invite people from tech and finance to talk about the industry's revolution to embrace AI and automation. Our speakers include Profile CEO, uh, Mr. Huang Jianhao. Sorry, the Infuse AI CEO, Mr. Gao, Y Data founder, Fabiana, and Mr. Zheng. Ladies and gentlemen, online as well. Good afternoon. I'd like to uh, introduce myself. Uh, I'm the board director at Wistron ITS. I'm very honored to be here hosting the panel session. I'm even more happy to be able to be here with my three distinguished guests. Let me introduce the one on my left-hand side first. This is uh, the chief, the senior vice president and chief digital officer at InventTech, Mr. Chen Wei Chao. Please give him a round of applause. The second is uh, the Chief Digital Officer at Taipei Fubang Commercial Bank, Tony Chen. The third is uh, ha who has a leading position in the RPA is Cool Lab. Uh, the co-founder and CTO of this is, is Cool Lab. This is YP Cheng. Before we start, I've already prepared a lot of questions for them. I'd like to give them each 60 seconds to give them uh, to give a brief introduction of themselves. Let's start with uh, Mr. Chen Wei Chao. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I am Chen Wei Chao. I am the Chief Digital Officer and Senior VP at Inventec. Inventec. I'm also at uh, a chairman at Skywatch Innovation, which is a startup company uh, on surveillance. I've been at Inventec for three years uh, because uh, there were investments from Inventec to Skywatch. So that's why I uh, started working with Inventec for AI as well. I actually previously uh, worked at, uh, taught at National Taiwan University as well. Um, I was also a research scientist, research scientist at the Nokia, Nokia Research Center um, in Palo Alto before as well. Uh, Tony, I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Taipei Fubang Bank. Um, I learned mathematics. Uh, I founded two companies and sold two companies. 
Then I went to China, where I served at Baidu and uh, Alibaba and Tencent. Now I've uh, returned to Taiwan and will be helping Fubang Bank with digital transformation. Uh, let me also bring up, he was also, um, he is also the senior, he was also the first senior executive officer at Gongdian as well. I am uh, the co-founder and CTO at Is Cool Lab. I have another hat, which I wear another hat, which is I'm also a professor. Uh, I was encouraged by the MOST to start my own company. The problem we're trying to solve is industrial RPA. I study uh, software engineering, which means that when we're developing tough uh, or challenging software, you will face software uh, engineering problems. We wanted to find this company because we wanted to help uh, major industrial companies uh, resolve issues with manufacturing. So I think this topic today from automation to IA, well, I have more understanding and experience with automation. Now with uh, software engineering, we started to as we delved more into software engineering, we gained more understanding of AI as well. Um, I actually had some prior experience uh, in AI, but then later transitioned to software engineering. I am also currently a consultant for uh, many major tech companies like TSMC and Foxconn. Thank you very much. Uh, this is such a great opportunity so I prepared a lot of questions that I'm sure everybody would like to uh, know the answers to. I'd like to represent, um, on behalf of everybody, I'd like to ask Mr. Chen Wei Chao, can you share with us uh, if Invec Tech has any uh, applications or scenarios that have already introduced smart manufacturing, smart factory, AOI, or uh, smart manufacturing. Can you give us one or two examples? And within these two, with one or two examples, what kind of challenges have you had in, in implementing it? How have you overcome these challenges? So this is a three-part question. First, uh, give us one or two examples. We have so many people here. We want them to have um, a lot of takeaways from this session. So please give us uh, some insight into Inventex implementation and your challenges, as well as how you've overcome them. Thank you. If you're interested, I've actually uh, given a presentation to NVIDIA online, and it is currently available online. There is more information uh, in terms of mathematics algorithm that you're free to go check out. So we have uh, we've done testing for SNT motherboard production. Um, where we check for maybe failures or errors. Such AI processes will use. Uh, traditional AOI machines, which have high failure rates, which means that they reject a lot of the products, which is essentially the motherboards. And then I'll use another AI product to recover the ones that are actually uh, still okay. Um, another product that I thought was Another thing that I thought was very difficult to inspect is the aesthetic or the exterior of the products. It's harder to um, inspect that because there's a lot of flexibility in this area. How do you define what is good enough? It's very difficult to define what is good enough. Workers will be able to identify that based on a complex set of metrics but it is hard to uh, input that metric to AI. That's the most challenging situation. Now for non-manufacturing problems, well, we've also uh, made some HR predictions when people are leaving as well. 
So we have these uh, questions. In the beginning of our digitalization journey, we were thinking about the value and then how to define these problems. We have to know, like, are we able to define these problems clearly? And what is the evaluation criteria? Do we know uh, to what extent is good enough? That was the biggest issue early on. Now, of course, uh, other than the problem defini definition, we also have a, we also care about the ROI. Is this efficient? Is this effective? If we invest a lot of money to create a model that can only replace two people, that's not very effective. But if the machine or model Uh, is able to identify all the standards for all our different suppliers that will have a higher value. So that's kind of how we have prioritized or ranked our AI projects. Um, but just as uh, the former speakers have mentioned before, we've come uh, to face two major challenges. We're unable to use uh, massive data to train these models because the model's complexity is always more complex than data, than the quantity of data we have. And so the quantity of data has actually become a very, very uh, important problem. So we're trying to work across inter uh, organizations so we have more data or maybe we can have a foundation model which allows uh, us to use small data to correct uh, the model as well. Chairman Tuan also amen mentioned this uh, data shift, parameter shift, as well as consistency. Obviously, if the model can be used consistently every single day, that would be great. But it needs to be applicable to different production lines, different products, and we don't know if it is applicable. There are a lot of, uh, it requires a lot of background information in AI, but we only need a small amount of data to correct the model. For example, Non-AI automa automation, we used to only have to fine tune um, maybe two parameters and then that machine would be deployed. Whether we are able to do that with AI models would be the challenge. Even if we're using semi-AI models, uh, we should try and go for that same target as well. Uh, we also need to figure out data acquisition pipelines. If you're using uh, f flawed approaches to achieve, to acquire flawed data, we simply do not have the time to acquire that data over six months or a year. So this has become a big challenge for us. Uh, now, on behalf of our friends, I'd just like to ask, I know that Inventech have faced a lot of issues with choosing AI, choosing projects. You've mentioned a lot. Uh, whether it's AOI, competitivation, how do you filter through which ones to apply, which ones to choose? Um, you've also predicted uh, employees leaving. How has the ROBI been after that? So if you want to use a machine to replace two people, it would be difficult. But to use a machine to replace a delivery condition, yeah, maybe easier. So you need uh, C-suite support. We call it um, ROI. 
but cost is easy to calculate performance not so much so how do we calculate ROI it, it, it's very tricky you can deploy it fast and when you do that the ROA can uh, be calculated fairly quickly so you want to deploy first you would prioritize that right yes that's the, e the easier the simpler and the second question is uh, the impact, business impact. I, I've seen a lot of companies uh, deploy such project in uh, human resource to predict when an employee will leave a company. But it's, it's very difficult to see the accuracy of this AI project. It can be your algorithm is not accurate. Maybe your HR manager is very hardworking and he or she keeps all the employees who want to leave stay. And then when you have interference with the system, it might not be accurate. And when you present this to a manager and you tell him, for example, this uh, Alice is going to leave, the, the manager might be shocked and ask Alice to come for an interview and say like, what's going on? Are you doing okay? And it might cause more trouble than good, right? So in the realm of factory, it can do a lot of work, good, but outside factory, outside manufacturing, it can be tricky. So for uh, Inventech to do these digital optimization, digital transformation, what are the some of the challenges and how to overcome them? It's a, a moving target. A lot of uh, companies know what they want and know what they don't want. But so they know what they don't want, but they don't know what they want. So coming up with a spec is the, the most difficult. And when it comes to selecting a project, it's very dif difficult to balance the, the value, the benefit and uh, the all the other parameters. Sometimes we do POC first, we do a, a quick project and try to scale up. We go through phases, right? So I feel like it's good to have a healthy project funnel. Thank you. Thank you, VP Chen. Now I'd like to ask Tony how Taipei Fubang Bank promotes digital transformation or optimization. How do you speed up uh, the process of data-driven decision-making? Is AI or transformation a result of addressing pain points? Would you please elaborate how Taipei Fubon as a bank um, engage in digital transformation? Um, well, first of all, we are a B2C company. We have a lot of customers, uh, around 7 million customers online, offline. You can imagine with so many ATMs, so when we were having the executive round table, I realized that uh, access to information 
and data turnaround are terrible. Power BI and Excel sheets are the tools we use. We, I, that's when I feel like there's a need to address these. Otherwise, for a team of 7,000 employees, the ROI is not going to look good. So we identified a few points. We have all the data because we are regulated, right? We have all the data. Uh, I would not say it's super clean, but at least it's better than many cases. So we built a proprietary software internally to get real-time data to the right person. Sort of like an alert system to notice the employee that telling him like or her that this is what you need to know. Instead of passively being noticed to read a dashboard and Excel sheet. And you know, we have so many meetings in a day. They don't have a lot of time sitting down and reading a table. So using a passive mode is not going to work. We need to initiate an active mode with a call to action function. Of course, we have uh, our, our internal system like Line, the, mess the messaging group who can push notifications to call an employee to action. And that revolutionize a lot of uh, decision-making processes. You can push forward so many things faster. And that changed how we hold meetings. You, you, you get a faster pace. And I think that's what uh, a lot of companies want to achieve. And that's how we pursue digital transformation. Yeah, for a bank, you have a complete set of data, right? And for me, I feel that SMEs in Taiwan Um, are not updating or capturing their data through sensors. They have outdated uh, equipment. It's not sensor embedded environment. And for banks, a lot of things are captured and recorded. You said that, okay, data is all there. How long have you been uh, launching this, for example, dashboard? to collect, cleanse, analyze, and glean the data for insights to drive decision-making. So how long have Fubam been doing this? Any challenges, setbacks? I've uh, been with Fubam for 1.5 years. It took me four months to identify the problem. And then I started looking around tools, resources. It's like you go into the inventory, the warehouse to see what's available. And you see Tableau. Okay, cool. We have database, ODS. And so you, you get an idea about what we have. And then we identify key points, key lines in our business. For example, insurance, funds, key credit cards, and then you fill in the data. Maybe at this moment, ADM is not the most important, but in the future, it will be a great support. And so we, in a short period of time, gather all the support or the framework and get it started. So you review your skill sets, your resource database, and you examine the, the vital applications in your business flow.
，翻译没有听到现场的声音，没有办法进行口译。There's currently no input from the floor. Uh, we are not able to provide interpretation. There's currently no input. So financial flows, everything has to be connected to address these pain points. So third question to YP. We talked about smart manufacturing. Digitization in banking. You are the uh, co-founder of Iskool Lab. So, for example, me as um, board director, I saw a lot of repetitive processes that could be. Improved and bettered. Could you share with us what kind of tools are available to simplify repetitive processes, and how do you support your clients? Could you share with us some some use cases, like before they implemented RPA, and after? What's the difference? What's the benefit? Would you please share with us? I know AI is a big topic today. Um, two to three years ago, we started working on RPA. A few AI, actually chatbot companies, saw that uh, we are one of the few companies doing RPA, so they invited us uh, for a meeting. We thought it's interesting because. RPA looks like it's solving smart manufacturing uh, automation issues. So we, we, we can't figure out what uh, chatbot has to do with us. Um, if you're new to RPA, RPA is actually a, a new buzzword, a new trend that started to get popular these years starting from the end of this year a lot of companies started to um, explore rpa because they find out rpa is a great tool for automation for automize a lot of processes and this company who invited us for a talk is a startup we asked them why they wanted to talk to us and they said um, these new AI technologies um, are really great support for their chatbot that could be installed in line, uh, that could talk to clients and understand clients perfectly. But when they are going to sell their products, they said they hit a snag and they gave us an example. They said, at the beginning, they wanted to, to sell it to the hotels to replace the concierge or to use as a chatbot on the main page of their websites. But when they understand the customer's intention, what they want to do, there's a whole lot of process to do. For example, when you go to the concierge, let's picture it. We are at a hotel. You tell the concierge what you want. What would they do? They would turn, they would open the, the system and key in the data, your request, whether you want to check in, check out, or maybe they need to open a few systems to do this. And they realize, if they want to help hotel customers to do it, if they don't have RPAs, they need to figure out how the data, different data systems are linked together and they don't want to do it, it's too much trouble. And they realize RPA is a great tool. They said RPA is, um, 
last mile to implementing, to operationalizing AI. And in recent years, a lot of companies are doing smart manufacturing, uh, digital transformation. But a company has so many systems, right? And for us software developers, uh, I believe many of you are as well. We are all very self-centric. What do I mean by that? For example, the first step you want to uh, build a software, you need to first have users. When you have a group of users, you open an API, right? That's how you develop software. And you need to wait until uh, your scale reach a certain extent. In using Excel, you use your mouse to click around and then now Excel opens its API. You can get data and that enables other software to link to Excel. This is called process automation with a long history. I believe many of you are familiar with it. Uh, there are some macros to help you build that link. And we also in early days have VPN to link in a certain uh, coverage. And years ago, RPM, RPA technology matured. UiPath is an American company. You can use it to link to any software. It could cater to all kinds of uh, demand. So back to digital transformation. No matter what industry you are in, if you want to get real-time access to data, I believe RPA could be of great help. Our software solutions could support semiconductor giants in Taiwan to help them monitor machineries and um, address issues immediately. And in, it's not only applicable to industry, industrial industries, but also financial industries. In the past, you have to fill in forms. So how do you optimize everything? When it comes to digital transformation, a lot of companies are starting from scratch. Collect data, merge, cleanse data. If you can have a war room, it's already awesome. But you know that digital transformation is actually a loop from the, the order system. You have a lot of data to be keyed in to ERP, migrated to MVS, into a production plan, reference old history data, and then feed in to the production machinery. I believe if you are thinking in a coding perspective, it's a lot of work because there are so many software to link together. You don't even have API. But with RPA, it could play a key role in certain key points to make everything simpler. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, let's kind of speed up this panel. The second round of question is I'd like to start with uh, Vice President Chen. We mentioned about uh, automating processes and sensor capture factories. Um, and collecting all this data, um, all these uh, invaluable processes, uh, I would like uh, VP Chen to share with us data storage and how it relates to data optimization. 
please uh, share with us from Inventech's perspective. Um, okay, so I will answer this from Inventech's approach and my perspectives. So front end sensors, um, after they've been installed, you will have to normalize the data. Inventech Smart Factory um, has achieved a lot. We have a big data center that can then reorganize that data and information. Um, in the because quite honestly, in the tech company, it's very hard to survive without a successful yield rate. Um, I think we're doing quite well in this area, but there are other opportunities as well. Um, if we have a lot of uh, ERP information. Um, integrating that with PLM and production information is uh, one of the biggest questions we have for AI and automation. I think in this area, I would say that RPA is one of the tools that we use, but another major issue that we faced is uh, how you define data specification. I think this will be less of an issue for banks. I'm not trying to say that it's more difficult for us, but we have uh, some legacy issues and also different uh, fin uh, business aspects that leads to um, difficulty in defining metadata. For example, if I have two business units, how do we compare uh, their gross profit as well as their ex as well as their shipping? This is comparing apples and oranges because maybe this one of the BO is uh, making a server, one the other one is making a module. And let's say they're at different levels. Uh, for the server, does the cards, the graphic cards inside of it also uh, part of the product? That's something we have to define during our metadata. We also have another challenge, which is um, how do we achieve an outcome quickly? I think it's been very difficult. Uh, we've actually been very fast. We've built up a war room in the past few months already. Um, now from the bottom up, we need to develop technology, uh, especially technology data governance. How do we standardize the process so that when uh, we have information coming in, uh, we make sure that there's no repetitive names. I think we've already achieved a lot in this area as well. Lastly, I'd like to mention that in the end, uh, we have to mine the value in the data and make decisions as well. Decision making requires a database that, but what do we put in the database other than data? We have to take a look at our inventory and see what information it provides. I think based on um, Inventex capacity or volume, I think this is very difficult to achieve. But after implementing AI for a while, uh, we realized that this is what takes most of our time. And so we've devoted more and more efforts into this area as well. <clears throat> so let me summarize. Um, Vice President Chen mentioned that um, Optimization and digital transformation. Uh, one of the fundamentals of uh, that is keeping aligned, uh, staying aligned, the data governance, data um, integrity, data ar architecture. If all the, the factories in the world have different uh, attributes, attributes, data parameters. How do we clean that data? How do we compare them? It is nearly impossible. So uh, Vice President Chen also uh, mentioned four important uh, data governance architecture, which essentially is that we must remain aligned and the data integrity has to be ensured. We don't have much time left. I'd just like to uh, throw a question at Tony regarding uh, Fubang Bank. What has the bank's uh, biggest challenges is in implementing AI technology and how you've overcome them? Uh, what do you think is a successful formula for implementing AI technologies at the bank as well? Please. Right. I'd just like to give an example from our call center. We have a limited number of seats at our call center. 
uh, but we have a lot of products and so we have a lot of like, callers. We have a lot of uh, inbound outbound calls, but we have very limited bandwidth for that. So efficiency is important. My last uh, answer was about how to make business happen. Well, this part is going to be about efficiency. Uh, so that's why we're using AI to develop predictive models. That's why we're trying to predict who's going to call, what they're calling for. Maybe they need uh, certain slip forms, or maybe they need other things. We have uh, with this kind of demand will change based on seasonal changes as well. Now, uh, this was actually pretty successful compared to before we've been able to achieve 70, uh, seven or eight times more accuracy, accuracy than before. This kind of uh, relieved the burden on our bandwidth. We were able to limit incoming calls. The challenge rises in when there is that expectation. We know that we always have to be adjusting. We know that there has to be a standard. But our uh, users, our business owners, would like to double and triple that accuracy. But that expectation um, is one of the biggest challenges. I understand you have to drive businesses, but my technology, my AI, if you want volume, I, I lose out on accuracy. And so they force me to try and promote volume or prioritize volume, but then the accuracy suffers and vice versa. So I think... Uh, when it's human to human, people to uh, machine to human and machine to machine, I think we need to find a balance there. That would be probably the best practice. Now, I'd just like to ask Tony again, um, would uh, Fubang Bank uh, face problems with uh, the people? Uh, absolutely, especially older employees. Are they able to accept new technologies? Uh, well, we, Regardless of their age, we've been getting along well with everybody, but I think it's a more a structural change because uh, just by fixing maybe the entry level employees, it doesn't really change the structure at all. We have to change the point of view. We have to make our stakeholders interested by making this conversation visible on the higher up level. That will give us a better chance. Got it. Um, we only have one minute, one minute left. Unfortunately, I have so many questions, but let me just ask the last question to YP Chang. Based on your experience, uh, these OP IPAs, APIs, are they able to actually help automation? Will there be any uh, issues with the implementation? Finally, is RPA, uh, can AI be applied to RPA? Uh, let me give a brief response. If you use OARPA to industrial manufacturing, uh, you will face problems with uh, maybe machines that are not connected to the internet. I think these will be the barriers that you meet. Everybody wants to add AI to RPA. They use OCR technology, which already uh, can be integrated with AI. So I think in the future, I'm not sure what uh, RPA and AI will be able to be integrated in the future, but I do think there will be more uh, integration in the future as well. Unfortunately, our time is up, so let us applaud our panelists for their wonderful insight. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, President Lee, and thank you, uh, distinguished guests. We've already explored AI from the finance perspective, as well as the manufacturing sector. Now we will be talking about uh, AI deployment challenges for companies. We have our moderator today, which is CL Cao, the CEO of e Infuse AI, who will be here offline with us today. Our three distinguished guests will be online today. Now, our three um, panelists are YData founder and chief data officer, Fabiana Clemente, landing AI vice president of product, Kai Yang, as well as FAS Financial Group's director of engineering, Angus Kong. 
we will be discussing today AI deployment challenges. So I'm Theo, CEO and co-founder of Infused AI, and uh, we we manage the complexity of um, of AI workflow seamlessly, so the AI practitioner teams can collaborate um, to focus on really solving business problem. Today, I'm super excited to uh, host a unique conversation uh, about AI deployment challenges um, here at the Gal Galaxy Summit. So over the past uh, few years, we've seen tremendous growth in data and AI tools, proliferation of so-called uh, modern data stack and the whole ecosystem ML related tools such as data labeling and uh, um, like visualization, feature store, a training workspace, so on and so forth and reverse ETL even, and now as well as vertical uh, specific solutions. However, making models reliably into production um, and keeping it up to date remains quite a challenge and very time consuming, a lot of manual repeated effort. Um, so here today um, we have we have a really unique lineup for uh, the panelists from um, like vertical data tools and horizontal data tools, and also leading experts in uh, companies that actually put AI into use, consumer-facing use. Um, so please allow me to introduce the panelists, um, Kai from Landing AI, and they're building the AI uh, solution for manufacturing. Also Fabiana from Y Data, specialized in data quality and synthetic data. Also Angus from Fast Financial, overseeing the company's data and AI strategy. And uh, he also led various teams before in MarTech, e-commerce, and healthcare. So I'd like to invite uh, each panelist to give a quick background of yourself uh, before we dive into the topic. Over to you, Kai. Hey, uh, thank you, Jialiang. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Kai, uh, Yang Kai. Uh, I'm from Taiwan. Uh, more precisely, actually, I'm from Taipei, Nangang. Not far away from where you guys are. Uh, really happy to be here. I'm currently running the product team in Lending AI. As you know, that Lending was founded by Andrew Yin and has been helping several industrial customers adopting AI uh, since 2018. Uh, I joined Lending in 2019 and started the product team in mid-2020, uh, actually right after the pandemic happens. Uh, so since then, uh, my team, uh, we have been working on uh, developing an end-to-end -end ML ops computer vision platform uh, we call Lending Lens. Today, Lending Lens, our platform has been successfully deployed in, in many uh, manufacturer customers to help their AI team or their quality inspection team uh, to develop, and more importantly, to deploy a visual inspection solution based on deep learning in the production line. Uh, for me, in addition to the product function, I also oversee the business and sales in Asia. Uh, before joining Lending, I actually co-found my own AI startups and focus on biological applications, specifically in cell counting and cell sorting, and has been adopted by one of the largest uh, pharmaceutical companies in the US. Before that, before jumping into AI, I spent 15 years in semiconductors and chip design automation. I actually work very, very closely with many chip design house uh, in, in Xinzhou. Uh, before that, I got my PhD at Santa Barbara and got my degree in Tsinghua. Very, very glad, glad to be here and share what I've learned uh, for the past few years about AI and most importantly about AI de deployment. Thank you. And then it's actually midnight, past midnight for Kai and Fabiana. And so next up, uh, Fabiana. Hi. So I'm Fabiana Clement, uh, Chief Data Officer at Y Data. Uh, we are helping to build a data centric platform that accelerates and increases the ROI of AI solutions by improving the quality of training data sets. Um, personally, I'm actually from Lisbon, so all the way from Portugal, currently based in Seattle. My background is in applied mathematics. Um, and well, since I started working, I, I've been dedicating my um, professional career to data science and also to data solution architectures, both in big enterprises and startups. Right. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, Angus. Hey, hello. Thanks, Theo. Uh, to be honest, I forgot to prepare for self-introduction. So 
could be a bit messy anyway. So I just start from what, what we are doing right now in FFG. So the Fast Financial Group, we are the company trying to provide the all-in-one financial services platform to the end users like uh, SMEs, small to medium enterprises. Yeah. So what we are doing right now, we are focusing on using the uh, leading edge technology like stablecoin to empower the uh, all the financial services we are doing right now and uh, more um, payments. Yeah. So as for myself, um, I think I more like uh, well, people used to look at me like a, like they are scientists. From I'm, I'm always looking at myself more like a, a engineer. So uh, I spent eight years in Google. The first team was Android, working on Android camera. So probably many of you used my, my product before. And then I moved to Google Research. Now I think it's related to Google AI. So uh, my team, we didn't do too many things. We just do a few things. So it's more on the NLP. So the first product our team launched was the Gmail smart reply on um, mobile phone. So it was a very interesting experience because actually we were, at the time we were competing with Google brand team and we were lucky to win the, fast, the first battle. And later we launched that technology into Google Assistant. So when you say, say, okay, Google, sorry, I need to be careful not to activate my phone. Yeah, now it's active. So, yeah, when you say, okay, go and then try to say some random things, then, then we'll kick off our language understanding engine and try to respond with some meaningful sentences. And the final product we pushed out is the universal sentence encoder. So it's actually the underlying technology behind these two products. And we made it publicly accessible on Google Cloud. And then after Google, I joined different companies in different industries like uh, Tokopedia, the unicorn in Indonesia, to lead the data science team. Or I think many people in Taiwan also know about APR. So the ex targeting market company. And uh, previous one is a uh, big data and AI company in healthcare. So it's that, yeah, I jumped between different industries, but I learned a lot. Okay, thank you. Well, so you can see from the panelists, we really have a really, uh, gonna have a really rich uh, discussion. So I think like, um, let's get started. I think the first topic would be like, um, what can you share about, I, I actually prefer a failure story or like horror story for AI in production. Um, so uh, uh, maybe Kai can uh, share some of your experience. Oh, sure, uh, thank you. Uh, actually for me, I have been uh, developing, deploying uh, several AI or machine learning projects in different domains uh, such as healthcare, retail, pharmaceutical, and manufacturing. Uh, some of those projects that I was involved in with were pretty successful, which means they, they were running on the production line and gener gener generating values. But at the same time, some of them, probably actually most of them, uh, many of them just fail horribly. Uh, so also a lot of the problem I was talking about or AI model itself could be different from project to project. But now when I look back, actually I can start seeing those challenges are actually converging. So either uh, when we do visual inspection for manufacturing, computer vision for manufacturing, or offer patient predictions for healthcare providers or develop recommendation engine for retails, one of the most challenging part that uh, for me is to set setting up the right expectation and having a corresponding tool and infrastructure, in this case, ML ops, to support those exclusions. Uh, so what does it mean by, 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 by expectation setting? Um, so for all the application that I have been involved with, it is safe to say that none of those work, none of those model work right at the first place, you know, right out of, out of the lab that we are working on whether these are the computer vision project or recommendation. It is really, really critical to have this common understanding with your boss or with your customers. If, you're, if they, the, no, the boss or the customer is batting a magic or want a home run right out of the box the, from the first model, it usually means that I will have a very, very painful project and this project likely will fail. Uh, for example, give you a very concrete example. Uh, we have a visual expression project Customer gives us 3,000 images 
expecting to get 99.96% recall and less than 1% overkill right at the production line in three months. Like it's just, this is simply just asking for failures. But for me, actually no one that guarantee that data distribution that we got from these 3000 images are similar, even close to the production line data. So we, no, actually we landing have been, been through this scenario for more than one times, and each time failed just horribly. Now we failed to set the expectation with our customers. It turns out our customer is very, very ad, mad at me. And even worse, my machine learning team is getting very, very mad at me. So on the other hand, a similar case, similar situation case where we, set, we sell the right expectation with customer set, we, we, we deploy the first model in the shadow mode where the model make prediction, but do not really make the decisions in the production line. And then we use the right ML ops platform to in the production line, collecting the new data, fine tune, fine -tune the model and use the ML ops to facilitate the performance monitoring. With this engagement, uh, this, uh, this experience setting, it turns out to be a win-win for both my team and my customers. So the most common and challenging part for AI deployment to me, seeing so many projects is expectation setting and having, uh, you know, having us or our customer to invest on MLOS infrastructure to execute those projects is, is kind of the most uh, critical challenge that I've seen for many projects. Well, thank you for sharing. It sounds like more uh, like somewhat less technical, but also requiring the technical infrastructure to enable people to communicate the technical, uh, non-technical part. Yes. Yeah. It is cross function. Um, yeah. So yeah, great. Uh, Fabiana, do you have any? Uh, well, I would prefer failure story to share for uh, putting models into productions. For sure. Unfortunately, I guess the majority of my experience were uh, were around. Um, uh, failures, at least uh, seeing those uh, happen. Um, and I guess from my experience, those always happen for two main reasons. Expectations, which it, it's not that different from what Kai was here uh, sharing with us, but also about the data. Um, I do recall one specific example that I do think that to be one of the most interesting ones. Um, I was working on location data um, and there was this expectation from management that we could build this super developed machine learning model that could just understand the behavior of people based on the location data. Sounds amazing. But when you are dealing with very noisy data, a lot of missing periods, and above all, um, data that um, is does not have the right variability for what you want to build, it's when this assumptions uh, of what you want to build starts to crumble. Uh, in that case, there was this specific assumption that I do recall, which was uh, volume or big volume equals to quality and we equals to, yes, we are able to build this use case, uh, which was not true. So essentially, if I were to build any model out of that data, I would just have a hugely biased kind of understanding of the human behavior. And that, well, if it reached to production would just be a failure. Of course, um, broad, broadly speaking, that model didn't went to production. Happily, I was able to prove my point. But anyways, uh, I guess it's very difficult for um, data science teams, for example, to manage these expectations, how can they just show uh, when the data is not good enough that some work needs to be done? Um, and above all, how can they just, you know, pick up the data they have and make it work or at least start iterating on that data in order to make it work, even if that means some months of um, investment, of course. Right. Uh, thank you. And then, so, yeah, I, I heard a joke about like data scientists spend like 80% of time uh, preparing data and the remaining 20% of the time complaining about preparing data. <laughs> Is that true, Angus? And then can you share like a few uh, failure story from your experience? Yeah, I guess the, the real failures sometimes lies in the process or before launch. So a few things I guess I can share, like um, 
for example, when we were building the Gmail smart reply, it's, it's something interesting. So I actually thought about this many times. So data science or machine learning or AI solutions are very risky. Lots of risks inside. And for example, um, performance, you cannot always control your data is alive, right? So your mother has to also be alive. So from time to time, the data change, the distribution change, then the performance will change. But here I'm talking about one thing that's specifically sensitive, that is biased. Um, it's not very easy to spot because you only have what you have, right? The data you have. And also you have to be creative to spot this bias in the model. So one example is that uh, when we were building the, the Gmail Smart Reply, we also tried to see if it has some bias there. So for example, we put in the Gmail, the, the mail content, no, sorry, not content, actually title. We put in the executive meeting. And then in the content, the model will try to suggest many sentences start with he, but if you put in housekeeping, blah, 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 then it will start with she a lot, right? So this is obvious that kind of bias we don't want, but how somehow it comes from the data. And if you are not familiar with the problem you are dealing with, you actually don't know how to spot this kind of bias, right? And you have to first to, to, to um, be creative enough, then you know how to test to find out these kind of uh, the, the bias. So in the end, we started a small group to attack our model to find out all the possible bias and create like a standard data set to test. So I think I just want to add something here. I think there's some kind of bias and then of course the uh, unpredictable predictions, right? So you always don't know what will come out from the, from the model, especially it's like a learning based model. Right? So yeah, be prepared. Yeah, well, thank you. So yeah, bias, I think that's uh, like a whole different panel worth discussing because I mean, like if the data we're working with is already biased, then there's, well, we need to do extra effort to, to do that, right? And then speaking of, I think we, we talk about like all the practice, the expectation, and also coming back to data, and then data quality, and then also uh, Andrew has been like very uh, vocal about a new, like I mean the industry is converging into like uh, so-called data-centric AI, where uh, we should spend more time like making sure our data has good quality uh, instead of like iterating through different ways of modeling. And then um, I'm just like also like why data and, uh, is, was just also starting the data centric AI community. And then I think that's really great that uh, the convergence is happening. People are looking at this. So, but like there, there are some critiques on that because like of course data is important. It's, it's like um, the source of our model. So I, I, want, I want to like maybe uh, ask for your opinion about like is, is data-centric AI a new thing? Why are we emphasizing it? What does it mean for production? Is it like just like the all important things being re-emphasized? Uh, over to you, Fabiana. Well, uh, I have to say that I guess the concept that data is important for the development of machine learning solutions uh, is not new. So after all, Everyone, every single one of us have at least heard this one time, garbage in, garbage out. So um, that's that's something, it's, uh, it's a common knowledge. But I guess that conceptually, for me, what changes uh, with this new focus um, or, or of the AI lifecycle development, where data is the central object uh, and, and the focus of iteration. That's for me what, what means to be data centric. So instead of focusing so much on the model, which is usually the path uh, to build this model centric kind of strategy, where you do focus on getting your hyperparameter tunings selected, selecting really well your model, um, after just preparing the data once uh, and getting it ready for the models, in a data-centric approach, you kind of assume that your data is the artifact that you want to iterate upon. So all the research um, that is done towards uh, better AI or improvement of the models uh, is held in the search phase 
uh, space of the data information. So you are um, you are working under the assumption that your data can be improved and can be uh, denoised, let's say. So every um, investment is done rather throughout labeling, for example, um, managing or better data management, profiling your data, getting acquaintance with the data that you have available so you can avoid inconsistencies or, for example, even detection of uh, biases so that um, does not translate to the model or you are just slicing, filtering and so on and so forth. So this is for me what it means uh, in terms of doing a data centric development and that's for me what changes so it's the paradigm of development let's say um that's that i would uh, that would be the for me the um, the easiest way to explain what might be data centric nowadays thank you and then i think like the tooling and uh, uh, are actually really shaping into like how we iterate data more efficiently uh, to kind of um, iterate our process for modeling. So uh, what, do you, what do you think, uh, like Kai, for uh, like wh what does it mean for production and, and like specifically like making it into deployment and then how does it like data centric AI change uh, like the paradigm or the tooling required for, for that? Oh, thanks. Uh, still po point out that if you follow Andrew in, that you probably have already heard him talk about this a lot, especially this year in the NIPS conference. Uh, so here's my take on this topic, right? Uh, the high level concept of data central AI is actually reasonably well aware, but the tool and the best practice that support this data centric movement are relatively new. Uh, let me share with uh, you with some uh, perspectives. First, uh, if you are doing computer vision, you might know that you know, there are likely 100,000 of labeling issues in the most famous ImageNet data set, right? This is the most common, most popular computer vision data set that we use to train the models. And among, among those uh, 100,000 mislabels, uh, 2,900 of them are actually in the validation set. Look closely, you will find more than 20% of those images actually contain multiple objects but only label one uh, objects there. This is not a trivial amount. However, even knowing this fact that you know, the most popular data set is not clean, we, uh, both academia and the industry, are still using, are still using learning, uh, ImageNet as the bench benchmarking standard. So this is very interesting, right? We know this is a problem, but we still use it. Another angle to look at this is uh, in practice, in the real world, uh, where I work closely with various AI teams, one of the most common questions that was asked me is that if we, you know, lending AI or in general, Andrew's AI lab uh, in Stanford, you know, have they call the model of the month or the loss function of the month or the optimizer of the month so that they, our customer can adopt them to solve their performance issues. It's very, very common, I got this question, almost on a weekly basis, right? So but after looking into our customer case, it turns out that 99% of the time, the problem is on their data, not on their model, not on their loss function, or not on the optimizer itself. Uh, the, data, the data problem actually could be very simple data quality, such as autofocus images, wrong annotation, inconsistent labeling. For example, one single image contain multiple defects, we can have two different labels, different label totally different bounding boxes. The reality is that uh, people are really paying way more attention on the algorithm or the model itself and ignore how critical the data is. Uh, to support this argument, my team actually about six months ago actually did a quick research. So we look at all the AI papers in the archive for the past five years. And we look at it, we find that only 1% of the paper in the AI community now talk about data. The rest of 99% are talking about model related uh, technologies. Therefore, I think the uh, what we think is the reality is that the AI community does aware, is aware of this you know, data is important, data centric, but it does not have the right tool. It requires a very sophisticated tool 
uh, to systematically surfing all those data issues. Could be a problem, could, uh, could be labeled, could be data quality problem, and then solving those problems accordingly. So actually, this is the direction that we, you know, Learning AI, is focusing on. Well, thank you. I think so. Let me refocus on, um, well, maybe just straight data engineering in, in towards like quality engineering, even if I might call that. Um, so, what do you think, Angus, about like what what is this new trend, or uh, is it like uh, impacting your daily work in like making models into production? Yeah. So. Not sure if you noticed, I think when Fabiana was talking about this, it's not something new. I was laughing because, yeah, it's not new to you, Fabiana, but it's actually new to many people <laughs> in different industries. So, uh, data century AI, just for this topic, I went online to search for this term, try to understand what it means. And it's interesting. I think people now in different industries, we are finally picking up the very important concept the garbage in, garbage out, right? This concept has been there since 1957, but uh, luckily we are all learning about it right now. So I think it means that um, in the real world AI, we are finally having a powerful tool, powerful enough tool. So we don't look at the modeling anymore. Now we look at where we got the garbage. So we try to make sure that the data is useful, it's the right data. So a lot of things we're talking about today is that engineering, data modeling, and uh, this is a very clear sign to me that the AI is the mod I mean, modern machine learning solution is becoming a commodity every day. So which is good. I think it will increase the quality of our life as a human. Yeah. All right. So as the like kind of the foundation models or like the state of our model being become more commoditized and then I mean data is really uh, the key to have the fine tune result do what you want. Um, so I think that I think we have really great lineup today, like uh, everyone from very different perspective. And then I'm just curious if you have questions for for each other. Oh, sure. Can I I can start one uh, to uh, Fibiana. <laughs> so um, I think about synthetic data, right? This is a pretty pretty hot area that uh, that we are facing today. Actually, uh, I think the common question we have is you know, for synthetic data, is it a chicken egg problem? It does mean that if do we need to, does our customer, do we need enough initial data to enable generating re very realistic data, a synthetic data, for example, using game based? Right? How, how do you see that applied to um, those domain, those, those applications which you know, just do not have enough data to start in with? We, we, do, we can see that the data, synthetic data can be applied very successfully in retail where they have initial large data set. But how about those very domain specific applications? Can you, can you share some of the experience you have? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, that's 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 a very interesting question, uh, especially as you mentioned. So um, the chicken and egg problem kind, uh, it's, it's a reality. But uh, let me see if I can scope the question in the, especially in the area I'm, I'm more knowledge, which is structured data. So I'm not talking here about images or text. Um, so I guess synthetic data can be helpful in solving cold start problems when we are considering small ground truth data sets. So using the right techniques, we can augment very small data sets. Of course, we have to take into consideration this is a trade-off, there is a, until a certain extent that you can uh, increase, that's for sure. However, when it comes to scenarios where there is no data at all available, it might get trickier. Let me, let me maybe deconstruct this a bit more. Um, so synthetic data that closely mimics the real data behavior or smart synthetic data, as some might call it, needs definitely, as you mentioned, especially when we are talking here about GANs, uh, a ground truth data set to learn from. For cases where there is a total absence of ground truth, this approach is completely out of scope. So I, I, I wouldn't say it is possible because it isn't. Nevertheless, this is where um, we touch a bit the realm of simulation or rule-based approaches that 
although are not optimal or do not follow uh, totally the reality, as long as you have um, business knowledge, you are able to create useful data sets to start something out of it. Of course, this is, can be useful to accelerate your teams to develop something. Uh, so while you collect, for example, data, you can start right away doing some initiatives and in trying to understand better your population. For example, this was done um, in entities such as CERN and even for COVID-19 research, for example. But also we can be dealing with problems around cold start. There are, for example, related with privacy constraints. So the data exists, it is not accessible. In those cases, the generation or the use of techniques such as GANs can be highly useful exactly to unblock, um, let's say, information without the, the privacy concerns. Um, it has been proven that the synthesization can work way better than traditional non-musician tools in what concerns re-identification. So I guess that's one of the very useful use cases for um, synthetic data to break that cold start problem. But we also can see other usefulnesses such as, you know, uh, when you do have a small data set, you want to augment it because you have it uh, well labeled or at least labeled by uh, experts in your business domain and you just want to augment that, you can just, you know, cut the time and cost um, that it would take to collect more data and to label more data, for example. I, I'm not sure if, you know, uh, this uh, uh, fully answers, but um, there are always, I guess, um, possibilities to deal with uh, the lack of data. Sometimes they might not be um, optimal, some other times um, of, we can my, uh, find an uh, optimal solution. Thank you, it does, it does, thank you. Cool, cool, yeah. Um, so I do have a question for Angus actually. Uh, so you are like the kind of uh, someone in the industry that's actually uh, customer facing. So like, and, and then Kai and Fabiana are from like tooling, tool makers. So what, what is your like consideration when like uh, trying to adopt an AI technology or tool stack uh, from, for example, a more, a more vertical uh, provider or a horizontal to kind of build and assemble your own platform? And what, what is your consideration into as a customer for potential uh, this kind of data stack? Mm, okay. I think when talking about the customer facing product, it's always very important to look at the customer experience. And um, for customer experience, one thing we don't want is to introduce something that will eventually affect the customer experience and that we don't have control over that. So most of the time, I will just try to build in-house technology, but on the fundamental part, like for example, infra or other things, I think we, uh, most of the time we would consider that our non-core, so we are happy to work with external parties for that. Yes. So I think, um, so to me it's more, um, we don't want to build features on top of other solutions. That's, that's my personal preference. And, um, but for empowering my data science team, my engineering team, I'm very happy to introduce external resources. Right. So yeah, it's it's super exciting time because we have like like explosive amount of different tools that supposedly help us uh, be more productive. But it seems like everyone is like overwhelmed with uh, the, the the number of tools that they need to evaluate and so on. So that was um, my my question. And um, so I have another question for uh, Kai actually. So um, like it, realistically for your customer, like how how often does, does it make sense for the new data to come in and then. Uh, do, do you have everything automated for the customer to, to ingest this new data and then made it into the models that they use uh, live? Sure. Oh, this is, is a great question. And the answer is really depends on applications. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so let me share with you specific case that I've been working with before. Uh, for example, for patient prediction, right, for healthcare, to predict, to predict whether a patient will have a certain disease based on his or her medical record, right? These type of problems, actually, um, you will find that have very really relative few uh, new relationship or information between the syndrome, right, the health, in the healthcare record and the disease itself. So it is important, very important to validate the AI model that we build in the real world healthcare data, right, in hospital, in the healthcare provider, but not so much, you know, have very, very frequent data iteration update on this one, because this is not much new information between the disease, right, and the syndrome. So in this case, in this case, we kind of update the data not that frequent, like every month. On the other hand, when, when I was working uh, with product recommendation, right, this is an ever, ever changing world. There are new products introduced every day, a uh, new event happen every week. So therefore the whole thing introduced bring a uh, whole new, new user behaviors every so often, right? In this case, it is so critical to have very, very frequent and rapid data turnaround so the model can update on latest information and can recommend the, the latest product that introduced by our customer or by you know, the, the, uh, the, the vendors. So in, in this experience, this application actually needs almost every other day data turn wrong, you know, or at least every week. So it, re it really, really depends on the, the application. Uh, for manufacturing, right, for visual inspections, right, there's a period of new data introdu introduced period. That's where you need a lot of data to fine tune the model. After that, when the data, the production getting stable, you don't need that many. So it depends on application as well as depends on when the product or the AI got introduced in the line. Hopefully that makes sense. Sure. So um, I think we have a few minutes before we close. So do any of you have a question for other panelists? All right, so I think uh, before we close, I would like to uh, invite each of you uh, to give like a, one piece of advice for uh, people who are uh, maybe trying to put AI into production or suffering from that or uh, just getting started to. Uh, what, what is your one piece of advice, uh, Angus? Yeah, I think uh, something we didn't talk about today, but I just want to mention this. So it's actually a continuous battle to maintain your machine learning solution. So the story does not end and when, uh, when it's launched, it's endless. So it's very important that so before you have a very complete plan to keep the model updated periodically, you will find that the cost to launch a machine learning solution is very high. Okay, thank you. And Kai? Oh, setting up the right expectation with your boss or with your customer is the first critical step. You fail this, the project likely fail. Uh, investing the right amount of software infrastructure like MLOps to supporting the evolution of AI project is also critical. Uh, finally, starting small and improving upon what up, up it um, is another critical uh, suggestion we can offer. Well, thank you. And Fabiana? I didn't agree more with what was said. I would just add um, work in your foundations, either infrastructure, either data, so far very important for the success of your project. So definitely. Well, thank you all very much. And then I think this is a super exciting time. We, we see initiative like data-centric AI and then also Fabiana, uh, Y Data and us Infuse AI, both in the uh, AI Infrastructure Alliance. We're building sure. the canonical AI stack for like modern data science. So like micro alliances, different ways of working, interoperation, this is the golden time for uh, making AI into production. Thank you all very much and thank you for staying up. And uh, thank you, Angus, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. 那我们刚才之前的嘉宾其实也谈到，在组织或者在 so, previous speakers have talked about that people is actually the key piece in pursuing digital transformation and AI automation, and that is a great segue to our last panel. We are going to talk about how we empower people and pursue organizational change. Our moderator is Profit AI CEO, Jerry Huang, 
And our panelists include Mr. Zake Lin, Vice President at AUO Digitech, Mr. Court Liao, Chief Information Officer at Symbio Incorporation, and Mr. Alex Lin, from Vi of Vice President of HyP International. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jerry. I'm a CEO from Profet AI. I'm the moderator. And in the next half an hour, we have people from uh, Semiconductor panel. We have also Alec joining us online to talk about empowering people with AI. So first, I'd like to invite uh, our panelists to say hi to our audience. First, uh, maybe Alex. Hello, everyone. My name is Alex. And then second, uh, Zake Lin, VP from AUO. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here. I'm really looking forward to your discussion. Thank you. Uh, then, Court Liao, Mr. Court Liao, CIO from Symbio Inc. I would not say our company is a champion, but we are really dedicated and really working hard. Hello, everyone. My name is Court Liao. So, empowering people with AI, I think in recent years, this has become a, a big topic in the business landscape. And businesses in Taiwan are also catching up onto this key in introducing AI. Today, we have three panelists rich in experience who are going to share with us how they empower people with AI within their own businesses. First, I'd like to uh, invite Alex to talk about this. But first, I'd like to have Alex to share with us um, that HyP actually plays an important role in the, the global supply chain. So in your view, what do you see are the biggest trends now? Uh, I, I think I could share some uh, experience on business operation. Some of our big factories are in uh, Greater China, for example, Pudong in Shanghai or in Suzhou. I think I've seen changes in how businesses operate, the, the environment. Now we are seeing a gap in talent. Since 1978, in China, uh, we're seeing a lot of changes. Uh, people have changed. This generation is very different than the previous. Young people nowadays uh, don't want to work in uh, tough jobs. And uh, there is a competition for talent in the business. So a lot of people are saying that HR is actually the most important department in a company. How do you recruit people to get people in place in time is very important. And DL, IDL actually uh, maybe account for 40 or 50%. That means the cost half of the cost is labor cost. So if you don't opt for automation, you might run into difficulties. In the past year, we've all seen a shortage in raw materials like resin, and we see a price hike more than 50%. Transportation costs have also gone up. 
the electricity price in Shanghai has grown by 22%. Another 10% is in line this year. And last year, uh, a friend of mine was reporting to uh, his manager a 30-page report. And um, he was pointing out. He was pointing out that there is a mistake in calculating the electric price, getting the the voltage wrong, etc. The the point is, we are seeing a lot of changes, and the DOS has has increased, which adds to the operation challenges. Eco-friendly is another trend. For example, how you treat wastewater and waste. And this year we are seeing new green energy policies to install more solar panels, to use more green energy. And third trend is uh, shortening of MPI. Due to a pandemic, you need to get samples into the states. So, the engineering change will become more. You will have shortened development time. The life cycle has shortened as well. So under these demands, if your first time yield is not up to par, it's difficult to make a profit. And then we are also seeing shifts in factory planning and um, location for example we are we we are going to have a new factory in vietnam and these are all factors affecting business operations and i think there is a, a key which is your uh, infrastructure your tech foundation APS, PLM, all of your basic frameworks have to be in place. And you need to get more data for data analysis to stay competitive. Thank you, Alex. I think the key is really to be fast and faster and faster. That's the, the key with all kinds of um, factors. You need to deliver fast and help customers reach fast decision making. My second question uh, before that, Alex is now the vice president of HiP International. Uh, taking on a bigger role, I believe you will uh, contribute more uh, to HiP International. And uh, an idea is to have 80% of the employees to learn how to use AI. So can we use, can we make AI tools as intuitive and user-friendly as our iPhones. Is it possible? Can you share your strategy? I think the logic has a lot to do with the, the changing environment. A lot of companies are embracing smart factory, uh, industry 4.0, AI, automation. But according to data, companies really achieving smart factory uh, are little, are few, less than maybe 10%. There is a lack in data science, quality data scientists. Even if you find them, are they able to be loyal to you, to understand your uh, environment deeply and be willing to work late? It's really difficult to find such quality talent. And even if you have such talent, how do you cultivate them into a, a multidisciplinary or multi-skilled talent? How do you maximize your impact in a short period of time?
So that's why when it comes to AI, what you want and what you actually achieve can be very different. <laughs> Thirdly, our annual investment in AI is way more than million, $10 million. How do you improve AI? How do you uh, up the ante and um, upgrade your machinery and equipment? So first in hardware, you need to design each workstation and uh, contribute to a coherent, a comprehensive design. You need to be able to reuse to save uh, 50 or 60% of hardware cost. And for software, you need to use AI modeling to identify uh, deficiencies and use algorithms to run inspections. That's the two key demands in our industry. So if we could have an AI tool that is user-friendly, easy to use, and is widely applicable in all industrial cases, that would be the way to go. Thank you, Alex. That's also uh, what we want to achieve, really. Third question. Uh, so Alex mentioned the environment, the big environment, and uh, I think maybe you have lessons learned or any advice to give to the audience. Yes, at Happy, we have an AIA a slogan. It really embodies our spirit and our uh, manufacturing system. So as a top executive, you need to support, buy in AI solutions because it takes time to build data models. You also need to fulfill ROI requests requirements from finance. So having the right tool, the right people, the right partner is key to success. Thank you, Alex. I believe you are self-quarantined at Shanghai. Yes, thank you for joining us. Now I'd like to invite Zeke uh, to share with us now the AUO is like considered the leader in empowering AI people with AI. Now you brought a lot of initiatives to do that. Could you please share some uh, insights? Thank you. I'd like to share a bit of my background. I Prior to this, I was in an ITC manufacturer. Then I joined AOA, AOU and AOU Digitech. I was very impressed because it was fully AI. Everybody was using AI to resolve uh, problems and using AI to implement smart manufacturing um, and gradually progressing towards a smart factory. So I'd like to take this opportunity to share AOU's uh, progress and journey to implementing the smart factory. We know that AUA, uh, AOU is a, a panel display manufacturer. We've already faced a lot of uh, competition from global companies as well. It requires a lot of uh, early on investment for factories and equipment. We realized and recognized that we aren't able to compete uh, with economies, economies of scale, we had to digital transform and automate. If we're able to flexibly manage our product mix for less diversity, but a higher quantity, I think we thought that would be the best approach. So for new factories, how are we able to increase efficiency in old factories or existing factories. 
How do we progress towards a smart factory? That was uh, the that is the biggest objective that we're currently moving forward towards. But this is very challenging because rapid development um, is heavily contingent on AI talent cultivation. And so starting from 2015, AOU has already started uh, the digital transformation project project until 2019 we've been sending employees up to thousands of employees to ai smart academies to learn about api we have uh, 600 people that were senior executives in manufacturing and production and then others that were project engineers that everybody learned and they all learned about ai in addition to talent cultivation we also uh, developed we also founded the a future academy for AOU College. We hired outside experts to train our employees on AI, to allow them to pick up, to allow our employees to quickly pick up on AI technologies. So based on this uh, AI talent cultivation and AI technology development, AOU has been very successful in developing such technologies. Sorry, AUO. We've been able to develop our own AI products as well and develop models. As of now, we've already developed up to 2,000 uh, AI predictive models online that can be applied to different BUs or departments, and they can be quickly replicated and rolled out. This kind of progress is very, very impressive because in the past three years, uh, we've been able to save uh, we've been able to uh, conserve 20% of our direct labor in factories. And we're trying to now achieve the 30% capacity increase uh, as well. In 2020, uh, the models that are already online or that were gradually being moved online had achieved significant uh, efficacy and outcomes. We started having uh, departments that are not manufacturing departments that became very interested. Seeing that AI has a empowered the manufacturing department, they were inspired to use AI to empower their departments as well. They started to have this demand for learning AI. Um, we also collaborated with Profit AI. Uh, the, many people without um, AI algorithm knowledge can also write programs that can optimize pain points or help resolve pain points that they currently have in their workflow. I realize this uh, full AI mode um, has been fully implemented in AUO already. Thank you. I'd like to share that we mentioned AUO is a very important client for us. We learned something very important entering AUO, which is that not everybody in this domain is talking about AI. In the past, it was heavily promoted, but nobody's really actively talking about it right now. I would like to invite you to talk about this transition I think that we can take a look at this from two perspectives. First is the AI development internally at AUO, from talent cultivation to AI technological development. AUO has now progressed to uh, what we consider a mature AI technology era. But we can see still that there's a lot of uh, smart manufacturing KPI that needs to continue to be uh, progressed and advanced. We need to increase our capacity and yield rate. These are real life problems that continue to present themselves as challenges. So how do we let uh, our employees uh, improve this or make changes based on AI technologies is now a KPI for AUO employees already. We also observed that in the past three to five years, based on our experience in these three to five years, we've learned that uh, 
AUO or AUO has learned uh, what we can achieve with AI. We have a good grasp of what we should be doing with AI and what the limitations of AI are. But now the question becomes how we can more rapidly deploy AI technology um, for quicker rollouts. So I think speed and efficiency is something that we care more about right now. And we'd like to use what we refer to as local AI platforms so we can provide users of the scenario um, existing algorithms and existing model and existing models they can simply use this ai tool to resolve um, problems with smart manufacturing so with this approach we've seen that ai has completely immersed and integrated into the daily work lives of all auo employees and ai is already integrated into the dna of auo now i'd like to uh answer the question from outside the outside landscape so aui has achieved a degree of success with ai technologies and we were recognized last year as the world smart factory so we are not limited um, to internal development of smart factories we are aiming also to develop our ai technologies or rather the ai technologies that we've developed and models that we've developed we'd like to uh, offer it to corporate clients as well so that's why last year we developed uh, or re-established AUO Digitech, which is a fully owned subsidiary. We aim to be a digital transformation service provider for global companies. We will provide service uh, automation, AI technology implementation, as well um, as a smart factory solution. For vertical integration, we will also have hardware, software integration solutions for companies as well. That is a very comprehensive uh, service mix. So we are always talking to AUO and discussing uh, about this full a uh, AI mo model. What are the initiatives for these employees though, for these companies? In, in interacting with AUO, we realized that they've had this wonderful idea. In the past, it's been about KPI, but when we collaborate with AUO Digitech, they've developed, uh, they've actually opened this uh, exhibit, this digit, this tech exhibit. Would you be able to share with us uh, what the exhibit is about and how you guys are doing this? Yeah, that's right. Um, in every year, we would organize this Smart Manufacturing Expo, which uh, the purpose is to give our AI-related departments an opportunity to present their uh, R&D results and their project outcome and also as a way to uh, promote exchange among different BUs to make AI more prevalent. Uh, from my observation, I feel that our AI teams are very proud of themselves. They have this sense of achievement. So they are very proud to present the latest AI technologies, models and project outcomes to other people. And I think it's, it's a great event. Uh, in the past, it's held in January. So you see at the end of one year, you'll see a lot of teams are getting busy, uh, getting ready to present their projects. I think it's a, it's a great event and an opportunity for us to mobilize people into learning more about AI and getting acquired, acquainted with AI. And in the past, we would have this event in-house. And this year, we also set up a, an expo area to present it to the public. We invited uh, stakeholders, companies interested in uh, 
digital transformation and smart manufacturing to take a look at our AIoT solutions and digital services. This is uh, the biggest difference uh, this year. And a highlight of this year's expo is that we develop the speeder solution, a smart IoT solution to help factory clients to uh, upgrade their equipment to help them fix, uh, address their data pain points. And then combined with our uh, data platform, we could do data mining, and um, to glean insights from this data. And through this, we AUL Digital also helps more users to adopt AI and really kick off this digital transformation. Yes, it's really a, a culture from within and then uh, to impact the public, the, the greater world. Now I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Liao to talk about uh, Symbio, which is a leader in adhesive tape. And you are also the key enabler in your company for digital transformation. Could you share with us your approach in the past two years? Thank you. When Jerry invited me on, on this panel, I was quite skeptical because I, I am quite different than, than uh, a lot of my peers sitting here. Symbio has a history of 60 or 70 years. We are a tape company. And decades ago, uh, we manufactured the, the first brand of uh, tape the first tape brand in Taiwan. And you know, this uh, the, the threshold to enter this industry is quite, quite low. So we face stiff competition. Traditional industries are always competing and looking for talent. When we are interviewing people and candidates, Companies would want people come from top universities, but for us, our first priority or criteria is to see whether you you live near to our company. Because that might indicate you will stay long with us. So you will see it's very different. And as uh, a traditional industry, a lot of our uh, employees are very senior, uh, almost in retirement age. So a lot of our executives are worried that how do we pass down knowledge and technology? So we are sort of a latecomer to the AI field. Starting from around 2000, we started to use our, we started to phase out our system and just built our new system on the cloud and had an online ERP system. And we thought that if we already have an online ERP system, we could just uh, gradually migrate our data online. And now seeing that AI is uh, trendy, we send people to learn about AI and we started experimenting different AI solutions. Discuss with our internal experts. I also talked to uh, people from the statistics, mathematics departments. After half a year, we found out that it's difficult to operationalize it. It, it can be 60, 70% done, but how do I go further? How do I improve it further? And what do I really want to achieve with AI? With AI? 
the company has limited resources for IT. So we spend a lot of time exploring, experimenting. And finally, last year, we uh, contacted uh, Profet AI. We did some POC and found out that uh, in one week, Profet could produce a model that took us half a year. And I thought maybe we should consult experts. Our IT should do some adjustment. The problem why we can't go further is because of our tech stack. Our tech stack is not good enough. Maybe in terms of the quality of data, the process, our knowledge is quite fragmented. And we need to fill our technology and knowledge gaps if we want to really go all out for AI. And that's why I thought our AI team should really work on that. But we don't have a lot of time. So how do we help the IT team and fulfill our goals in AI? That's why we decided to work on work with Profit AI to support our IT team. So when data goes to feeds into the central office, the IT team could just access the data there, use the tools there, and do any operations they want. So this part is where we enter the AI story. I remember the when we kicked off Symbio, we had the 40 representatives from Symbio. And at that time, the, the chairperson said something that is in, that impressed me a lot. He said, um, there's no stop for us to pursue innovation in AI. And they said, they pursue OKR instead of KPI now. So I feel like as a traditional, as a company in traditional industry, this is, this is something. And you all already operationalize a few AI models. Could you share with us more? I am quite amazed that you still remember that. The kickoff meeting, um, saw around 30 to 40 top executives from our incorporation. And a lot of uh, our um, managers overseas were also in that meeting. We had to pursue AI because we face pressure from our clients, from within as well. We need to transform and upgrade. That's why we made this decision to change. And as you mentioned, uh, our IT team could, what our IT team could do is limited. So we are very grateful uh, for the support that Profit AI provides us. So now we have seven BUs, five, and for the R&D department, we have quite a few teams working on different projects, focusing on, for example, procurement, production, and quality. These are all key. So we already have some projects in the pipeline. As for our, our status quo, we only started at the end of last year, so everything is quite new. But so far, I'm happy to, to report to you that our R&D team already produced several models that went into the lab for testing. So in terms of R&D, I think we've seen some tangible initial results. 
Speaking of OKR, although we are in the traditional industry, uh, we are embracing new technologies and ideas. Every month in our study group, uh, we are talking about these concepts. And the concept of OKR really helps us zero in on what's important. Empowering people with AI is really beneficial. That's what a lot of employees realize. That's why everyone really wants to be supported by AI, but we have only limited resources, right? So we need to prioritize and OKR is the indicator that helps us do it. After prioritization, we also use OKR to track if we achieve key results. So in less than half a year, that's what we've learned. But of course, giving data to user is not the end of story, right? Throughout the past half year, we've discovered it's key to know how the front end collects data. As I mentioned, we have some fundamentals that are not yet built or covered. So we need to communicate to the front line how we how data should be collected, how their working processes should be adjusted to facilitate the data collection and to enable a better uh, data model. Of course, our IT teams don't have to work on algorithms, but they would have a better idea about how they can work their model and facilitate smoother processes. We help users get better quality of data. And in the process, users uh, have a better set of SOPs, and then we digitize it. So in this positive loop, we gradually build uh, a better model, a more efficient, effective model. Thank you. I think it's very important uh, to hear a client use cases like that. For us, standardization and collecting data in an efficient way is really key. It's also a, an important step. We have a lot of hidden champions in Taiwan. Now, um, I'd like to invite uh, both gentlemen to share share your insights your and your lessons learned um i will feel i'm a little bit shy mentioning this because we're honestly just starting right now um but I do have something to talk about, which is that honestly, our government has definitely invested more attention to high tech companies. But the next uh, layer, the suppliers of high tech industries are in fact uh, traditional industries. So we must think about supporting the transformation of traditional industries because they are unable to keep up right now. And so we are now turning to major MNCs uh, for the, as our suppliers. So if we're unable to uplift our second layer or third layer, that will be a major issue for Taiwan. Now, of course, we're very willing to share um, our experiences, our practices. Our hope and expectation is to form an alliance for transformation of all traditional industries in Taiwan. That's great. So I would take that as a yes then. Thank you so much. So obviously we don't have a lot of time. So I'm very happy that you're able to give us your insights today. Um, we've already talked about, we've heard from Hype. Um, 
as well as AUO, as well as uh, maybe your senior executives, they all value AI implementation and smart factories. They also implement new KPIs, which is very, very important for all these companies. For our new users, uh, they don't really understand how it will help them right now or in the future. It's very important to establish OKR and KPIs, especially with AUO. Their exhibit uh, gives them this channel uh, to talk about what they're doing and amplify the effects of it. And uh, Alex also mentioned that though AI could be challenging, it is also empowering. And then the rapid ROI, we, not, we need to show the manufacturing sectors uh, what these ROI are, and those will be very important as well. Thank you all. Thank you to our panelists, and we'd like to thank everybody here today as well. That concludes our AI press, uh, panel today. We will be now having a blockchain panel. We will re-begin at 4.10. Uh, the next uh, speech will be by Evan Ayung, the president of Animoca. Thank you very much.
好，我们现在啊，不好意思。我们区块链的环节在一分钟就要开始，现在请大家可以陆续回座，谢谢。回到二零二二 Galaxy Summit， 我们现在第三场的峰会正式开始。这一场的主题，我们将围绕在区块链 （Blockchain）。那我们看到，去年全球在区块链的投资是增长了百分之七百，总额达到了两百五十亿美金的历史新高。其中呢，在 NFT 领域的投资更是增长了一百三十倍。那我们看到区块链终于进入到主流市场，大家的话题也终于不再只是，哎，今天 Bitcoin 是涨了还是跌了，而是更关注区块链在我们的基础建设之上，到底会对生活产生什么样实质的改变。因此，这一场的专题演讲，我们就请到了 Animoca Brands 的 Group President Evan O. y a n g Animoca Brands 可以说是在区块链游戏。GameFi 领域的领头羊企业，他们旗下投资了超过一百五十家的 NFT 还有 Metaverse 的公司，可以说是在 Web3 的生态系统当中最活跃也最有影响力的公司之一。今天我们就请到 Evan，Evan Evan 已经在现场了。Hi Evan，Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks yeah, for having me. Yeah, we saw Animoca just closed a new round back in January at five billion valuation, and with Over 150 portfolio companies, you're definitely a power play in Web3 right now. So we look forward to your insight. The floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So I'm going to share my、uh, screen right now. I know I have uh, uh, 20 minutes or so to、uh, share with you some of the、uh, things we have done. But again, you know, I'm assuming that uh, perhaps uh, the, uh, not everyone is familiar with、uh, Web3. So I'll just start there and talk about what is Web3. And,、uh, and and our purpose and what we see in terms of opportunities. So we are uh, uh, in the third iteration of the、uh, of the internet, right? And what 1.0 is、uh, back in the 90s when internet was sort of invented,、um, and it was a static text kind of a web, was read only on information,、uh, where it's pretty much companies.、Uh, Giving you data、uh, on a one-way basis, right? A centralized kind of data,、uh, control server database. What 2.0 happened in about you know 2000s, so middle of 2000s, where you know it's really driven by social media, right?、Uh, the likes of Facebook, and then further、um, uh, driven by、um, mobile commerce, right? Or mobile phones, smartphones like iPhones. When it's、uh, when everybody has access to、uh, the internet via mobile phones, there's a lot more writing going on. So it becomes the reading and writing interactive. Type of a、uh, web at that time, right?、Uh, it then becomes sort of organization, then becomes platform. So the likes of、uh, Facebook, Google,、uh, etc., became platforms that become very dominant in the、uh, internet space, right?、Uh, it becomes a more rather than sort of、uh, infrastructure being sort of like more sort of centralized service, etc., becomes cloud and mobile based, and it's still centralized in terms of control. Uh, in Web 3.0, which is where we're today, we're not talking about reading, writing, and owning. Now, this is the biggest thing that's happening in the third iteration of the internet. It's that it's powered by the blockchain, right? 
And uh, therefore, uh, not only can you read and write, so you can read, you can compose, right? And you can also own the real assets on there because it's actually uh, driven by the blockchain. And therefore, if you can own things, then you can actually draft virtual economies, uh, which then, uh, rather than being platforms being dominant, it becomes networks, right? Or peer groups and communities becomes much more dominant, right? And the block blockchain itself, the decentralized ledger, uh, you know, which is blockchain technology that underlies it, becomes the computer in and of itself, right? So the, uh, the the infrastructure is then sort of right even uh, via of cloud server servers is sort of like you know that's not the thing that's stored right now. It's covered on uh, on nodes, right? And the control becomes decentralized rather than centralized, right? And this is the most powerful thing that is going on right now. And yes, there's a lot of hype. There's a lot of uh, euphoria around cryptocurrencies and NFTs, which is what Web three is. But beyond hype, this is what's real behind it, right? Now we go back to sort of where we are in the, the, the uh, Web 2.0. We are talking about a data value chain that has three, really, you know, about collecting data, mining customer data, uh, which then is made sense out of that data um, and then turned into, turns into uh, uh, useful uh, intelligence, uh, but, but it's sort of collected for free, right? And it then becomes monetized on the right side, which means targeted uh, advertising becomes sold to you, um, uh, the platforms and utilize it and sells it back to you. You don't get rewarded as a user other than sort of publishing rights uh, that you have and likes that you earn as a result of publishing uh, and social interactions. And you get it in return of uh, targeted advertising and goods, and goods and services. Now, this also has led itself to um, uh, social commerce and the sort of creator's economy, like YouTubers, et cetera, are putting videos on or you know, TikTok, et cetera, and you can earn a living out of it, right? But it's still under platform rules, but most of the time you don't really own your data. Now, uh, we have to talk a bit about, you know, what is the most valuable resource in the world right now? Now, in the uh, uh, early, uh, in early uh, parts of the um, uh, 20th century during the Industrial Revolution, certainly oil, right? In this Economist magazine's cover, it's really talking about how data, the, the data giants have replaced the oil companies as the uh, most powerful uh, companies in the world. So data is really what it is uh, today, uh, what oil was in, in the past. Um, and But this data right now is being mined for free, right? Uh, much like how oil was mined for free in the past as well. Um, so what we are heading into uh, is uh, uh, at that point in time, you individuals, uh, are creating data, all of us, from the time we wake up in the morning to the time we put down our phone at night, we're creating data. This information, this data is not useful to us uh, as an individual, but if it's combined uh, into, by let's say Facebook or Google, um, with other um, uh, uh, parties that created other people who create information, uh, data as well, it becomes information, right? And once you link it together, it becomes knowledge. And that is what we call big data. And the Facebook uh, would mine it and sell it to uh, other people. So, so they sell your data for free, and then they don't actually allow you to monetize uh, on the back of that, right? Which is what is creating what we call the data monopolies of today. So uh, you have big platforms fighting with each other, like uh, the Google, the, the Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, and then in this part of the world, Tencent, Alibaba, etc. Right, and they're all fighting for customer data, and they never share data. Right, so you cannot log into Facebook and and therefore uh, you know get access to Google, and you you're going to Google and access Facebook stuff, or going to Google and access Microsoft. It's all separate logins because you know you have all these logins over your phones, your passwords you remember because everybody is in the data silo. Now, this is what Web3 is promising is that it's not going to be like this anymore because we're allowing you to own data. Now, but some would say that, you know, given that we still, a creator's economy is still created. Let's say face, uh, let's say on YouTube, you are actually still allowed to monetize the content that you put on. Now, how does that work though, if you really look at it? So YouTube does say that you own, you retain the ownership rights in your content. But, you know, but we do require to grant certain rights to other users. So it says here that by providing certain content and service, you grant YouTube a worldwide non-exclusive, royalty-free, sub-licensable and transferable license to use the content, right? Including rights to reproduce, you know, uh, distribute, prepare derivative works, et cetera. And you also grant that license to other users. 
which actually says that you own, you retain ownership rights, but you actually don't own them, right? So this is the issue, right? With uh, digital asset ownership right now is that it's not owned. But um, in terms of where, where we are, um, uh, when we talk about the metaverse, for instance, um, we talk about Web3 uh, versus what is the metaverse, which is not the same thing, right? Again, when we talk about uh, Web3, we're talking about third iteration of the internet, right? If we talk about metaverse, it's really about a digital uh, virtual digital space, which allow uh, allows users to do many things. Like it can be AR, VR, et cetera, but it's not powered necessarily by the blockchain, right? So metaverses can be Web2 or Web3. Uh, and but Web3 is really only about blockchain, right? So there's a big difference. And I would like everyone to remember that, you know, people can conf get confused by it a lot because Meta, Facebook changes the name to Meta, gives rise to the metaverse. But what we're now talking about in terms of cryptocurrencies and NFTs is all powered by Web3 and the blockchain. So when we talk about Web, when we talk about the metaverse, it's not really the same thing because the metaverse does not necessarily allow, um, you know, uh, uh, digital asset ownership. Only if it's powered by blockchain, then it is a true metaverse in our sense, right? Now, let's talk about sort of what is the, the uh, uh, traditional transactions that take place in under tra uh, traditional financial system. You need, when you send money, you need to go through a centralized authority and, uh, and, and then uh, it goes into the re receiver's bank. In a decentralized financial system, you process it through your own uh, personal computer. It gets validated by a node and then it sits on all the decentralized ledger. And then because this transaction is then sitting on everybody's computer, it becomes unhackable, right? So the questions more or not a centralized authority is needed in the first place, because you know, do we really trust financial institutions? Some people believe that, you know, especially millennials, they do not. And what happens with a blockchain is that um, when a transaction is requested, a block is, cre is created, a block is sent to every node of the network, and the proof is then sits on every single part of a computer. Therefore, it's secure, immutable, it's distributed, timestamp, it's auditable, meaning every single transaction that has ever taken place under that blockchain is auditable, traced back, and it's anonymous, right? So this is a very, very powerful technology, right? So whereas in Web 1.0 and 2.0, data is copied, uh, now you're actually talking about blockchain where ownership is actually transferred, and therefore you're going to what we call the internet of value. Rather than sort of information driven, we're now values driven because uh, you can now say that the sword that you bought, the, the car that you bought in the, in the game can be transferable and it can be traded because of the blockchain. Now, so, you know, just a, a, sch a schematic about sort of Web 1.0 is just user name and password. Web 2.0, you're signing up through a platform, you see that all the time. Web 3 is decentralized and permissionless. All you would do is connect your wallet and you don't have to sign anything else up, right? And that's the promise of Web3. And, uh, and when we talk about true uh, digital ownership, it really means composability of assets, right? Uh, and in that sense, if you were to buy a virtual car, uh, you would be able to you know, change the color of that, uh, of that car, change the wheels, you know, uh, change seats, et cetera. And you can put it on platforms without any permission, like NFT Gateway, uh, you know, Maker's Place, uh, OpenSea, Wax, all that, you know, you can actually uh, sell your digital goods uh, within that platform to, um, uh, when you compose that, you may create more value from a permissionless basis, buy or sell. Right now, you cannot do that. Now, another thing that is happening today with respect to traditional games that we look at, um, if you have an asset in, let's say, a certain game, like game A, like a sword, you obviously cannot take that sword out and put it on a game B, right? Because a game right now or a certain metaverse is not interoperable with the next one because it's not made that way. It's a closed loop system. Even if you're bored of a game or a game shuts down and that's it, right? It, you, your assets are gone with it. So you don't actually own the assets, right? Uh, you actually just rent it in a lot of ways. Now in the centralized network, however, especially given what any mocha is doing, uh, we are facilitating ownership of assets, meaning that the asset that you own uh, could be taken across different games and have utility. And you can buy, sell without any of our permission and therefore it's truly yours because every, uh, uh, every asset is uh, written into the decentralized ledger, is proven, is secure, is immutable, and therefore it's yours to trade. 
um, and, and, and that enables uh, what we have in terms of internet of value today. Now, um, uh, I'll skip that for a moment. And let me just talk about Animoca brand for, for a second. So uh, we are a very fast growing company. Uh, we, uh, since about 2017 or so, we have uh, uh, turned ourselves into the digital ownership space and now one of the fastest growing companies. Uh, we began and sort of uh, we began as a uh, sort of a mobile app sort of um, uh, app store type company that built games. Uh, in 2018 or so, right, we start distributing Crypto Kitties, and then we discovered that digital asset ownership is really people really go after it because we're selling these digital cats for the expensive ones. We're going for over a hundred thousand dollars. So. Thereafter, we believe that this is a next big thing and we acquired Sandbox. We made a lot of investments in different things. We built uh, F1 down a time and sort of other games. And we made stuff to make a lot of deals up to 2021. And then throughout 2021 or so, we start to keep, we keep making investments uh, and building our own uh, metaverses and games uh, up to about 180 or so uh, investments we've made over, uh, over the past couple of years with most of them actually uh, made over the past year alone. And uh, we have, uh, as per the introduction, uh, we just raised uh, $359 million at uh, uh, pre-money valuation of $5.8 billion. Um, uh, sorry, post-money valuation of $5.8 billion. So we're going, uh, growing very fast because the space is growing very fast. And in spite of that, we'll say that the market is still very nascent today. Uh, we are a headquarter, we're a company that's headquartered in Hong Kong. But uh, we are we are a global company, and we actually operate in multi headquarter, right? So we have, uh, you know, we have assets all over the, all over the globe, and we operate globally. And this is how the space is. And there's no reason to believe that we're only in in Asia. There's a, we have uh, users, and we have teams uh, everywhere in the world. And these are some of our business units: to casual gaming like gamey and collectibles like Quid, to games like uh, Rav and the Sandbox is very famous metaverse that we have. Uh, Blowfish and Way are sort of the um, uh, the triple A games that we have. Um, so these are the majority assets that we have. Um, and in terms of what we do, we we do operations, right? Which is what we just talked about on all the, um, the assets around me. We you know, and also on top of my screen about uh, all the uh, majority assets that we have. And we also invest, right? And the way we invest is that we actually uh, along uh, we invest uh, along the entire ecosystem. Which include gaming, you know, uh, metaverse, guilds, marketplaces, DeFi, uh, infrastructure, wallets, etc. What we want to do is to innovate along that space and to spur on the development of what Web3 industry, which is what we do. And what we do with the companies is that we would try to innovate by inserting what we call the blockchain brain into the know-how of this ecosystem so that the ecosystem can grow. So we are very unique in the sense that we operate, we both operate and we also invest at the same time. So we use our capital to influence the, um, the, uh, the space to grow as part of our mission. And uh, just to, um, again, illustrate the point of all these companies going into the metaverse and how this is uh, all being talked about. Uh, Meta, obviously Facebook changed its name. Um, Microsoft is going into it. Uh, Roblox itself is a metaverse uh, um, uh, uh, and the Fortnite is a metaverse. But we just have to understand one thing, right? In terms of platform, is Facebook's platform, ownership is Facebook's, composability within Facebook's rules, interoperability, unlikely. You cannot take a meta asset or a Facebook asset and put it into Microsoft, for example. Tradability, maybe, but it's very, again, hard to imagine that there's a platform that sits outside of meta that will allow, allow you to monetize. So we don't believe this type of metaverse is really what we call, you know, this is certainly not Web3. Uh, Facebook has uh, obviously announced its willingness to maybe build open. We believe that ultimately what it is today is that we will we will see a built open uh, based on a Web3 type of ecosystem that's emerging and will force these data giants to build open as well, which is the power of what we see uh, in, the, uh, in the Web3 space. So we also uh, have uh, uh, a purpose in what we do. Um, uh, we believe that ultimately we are a commercial entity, but we uh, do not focus only on shareholder value, uh, creation of that shareholder value. It is important, but uh, our purpose uh, is even more important because 
what we want to do is build an, an open web 3.0 ecosystem, not as something that is close, not as something that is, again, dominated by data giants. We're not, we don't seek to dominate the space. We seek to facilitate the space. That's why we will invest into games or assets that might seem to be com in competition to us, but we rather see everybody uh, growing. Uh, and we want to positively reward how our next generation will live and work around the metaverse. We want to reward creativity and time uh, spent by meaningful jobs living and working in the metaverse because we have, let's say in Sandbox, uh, you can build houses, you can compose games, and you can get meaningful jobs within that, right? There's also play to earn, right? Which is that if you spend time in it, you're rewarded um, and, you, and the currencies that you earn because you're contributing to community, you will also be able to monetize, turn that into fiat, et cetera, so that you could actually um, make a living out of it, right? And uh, uh, even more importantly, we want to deliver shared value, right? So we're elevating not only shared value in the traditional sense, but also community and social value. And this point is very important because you see a lot of crypto projects right now or NFT projects that is really around, you know, maybe celebrities, maybe around sort of like quick, make, making quick money, right? But that's not how it has, that's, how, that's not how we should be, right? It really should be around how do we, create great community so that they interact with one another and we just take a part of the community in which we create, right? And of course, we want to do the above in a sustainable manner. Now, um, I would say that uh, the impact of what we've created has gone sort of global, right? This is even back in the days and uh, well, we're still in it, right? In terms of COVID, but um, uh, uh, back in the times we were tracking this, uh, in, in the Philippines and, and also in Indonesia and other emerging markets right now, uh, the play to earn space has gone to the point where people are earning real wages, right? So in the Philippines, because people are playing this, were playing this game, uh, Axie Infinity, they're still playing it in droves. Uh, there are more crypto wallets in the Philippines than there are credit cards right now. And uh, people can play games and earn money at the same time. And they're able to replace their jobs in, 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 in a way that, you know, uh, during COVID, maybe uh, being Uber driver or being, um, uh, you know, um, uh, doing other things that are physical uh, are no longer available. So they actually went to play games and earn money, right? This is amazing in the way they, they look at this, right? So it's already transforming the space. So again, you know, I'll wrap up with this. Uh, the virtual goods market uh, has grown very, very significantly, right? So uh, it's already, you know, well over a hundred billion uh, and uh, it's, uh, you can say that 2021 has been the year of the NFT and, uh, and perhaps crypto a little bit, right? It's still very, very early at the beginning, right? Again, if we focus a lot more, less on the FOMO about the fear of missing out, but focus on what's real and what's being created, um, it's certainly a very, very exciting market. And I urge all of you uh, to um, look into the space and uh, perhaps participate in it. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. 好，刚刚 Evan 有讲到一个核心的概念哦，就是我们现在所处的 Web2 的时代，大家都是可以透过社交媒体去做创作，还有分享。不过呢，这之中产生的数据还是由这些中心化的企业来控制。但是在 Web3 的时代，我们可以有一个去中心化的身份，在不同的平台间穿梭，可以创作、分享，还可以从中获利。这刚刚讲的一个核心概念。那 Web2 的这个世界要怎么跟？呃，实体世界要怎么跟未来的 Web3 还有 Metaverse 的世界接轨呢？这个就是我们下一个论坛的主题。我们请到的主持人是 TK Chen， Founder and CEO of Meta Boom。啊，然后现场还有两位来宾加入是 Chris Lin， Founder and CEO of Our Zone， 还有 David Zen， Founder and CEO of f l u t e x 然后我们线上还有两位嘉宾，现在已经进来了。哎，右边这位嘉宾是 High Street Travis， Travis Wu。好，然后还有另外一位是 Robert Chen， 是 Founder and CEO of Mad World。好 ，TK。Cool， all right， GN， 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 no response <笑>。Wake me， W A G M I， no， L F G <笑>。Come on， guys， this is a crypto session， right？ It's Web3， NFT， and Metaverse、It's、supposed to be a fun part， right？ How are you guys doing today？ Good。Good. good, awesome, awesome, good to hear that. So this is great. We have four amazing panelists join us talking about Metaverse and NFT, and NFT 
And uh, I'm your host, TK Chen. I'm the founder of CEO of uh, uh, Fancy. Almost forgot my company name, <laughs> Fancy. And so we have two main products. One is Fancy, which is a music NFT issuing platform. We do a lot of creation. We w work with music artists to help them issue their uh, music as NFT. And also we have Metaboom, which is a decentralized music distribution node, a protocol in a way. So every, uh, every NFT holder becomes a music distribution node. So we've been in this place for more than uh, two years now. Uh, so we have a lot of experience and a lot of uh, learning through the way, uh, good and bad. Uh, definitely would love to share with all you guys today. Um, yeah, so yeah. along with me, we have four amazing panelists. I want to give you guys a quick uh, uh, a shout out to those four panelists. Uh, um, on my left hand side, this is Chris from Our Song. And then we got Davey from Lutex and Robert from UMAT, right? And another one that is so weird uh, with, uh, with this weird. Hey guys. Talk kind of half drunk, uh, maybe smoke some weed before they- Completely eat. drunk, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Travis from uh, High Street. Uh, those are four heavyweight uh, guests today. So yeah, without any further ado, I wanna give you guys a very quick uh, one minute self-introduction to talk about who you are and uh, what the company does and why you're here. Should, should I start? Yeah. Okay. Hey, my name is uh, Chris Lin Guanxun. Uh, I'm from Taiwan. And some of you might know me from my another company. Uh, I'm co-founder and CEO of KKBox Group. And our song is actually a spin-off company, uh, um, which I'm also the co-founder and CEO of. So uh, our song is um, sort of a platform to help everybody, including musicians, artists, and everybody, basically you and I, to turn content uh, into NFT and easily uh, trading and and form communities in the app. So this is one of uh, a very am ambitious venture for KK Box Group. So today I'm wearing the R Song CEO hat to participate in this panel. Yeah. Yeah. Huge respect to KK Box. KK Box is considered more like from Web two world, right? Now it's tapping into Web three. It's very different, right? But uh, yeah, you guys did a great job. Thanks. Hello everyone, I'm, my name is David, and I'm co-founder of Lutex, and I only have one company. <laughs> and so actually we founded Lutex uh, back in 2018, and we started to build an NFT solution and NFT marketplace, and now we're a very player-centric game asset marketplace for now. So you can, you can easily search like over 400 games in our platform, and you can find um, a lot of uh, sword game asset, a lot of equipment, a lot of pads on our platform. It's super easy to trade. And so Lutex is um, originally a company name is from Loot Exchange. So we aim for be a lot um, um, to provide a lot of uh, players. Uh, they have their ownership for their digital asset, which is in-game in items. So that's what Lutex do. All right, thanks. Awesome. Robert, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, my name is Robert. Um, I'm actually the co-founder of Madwell. Uh, we're basically a joint venture uh, with Animal Brands. Uh, so it's a lot of other NFT companies, I guess. Um, we really focus on the world of creators um, and perhaps even pop culture um, to a certain level, right? We have a lot of uh, work with a lot of creators from the toys world, from the animate world. And uh, right now, I think for the last two months, we've been working with a lot of uh, skateboarders, snowboarders, who are part of the pop culture universe. Um, so we see that a lot of the artists right now, um, you know, a bit of uh, trying to figure out what is you know, from the web too. So we basically start from provenance and we do all the, you know, backdrop of all the hard work for creating. And then we help them to find the utilities um, as the way, as you know, every step of the way. So we will be able to help them to, uh, you know, travel across different universe uh, and metaverse at this point. So that's really what we do in a nutshell. Sweet. All right. Um, Mr. Uh, Everton. I guess it's me. <laughs> hey, uh, so I'm Travis from High Street. We're a commerce-centered metaverse that digitalizes real products from real brands into our MMORPG game. 
where a sweater can become an armor and a tennis racket might be a weapon. Uh, to date, I think we're the only metaverse listed both on Coinbase and Binance, or one of the only ones at least. Uh, last week, we broke our record for daily trading volume with over 800 million in volume within 24 hour period. Uh, next week, we're actually delivering part of our product in what we call move in day. So high street homeowners are gonna be able to move into their metaverse houses. Uh, so yeah, lots of exciting stuff coming up. So if anyone's interested, we do post devlogs on our Twitter quite frequently so everyone can track uh, and also get involved with our development. Sweet, awesome. So as you can see, Robert and Trev is more like metaverse representative and Chris and uh, Debbie will be like NFT uh, guru, right? And uh, so today, the formality of this panel would be, I, will act, well, I actually have four questions and two for Metaverse and two for NFT separately. And so those two were dedicated to Robert, uh, Metaverse were dedicated to Robert and Travis. And two questions for NFT will be Chris and, and David. Uh, but feel free, it's not a, it's not, you know, feel free to jump in and to chip in your thoughts. I, I think, you know, a healthier uh, dialogue is what we're looking for. All right, cool. So first question. Uh, I'm pretty sure that metaverse is all we're talking about right nowadays, right? Uh, but I think everybody has a very different definition about metaverse, um, especially let alone Mark Zuckerberg, right? <laughs> so uh, first question I'm gonna uh, dedicate to Robert and uh, Travis. What's, what is metaverse in your own opinion? What kind of you know, like checkbox you have for metaverse and how is that different from VR? How is that different from virtual world like Second Life, something like that? How do you how do you explain metaverse? What, what's metaverse in your opinion? Um, um, I'll start first. Yeah. I'll start first, and then Trevor can uh, can definitely yeah. add a lot more. Um, I think I think to us right now, there's uh, you know inside the metaverse, there are two key elements here, right? One is really the content, the other is the participant. Um, you know, it takes two to tangle, right? So having the right content and the and the right experience is everything in the metaverse. And then at the same time, you need to have the interest group and the participant to really interact with these contents or assets, right? So we felt that, you know, uh, in our version of the metaverse, it's how you're going to spend, you know, your 20 minute, your two hour, your 10 hour of life in there, you know, deducting the nine hour sleep that you do every day. And uh, I think, you know, companies like what Trevor does is trying to um, increase your time spent. <laughs> on your uh, non sleep <laughs> well, I, I think that's basically what they do. So I, I'll leave Trevor. You, know, come back <laughs> you make us sound, you make us sound so evil. <laughs> so I don't know. Real talk. I, I think the metaverse is a is a term that's overused. Uh, you know, way too much these days. Everything remotely connected to the internet or having some kind of graphical representation is sort of automatically classified as a metaverse. It kind of dilutes the term, I feel, and creates kind of a communication breakdown like no tomorrow. If you're on a venture side, everybody calls themselves a metaverse and you have to like peel back 10,000 layers before you figure out what exactly to do. And it's kind of annoying. So I don't know, like to me, I, I really don't like the term <laughs> that much. Uh, but I think like, you know, for today's sake, uh, we are probably... Uh, you know, in, in that zone where we have to differentiate between game fire or what is a game versus what is a metaverse. Um, so while well, game, to me at least, is the brainchild of the creator, it's the ultimate form of immersive storytelling, at the end of the day, it's an art. It's a masterpiece of self-expression from the creator's standpoint. While a metaverse, on the other hand, while similar in terms of its technical composition, uh, is built from a collective mind of its users. So it shapes itself as society did and will continue to evolve along with its inhabitants over time. While a game may have an ending, a metaverse is perpetual. So I think that's probably how I would define a metaverse. Um, essentially, it's a creation um, collectively done by its inhabitants. Um, and we're really hoping that the metaverse becomes a little bit more decentralized. So everybody who lives within it can call the shots um, other than kind of what Meta is doing these days or Facebook or whatever you want to call them. So that's kind of why we, we exist, I suppose, uh, in, the, in the crypto world and the decentralized world and the blockchain world. So Travis, what, uh, if not the term metaverse, what term will you mm -hmm. use? I mean, like digital world is fine. Virtual world is fine. Um, for us, we are an MMORPG game. People come and hang out. They choose their own adventure, essentially. They buy things. Um, I think like you want to really nail down exactly what we are in a sentence. We say we're a commerce-centered metaverse. However, you know, really what you're doing is you're playing an MMORPG game, right? It's just that we tie in physical elements with our virtual goods. 
Um, I think other players who are building avatars, just call yourself an avatar company. If you're making a VR game, call yourself a VR game. I don't understand this whole notion of everything is a metaverse. Um, it kind of dilutes the meaning of it. Yeah, interesting. From, from both of your explanation, uh, you know, like, you know, I, I, I probably said the virtual reality and second life, this kind of virtual world also kind of apply to some of, to some extent of your uh, definition of, uh, about metaverse. So mm -hmm. why is it now that this kind of metaverse thing kind of pop out and, and, and attract all the attention and, and you know, uh, one, one word I heard is uh, decentral, uh, decentralized, right? Is, is, that, is that the key element to separate metaverse from other, uh, you know, virtual reality type of stuff? I, mean, I, I, I think you're right. There's, there's a big difference right now. I think with the, with the technology that powered decentralization, what does that mean? It means ownership can happen now. Right. In the older world, you can't own anything. It's obviously very fun, but you can't own it. But now, right now, the technology enable you to own something which is purely yours. Right. And I think the second thing that really happened, you know, that really, really happened before is, uh, you know, crypto, you know, uh, blooming that you can finally have an economy that, uh, you know, being traded by crypto that either do transaction on these assets. So it's combination of, I think, really an economy uh, fueled by real ownership, right? That, that makes life a lot more real. Uh, in fact, that is real, right? So because of this, we are definitely in the next stage. In, in my opinion, I think, you know, the, the forefront of uh, digital currency has a lot more advancement than the platform asset and mechanics. So we're kind of chasing. <laughs> <laughs> how fast the crypto world is going. But uh, again, with folks like Travis and other folks, that is really at the forefront of, you know, um, asset development, program, gaming. Um, I don't think it'll be too far away when everything is it's a part of real life, you know, and, and that's the way that I look at the scenario right now. Yeah, to add on that, I mean, Robert's 100% right. Um, you know, I, I think like a lot of folks are diff building different endpoints um, of it. And I, I do see the centralized version of a metaverse through like, you know, Epic Games or Roblox or, or Facebook um, kind of working in parallel with the crypto side of things. And things kind of lined up in a weird way. Um, I would say like from a crypto standpoint, since we're on a blockchain talk, um, you know, we started out with DeFi, right? Everybody got really rich and you got so much money, you don't know what to do. So there came the rise of NFTs. You know, partially it's because all the people who don't understand math or engineering or STEM or, you know, finance in general get to participate a little bit. But, you know, at the same time, people with a lot of money get to spend it somewhere. Um, you know, a lot of people can't cash out. There's not a lot of liquidity events happening. A lot of, uh, you know, limitations. Uh, people turn to NFTs as a way to exit. And with NFTs, you have a bunch of, digital assets and goods, you need to be able to use it somewhere, display it somewhere or do something with it, right? Uh, so then came the metaverse where it's like, hey, now all your funny little JPEG and toys can be, you know, used to perpetuate your wealth or, you know, you, more speculation comes by, you can make more money uh, or you can just use it uh, with utility and NFTs and things like that. So it's really a transition and an evolution uh, that kind of evolved into one another because of a need-based, um, I guess, you know, requirement. Um, and that's just kind of how the market evolves. But then at the same time, on the other hand, uh, as we got to that stage, um, Facebook needed a way to divert attention from its massive fallout with the media. Uh, they rebranded as meta and then that lit a huge flame. Um, so then the centralized world and the decentralized world kind of met together and then further shield this thing into oblivion. So then now all all of a sudden, it's like what everybody talks about, because if Facebook's going to invest all the money into it, you don't want to get left behind. Um, so I think, you know, that's kind of where um, this transition happened and why today. Um, I would say, like, from the other perspective, like from us, you know, brands are getting into the metaverse, um, probably specifically because um, number one is that PR effect fact that everyone's chasing after but also at the same time uh, shopping has evolved over time right at, very, at the very beginning people go to malls it's about discovery it's about kind of a curated experience uh, it changed human behavior uh, then came you know the internet and then everyone's going on an amazon and they're clicking search they, they type in what they want and it's a one swipe checkout nobody discovers items anymore and shopping no longer is a adventure with the metaverse i think a lot of retail brands can bring that back so without the limitations of building costs while retaining the efficiency of e-commerce, they get to explore a whole new world and deliver the ultimate shopping experience to their customers. So I think there are different reasons why the metaverse thrived today. Um, but yeah, you know, that's kind of my two cents. That's awesome. That's awesome. 
So uh, now we have a basic understanding about uh, what metaverse is, which is like you know still <laughs> very nascent. Like, but still a lot of things left to be defined. Uh, but uh, next question I'm going to dedicate to you know Chris and David. So now we understand we have a little understanding about what a metaverse is. How do we how what what does NFT comes into play in the metaverse? Like like do we bring our NFT avatar PFP our our bow apes into the metaverse? Is that is that how it works? Is that the end game for for NFT combined with metaverse? How how what what's the scenario for NFT combined with the metaverse? Well, I have a very probably strange and very personal point of view on metaverse and NFT, right? So I tend to agree with uh, what Elon Musk said maybe a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, that there's a high chance that we actually, this world that we're living in is actually a virtual world. Matrix. You know? So if that's true, and you know, my pastor also told me the same thing. So the chance is very high that we live in the metaverse right now. And that metaverse we've just talked about is a metaverse within metaverse, right? So the interesting thing is, you know, if you, just several hundred years ago, you know, if I would tell someone that, you know, you can hear my voice a thousand miles away. You know, they would think I'm crazy, right? So in a way, we are living in the metaverse right now. So this, you know, makes sense that we look at NFT as, you know, w with different phases. So in the past two years, there's this huge hype, expensive NFTs as a form of digital art, right? Then now we're entering into maybe phase two, in my definition, that people will start finding, trying to find more utilities for NFT. That's phase two. So you will see NFT as fan token, NFT as vulture, NFT as proof of attendance, NFT as this, this, and that, right? That's the second phase. And that second phase is probably going to pass very fast. Maybe starting next year, we will enter yeah. into a third phase that NFT is merely a file format. My point of view is, I think 17 years back, when I invented the world's first legal music streaming service. The entire world was all about MP3 downloads. And I was the first person saying that, hey, music should have a connected format, right? So it's very interesting that the online game world, right? People no longer buy package games. You know, you would always download something and you're always connected, right? So it's interesting that, you know, I see NFT ultimately becoming, you know, going to the third phase, becoming a connected file format. So that's my point of view. So anyhow, you can utilize this file format and package your creativity and content into things. I mean, we built our song as a platform for all levels of musicians and designers to upload and turn their, you know, audio, video, images, you know, uh, 3D objects onto the platform and start trading with each other, right? And then to our surprise, you know, that single, creator who used that platform was actually, you know, a fried chicken shop. And I, I don't know if you guys have heard of Shi Yuan Yan Su Ji, who turned here his fried chicken menu into a piece of NFT. And then I asked him, I said, you know, do you know what NFT is? I don't really know. This, I thought this is a great way of marketing, you know? So, so I really can't define what NFT is. It's the only thing I can say is I would say NFT ultimately would become a next, uh, a very natural iteration of a new connected file format. That's my personal point of view. No, you have a very good definition about NFT. Can you share with the audience how do you explain NFT to your wife? <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, he was at, I knew was, you were gonna ask this, you know. I tried everything I can to explain what NFT is to my wife. He, she couldn't understand. So I said, you know what? Remember the day that we got married? I know you love me, and then you know I love you. So since there's a proof of love, right? So why don't we exchange a token of love of our wedding rings? That's a non-fungible token of love. That's how I explained to her. She got it instantly. It's non-fungible token of love, right? So it is really not that complicated. It's, it's you know, I don't know why, you know, People like to make a big fuss about Metaverse or Web2 and Web3. I didn't even know my company is a Web2 company until Web3 came out. So guys, <laughs> don't worry too much. Next year, we're all gonna become Web3 companies because someone's gonna say they're a Web4 company. So that automatically makes us a Web3 company, you know? So that's my take, you know? Awesome, awesome.
That's a that that's a great way to save some money on on the wedding, right? <laughs> so you <laughs> cross out the rings. Yeah, I'm sure. Have the wedding in the metaverse even cheaper, yeah. I guess. <laughs> Devi. Yeah, I can agree with uh, Chris Moore on the file format part, and I think NFT stands for a lot of things. That even if we talk to a, a client or customer, what is NFT? Our slide, the first page is always uh, it's a non fungible token and it stands for blah blah blah, depends on who we talk to. So basically, I agree that uh, at the end of the day, it's only a file format that a newer format for a digital asset that, uh, for technical perspective, it's a whole new design that the digital asset is not only stored in a single server, that it makes a lot of um, sense in 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 the in in a way in a, in a new digital asset. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, what is NFT plays a role. Uh, I think in general, I have an idea is that it makes virtual asset real. Uh, if it's becoming more uh, on blockchain, and it's not in a single server, and it's transferable, it's ownable. It makes the virtual asset real. So that's the part that NFT does. That um, it's basically it's a file format, but everybody um, using the same standard, same protocol to put their digital asset into a format, and they could be in-game item, it could be art, it could be collectibles. I think it's pretty, pretty, pretty much it. And I think the ability for NFTs um, will have a huge difference for Web2 and Web3 is that it's a cross-platform ability because it's not stored in one server so people could just trade freely, uh, trade in different marketplaces. So I think that's the most important part. And third, third part is the economic build onto the NFT itself. Like uh, if I imagine I will have a limited land and we let the owners to farm on the land and they will own tokens. So there are a lot of potential that could build, build a lot of economics based on the NFT itself. So I think um, it, I think um, before like the Web3 terms come out, I don't even know my, my company is a Web3 company as well. So I think it's just a term that um, tell the difference, uh, what's the basic idea that we do this, a lot of uh, smart contracts and on chain, it has a lot of um, expensive gas fees, and but we do the fundamental things uh, differently because we care about uh, ownership more. We maybe the uh, user experience not is not there yet, but we're working hard to uh, solve some fundam fundamental issues, and that we don't want to like give up the securities, the ownership to the individuals. So that's my take. Yeah, I think from what I heard so far, uh, there are some terms being brought up pretty often. That is uh, ownable, tradable, something like that, right? Economics, right? You mentioned economics. So I guess my ne next question would be, you know, um, when, when we talk about metaverse, we heard about the uh, story about people buy some land in the metaverse, right? Buy some items in the metaverse and then get rich quickly, right? Thanks to Robert and Travis, right? <laughs> so um, I guess those, this question uh, goes to you guys. Um, what kind of advice that you can give to these kind of newly joined uh, uh, metaverse uh, investors or you know, uh, you know go digger <laughs> that uh, when they try to buy some virtual items on the metaverse, um, what should they take into consideration? Um, I, I'll, I'll start first, right? Uh, my advice for metaverse land, um, buy the cheapest one. <laughs> Uh, I mean, not financial advice. <laughs> all, I, I think all kidding aside, I think, you know, at the end of the day, I think a piece of land, whether it's, you know, the digital or the physical, right? It's about what are you going to do with it? What are you building on it? And what are people using it for, right? It's that easy. I don't care where you are. So, you know, putting the jokes aside, if you bought a, you know, less expensive one, then you probably have more resource to build and think about, you know, what you need to do with that instead of using all the money just to buy and do speculation, right? Uh, well, unless you are purely for branding, you know, I need to be next to, you know, someone, Nike, all right? I, I think that's a different story. But usually for my advice for any brand or anyone creators that have an appetite to buy a piece of land, 
is to find something that you can afford, but put more money and more effort on building it so that um, it just makes sense for people to come back and work with you on, on the value. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Actually, uh, just a follow up question on that, maybe for Travis as well. Um, so we have in the audience, we have a lot of uh, a representative from the big company enterprise or, or IP owners. Um, how do they think about what's the thought process for them to, uh, you know, when, when it comes to like purchase a land and what should they do with that? What, 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 thi what other things they can do with Metaverse? I think we lost your son, Travis. Are you on mute? Or you just open your mouth and not say anything? Sorry, my bad. That's I tricky, didn't... man. That's tricky. <laughs> Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, clear. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. I uh, wanted to mute myself because there was some feedback. Um, yeah, it's a really good question. And I, I totally agree with um, everything said before me by Robert there. Um, things are very speculative right now. And if you're going to buy, buy the cheapest one, obviously. Um, the problem right now is, you know, obviously, the only live metaverse, you know, crypto-wise, it's, it's kind of like Decentraland or, uh, or Sandbox. And they do what we call user-generated content. Um, and right now, in my opinion, at least, when you're doing user-generated content, because the technology isn't quite there yet, uh, you can't exactly expect AAA quality stuff. That's why all the things from big brands that came out look really childish, unrefined, or just very pixelated. Um, and, and just the nature of where technology is today. So um, I think like if we want to kind of look deeper into this, for us, we do what we call professionally generated content, right? So we don't sell land directly to retail investors. Uh, we sell them directly to brands. Um, and when we do so, instead of the brands building you know, spending a lot of resources figuring out how to use these, you know, dumbed down, uh, you know, assets or kind of dumbed down um, game engine tools to build uh, whatever shop they want. Um, what we do is we actually have a team of professional developers. We have what we call the virtual architects. And these are people who are, you know, studios, professional studios who's done professional work before for maybe AAA content. We essentially vet them and they stake our token to become our virtual developers. Uh, and when that happens, they can look at who's bought land, what they want developed, and then take a professional approach to actually build out that piece of land. Um, and essentially it develops into a region within High Street World. And because we're an MMORPG game, our game design team will then onboard that specific region into our world. So it interweaves with the storyline. Um, and that's kind of our approach to things. And it's very, um, contrarian because obviously it's a lot more scalable if you let your users build everything, right? Um, but it's just kind of like, you know, YouTube is a very good user-generated platform. And that's because everybody has a 4K camera that's capable of shooting great videos within their pockets. We don't have that in gaming right now. You can't just expect anyone with no experience to go build a AAA quality game. We're used to great graphics. And all of a sudden, everything we see on, you know, some of these other platforms out there are like, you know, something that resembles a flash game from 20 years ago. So uh, I feel like we have to bridge that gap uh, between kind of like what we can do right now in user generated content with professionally generated curation, um, and then eventually transition there when the tech catches up. Uh, similarly, I think like with other products as well, right? So we, we, we sell what we call digital products, right? Uh, where digital assets that you purchase is tied to a physical product. I think for 99% of the world, NFTs are still ridiculous, you know, and in order to transition between physical ownership to purely digital ownership, I think we have a way, like a long ways to go and we need to bridge it, um, and, you know, with, with, with something. And I think that something is potentially digital, right? A sweater can become an armor in high street world. Yeah. Super cool. You have an in-game item, uh, but you also do get that physical sweater to keep you warm. And I think that to a lot of people is something worth spending money for. So even if the digital asset doesn't make a lot of money, you at least still get that physical product to go with it. Right. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of like our perspective at least. And you know, regarding land, um, you know, building out regions for brands essentially is a is an opportunity to build your own Disneyland. Um, you can have your own attractions. You can tell the story of your brands. Um, you know, you can uh, create and invent new ways that uh, you can communicate with your audiences where you know perhaps e-commerce doesn't satisfy. Right? There's there's a lot of things um, that you can you can throw into it, and we have a lot of in-depth conversation and and curated conversation with brands to specifically uh, bring out the strength of an of a game world. Uh, uh, you know, 
that, that, that the brand can leverage. Um, and then, you know, furthermore, what we do is we then sell homes on these regions to our community. Um, and this is where retail gets to have a little bit of fun. They can come in here and buy a home if they think the future prospects of this particular brand in the metaverse is going to be high. Uh, they can buy a home. Um, and of course, it's fun for them. It's, a, it's, a, it's an in-game object. They can hang out there with their friends. They can watch movies with their friends in their homes. But at the same time, homes are basically passive income because we actually take a percentage or we take a transaction fee on all economic activities that happens all over the different regions. Um, if your brand's region is making money, then if you're a homeowner or a resident of that region, then you also share in on part of that profit. Um, so in a way, you know, I think this is kind of how you excite everybody, the people who are speculative, the people who are, you know, loving the kind of like quick cash, um, the shillers, and at the same time, you still provide a safe curated space for the brands. Um, and, you know, that's just our two cents, but uh, we're hoping that, you know, we can create a little bit of a different dynamics to the existing metaverse out there as we launch, you know, closer to next week. Yeah, it sounds like a different approach and very interesting angle for enterprise or brand to think about mm -hmm. it when they uh, try to tap into the mirrors. All right, so exactly. next question, sorry. Oh, no, no, I'm just saying exactly. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. cool. <laughs> okay, so last question, um, I'm gonna go back to uh, Chris and David. Uh, so this is a huge uh, obvious trend that you know people are talking about NFT, uh, bring your NFT into the metaverse, right? And we talked about that a little bit. Um, so, but there are just so many metaverse partners that to choose from. So as a pr NFT project owners or NFT uh, facilitators, how do you choose which metaverse partners to work with? Well, I think uh, coming back to the web one analogy, it, I mean, it doesn't matter what telecom carrier you use. You use Chonghua Telecom or Taiwan Mobile. Ultimately, you, you end up on internet, you know. So I would say just pick, you know, roll your dice and just pick whatever. And then there pick the cheapest it, one. Huh? <laughs> pick, pick the cheapest one. Sure. And then, but <laughs> there, there is something that I want to share based on my limited experience of, of running a marketplace, an NFT marketplace. And... It's interesting that our marketplace is entirely user-generated content. We don't run any curation, so we're sort of like, very much like YouTube or SoundCloud, where people can turn their content into NFT, right? So what we have, uh, have observed, so there's something that I could share. Um, there are three types of users, you know, and some of them end up to be more successful, some of them don't, right? So there are three different mindsets of users that we're seeing. Mindset number one is, Oh, other people are doing it, so I have to do it too. So the followers. Yeah. So so this type of user, they don't think too much. It's just basically a checkbox that they need to check off. Let me just, you know, turn my drawing into NFT and price it whatever and throw it onto the market, right? That's type one, right? And there are type two creators who are what I call uh, the most successful users on our platform is they, their mindset is short-term generous, long-term greedy. Okay, short-term generous meaning that they are minting NFTs, they would gift it to users, or they would price it very, very low to get follower base. So they have a fan base, a collector base, then what they will subsequently uh, make more NFT drops, you know, smaller volume, uh, larger volume. Their mindsets on a long-term basis so we've seen college instructors, art instructors, college students who turn their you know, term project and works on our platform, and they've, made, they've been making you know, several thousand US dollars monthly on our platform as a very, very steady stream of income, you know, of turning their everyday work into NFT. So average price for these NFTs are maybe a buck to three dollars US, right? And the last one are the reverse. They're the greedy, short-term greedy, you know, no long-term, you know. So I would say the, there are some people who are like this, who are very, also very successful, you know. Mainly people who are capable of doing this are the celebrities, the big influencers. They're able to do this. So um, they don't need to think too long-term. They're able to generate a lot of uh, cash flows based on this. So that's my take. Yeah, uh, my opinion is that um, it will be very similar to why do you choose Facebook? When you choose fa Facebook, a lot of brands are already on it, and it has a network effect that if you don't register a fa Facebook account, you're left alone. So I think uh, in the end of the day, the metaverse will be uh, have a different purpose, and depends on what do you do on the metaverse. 
So uh, for example, if you, uh, the behavior uh, of the, your daily life will might have a metaverse version of that. So that's uh, like uh, we collaborate with National Museum P Palace with a, with, a, uh, with a few NFT published. So before that, people go to the museum and browse the uh, uh, famous artwork and then go to a souvenir shop to buy something back. And now they just go to the metaverse and shop around and buy NFT back. So I think it depends on uh, what you do in your daily life and you will have a version of metaverse. So I think start to think in, in uh, IP companies or people uh, or some uh, big companies what they do. I think it's the most uh, the way that it will happen in the metaverses, yes. Yeah, sounds like uh, we're going to go uh, from decentralized to centralized <laughs> before. Just kidding, no, just kidding. But uh, I think that would be a very interesting uh, way to look at into the future. Like, you know, every metaverse has a different approach and uh, uh, and people go to different metaverse for different purpose. Uh, cool, uh, just one minute left. I want to end this session with uh, a little fun game called Quiz Game, Kwai Wen Kwai Da. All right, I love to do this to panelists because I'm not the one who have to answer that. Uh, so each panelist, you have two seconds, only two seconds to think about answer. I will give you two options, A and B, and then you have to choose one. There's no right or wrong answer, just go with your um, flow, like, you know, just don't, no need to overthink in anything, all right? Um, so that everyone can know a little bit better about who you are. <laughs> all right, the first question, no, no thinking, okay? Only two seconds. Um, Ethereum or Bitcoin? Bitcoin. Ethereum. What's that? Ethereum. Ethereum. Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Robert, Travis? Ethereum. Ethereum. All right, Bitcoin speculators. <laughs> <laughs> NFT or JPEG? NFT. NFT. Uh, yeah. NFTs, of course. <laughs> come on, come on, no, no answer. <laughs> NFT. Yeah. All right, uh, Zhou Jielun or Yu Wenle? Zhou Jielun. Yu Wenle. Zhou Jielun. Robert? Zhou Jielun. <laughs> <laughs> So, so we, we have three votes for Zhou Jielun? Oh, cool. Uh, meta or Metaverse? Metaverse. Metaverse. <laughs> metaverse. Yeah, metaverse. Easy, one, easy one, easy one. Metaverse. GameFi or DeFi? DeFi. GameFi. Probably GameFi. GameFi. All right, GameFi. Woohoo, GameFi win this round. Utility token or security token? Utility. Utility. No thank you. Utility. Utility. All right. Wow, utility wins. Um, well established IP or community driven IP? Community driven IP. Community driven IP. Probably well established IP. Robert. Wait, community for me. Wow, community driven IP wins. So uh so for the enterprise audience today, sorry, you lost again. You you, you, you don't have any position in Web3. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. It's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, I want to thank you so much for four amazing panelists and thank you everyone for joining us for the session. I hope you learned something. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Okay, guys. great. Thank you, guys. Okay, so after Metaverse, we're going to shift our focus towards Taiwan. Metaverse,我们要把焦点转到台湾 So next panel, we're going to talk about Taiwan's role and opportunities in the global uh, blockchain community So our moderator is Akio Tanaka He's co-founder of Headline VC and then we also have Evan Spitman, CEO of YGG Southeast Asia. Also, Corden O, CEO of Crypto Go. And Chris Wong, founder and CEO of Thundercore. We also have Arthur Kwan. He is a founder and managing partner of Evernew Capital. Oh, you changed your shirt. He is joining us from LA. Hi, Arthur. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, we know you just you were just named one of the most influential figures in Taiwan's blockchain industry. So pleasure to have you here. It's great to okay, be Akio. here, guys. Okay, Akio, uh, the floor is yours. Not well. Oh, okay, so now. 
Hi, this is Akio Tanaka from Headline, and as well as an, our crypto, uh, token only fund called uh, IVC Infinity Ventures Crypto. Uh, nice to have everyone sticking around till the last session of the day. And um, just before we start, I just wanted to do a quick check on who's actually here. And uh, uh, so those people who think you got, if you identify yourself as investors, please raise hands. I'm included, okay. And uh, if you're a crypto investor, please keep, keep, <laughs> keep holding your hands. Okay, you and I are two minorities here, along with <laughs> Arthur. So we have three crypto investors in the audience. And then I'm just trying to figure out who the rest of the audience are. are. So are you like Chris, who just said, he just recently found out he's been running a Web2 business without knowing he was running a Web2 business. Who do you identify as a Web2 people? All right, thank you. And then who, then who represents like Taiwan's not uh, internet sector, but more technology or more traditional industry sector? Who's here representing traditional values of Taiwan? Okay, and then the rest of you, I'm not sure why you're here, but still <laughs> welcome. <laughs> and uh, then let us introduce our uh, last session, really, we are talking about blockchain and Taiwan. And is there any opportunity for us? And it's actually very interesting because this is a panel that's partly people who have Taiwan roots, but then partly people like Evan and me who come from elsewhere. And we found, hey, Taiwan is actually a good place to do blockchain business. So we like to give it, dig into this theme, but uh, first let me actually introduce our audience members. Uh, not audience, our uh, panelist members, and maybe starting with Evan, you want to do a quick intro? Sure. So my name's Evan. I'm the co-founder and CEO of YGGC, which is a gaming guild. So essentially what we do is buy NFT assets and then rent them out to players, and they make money, and then we take a small portion of them. I've been in the gaming industry for about 15 years, 20 years in Asia. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Evan. Then maybe we'll go to uh, uh, CryptGo. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, I'm, I'm Coden, the founder and CEO of CryptoGo. CryptoGo is a crypto asset management platform. Uh, so uh, we help, the crypto asset management platform helps uh, to, to build a trusted layer between sell side and buy side. So for example, for, for, the, for the buy side, you can download our wallet from Google Play and App Store and you, you, you will have the multi-chain wallet um, just by connecting uh, with your phone number. So we, we now support uh, six protocol and more than 20,000 token and N NFTs. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, Gordon. Then next up is Chris from Thundercore. Yeah, my name is Chris Wang. I'm CEO of Thundercore. And we are building a fast public uh, EVN compatible blockchain with low gas fee, you could think of us building Ethereum 2.0, but it's already available now for everyone to use. And we already have a lot of users on our blockchain. Our blockchain has about as many users as Solana. And we're also, besides the standard Web3 features, we also are building an API for the Web2 company. So like, you could actually uh, issue an FT or launch your token without any blockchain engineers. And uh, Chris from Outsong is actually using your, your chain. Yeah. I'm very happy that our song actually issue most of the NFT on our public blockchain. Great. And then last but not least, Arthur from Avenue. Hey everyone, it's Arthur. Avenue Capital is a venture capital fund focused on uh, Web3, DeFi, NFT platforms. Uh, it was originally spun out of our family office, Perseverance Capital, which does fund of fund investments in the crypto space. Uh, but Avenue is specifically focused on token investments. Thank you, Arthur. And uh, actually, full disclosure: <laughs> many of this panel on this pod, uh, on this panel are either uh, portfolio or investors. So you're talking to a group of very incestuous people. But hopefully, because of that, we can be all frank and give you what we really think, not just the uh, uh, you know politically correct talk here. So uh, one of the uh, uh, topic here we are talking about is. Is there a blockchain opportunity in Taiwan? And uh, we had a pre-discussion in Telegram group, uh, just like you know any correct 
crypto people, and uh, we actually had some different opinions. And uh, th I think I think Corden, you offered uh, interesting uh, opinion that you know we have opportunities, but talent is an issue. Maybe you could talk about that because some people in this panel, uh, namely Chris and I, totally disagree with you. But I want to hear your <laughs> perspective first. Okay, uh, in my pers perspective, uh, I graduated from uh, National Taiwan University uh, studying uh, computer science uh, in uh, 2011. So uh, my perspective is everyone say um, uh, Taiwan has many talent and, and uh, everyone likes Taiwan's talent pool. Yeah, uh, there, there are many um, engineers um, produce uh, every year. But um, uh, from Taiwan University, uh, Tsinghua University, and Zhao Tong University, they produce up to 2,000 engineers each year. And half of them um, not, not go to um, uh, sof software company. They, they go it's to a certain company yeah, in Xinjiang area. Yeah, <laughs> yes. And uh, even the, the, uh, the half of another 50% go abroad. So uh, only less than 25% um, uh, go to the software company. So there are much less than 10% uh, go to the blockchain or web three company. That's my perspective. And, and also, I think the, the, the biggest problem is uh, there are no, no uh, software or web industry in Taiwan. So uh, the talent pool is very swallow compared to the China. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Gordon. Now, then we have someone like Chris, who is actually a Silicon Valley entrepreneur. And actually, I've met his company way back in, I know when he was running Playdom, which was one of the major players in social gaming space. But now, He's in Taiwan, <laughs> and I just wanted to know your perspective about Taiwan's talent pool. I, I think Taiwan has actually really great engineering in Thailand. So uh, as Akio mentioned, I actually built a company in Silicon Valley before. It's called Playdom. It was one of the largest social gaming company. But at that time when we need to hire engineer, it's actually very expensive. It's actually hard to find good talent in Silicon Valley. And so this time, I actually raised funding in Silicon Valley, but hire the people, the team in Taiwan. And I have found it much, much easier to find good technical talent in Taiwan. Thank you, Chris. And then we have, you know, company like, well, this is our portfolio, so I should be careful how I frame it, but we have YGG Southeast Asia, right? And you think, okay, it should be headquartered in Singapore. But actually, it's the core people here in Taiwan, <laughs> led by Evan. So, why, why are you actually South in <laughs> Asia in Taiwan? Is there, the is, there, is there a merit? <laughs> you are the seed investor, so. Um, we, we make a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, um, we place our co-founders throughout Southeast Asia, but uh, IBC was uh, a seed investor along with YGG. And um, we found that the talent pool here was definitely sufficient to build out our backend uh, necessary to provide our NFTs to our scholars throughout Southeast Asia. So we very much enjoy uh, being here in Taipei. And you yourself arrived in Taiwan how many years ago? Three years, yeah. And you're staying? I'm staying. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your vote of confidence. Now, Arthur, now let's talk about investors. From an investor's point of view, how do you guys view blockchain industry and talents here in Taiwan. Is there a business to be had here? I think, uh, you know, I also take on a position that Taiwan has a lot of great talents, uh, specifically in the developer space. And, you know, the numbers may not be a lot uh, from an absolute standpoint, but I see opportunities in that. And I think across different portfolio companies of ours, um, whenever a portfolio company is looking to hire devs, you know, Taiwan always actually comes to mind uh, versus kind of Eastern European devs, you know, Southeast Asian devs. Um, the consistent feedback that we've gotten is that Taiwanese devs just have, um, you know, more creativity, medium cost, relatively speaking, but they have great integrity and loyalty. And those are things that are very hard to come by uh, across the whole global supply chain of devs, 
right? So I do think that that offers a very unique perspective uh, in the global blockchain opportunity for Taiwan. Thank you, Arthur. So uh, I also want to add some perspective because I'm also uh, just like Arthur investing um, in this space, uh, also including Taiwan and, uh, and I'm not from here. And um, I think what I'm going to say is actually I'm not going to this Japan, but it might sound like it. So if you have any friends in Japan, please don't tell them that I was saying this in this conference. So here's my honest assessment. We see startups in Japan, not just in blockchain, but every, in, in any internet space, but especially in blockchain space. Uh, we have also, you know, pool of engineers, uh, but we have very, very domestically focused group of engineers. They're not very strong in English. And the founders are also not very strong in presenting themselves to the international audience. So many of the crypto projects in Japan today is still very domestically focused. But when I moved in Taiwan and looked at blockchain projects, I found out the fact that we are actually having this conference in English in Taiwan is actually Maybe for you guys it's normal, but this doesn't happen in Japan because if we had a, we had actually blockchain conference in Japan, we do all in Japanese because none of the panelists and startups are fluent in English. Now, does that matter? And the maybe in traditional space, not as much. Like if you're doing food delivery business in Taiwan, maybe you don't need to speak English, but crypto, by very its own design and the current market, the how the market developed is very, very international and global. So if the Taiwanese founders like Corden didn't speak English, he'll have no chance. But I think Taiwan has this very uh, internationally minded uh, uh, founders and blockchain people that actually puts Taiwan on the map, right? I mean, Ethereum Foundation, I think I've heard some rumors of it's trying to put one of the regional uh, you know, uh, headquarters here, and there's other people like ourselves actually finding opportunity here. So actually, there's an actually very, very unique opportunity right now in Taiwan. And there are some other interesting things that happened in the last couple of years, that uh, you're a certain neighbor <laughs> to the north decided whole, this whole crypto thing was illegal. So they kicked out a lot of projects out there. And I've actually seen some of those as investors or uh, even uh, the founders leaning towards you know Taiwan or at least tapping into Taiwan base. So I think uh, so in, in the normal internet space, you know there's no way I think Taiwan can you know be tense and it's pretty pretty tough to beat. But in the crypto space, that's more I think uh, is is still developing and there's no mega players. Uh, maybe on the exchange side, yes, but not on the uh, uh, DeFi and uh, GameFi space from China. So I think there's a great opportunity right now, Taiwan, to take the leadership in, in Asia and go after that market. And we are definitely uh, seeing the signs in the market and started investing in that space. So, so I'm actually very optimistic. But uh, then one of the things actually we w I wanted to talk about in this panel is I think GameFi, is one of the field that uh, has put us on the map as an investor because we backed YGG, but also we found out uh, there is a lot of, I think, opportunities in GameFi in Taiwan uh, to, to build a business from here globally. And, uh, you know, everyone's doing that. And Lutex, which is also our portfolio, which spoke right before this session, and, and they were actually building NFT exchange for GameFi. So there's actually a lot of uh, uh, businesses to be being built here. And uh, I actually want to hear some of our investors and, and uh, panelists, uh, 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 other game-related game panelists' opinion on their, their, uh, their assessment of GameFi opportunity in Taiwan. So of course, I'm gonna start this with ever because you are right in the center of it. Okay. So, um I guess I'll, I'll start by saying uh, I've been in the gaming industry for 15 years, so I've seen this massive change from retail to mobile and social and, and different business models throughout the way, including freemium. Um, and I, I will say that the, 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 there's been a, a tremendous shift in the market to a play-to-earn uh, methodology. It's it's a different way of thinking about games, 
where your time spent on uh, a game should be rewarded in pure cash. And our scholars, our players throughout the region, uh, they're making anywhere between 500 to 750 uh, US dollars just simply by playing games every day. And so from a, a Taiwan perspective or an employer perspective, uh, what, we're, what we're seeing now is large companies coming to us and saying, our, our employees take an hour-long lunch break. They play games. Then they go home and they play games. So why, why not allow them to earn money by doing this? And so we are in places like, uh, we're, we're in discussions now in Myanmar, Indonesia, Philippines, um, all, all across Southeast Asia. They're, these employers are coming to us and saying, we've got 20,000 employees, let's sign them up to your program. And let's double their salaries, essentially. I don't want to worry about a bonus at the end of the year, let's give it to them now. So let's do an, a partnership, and when they're, they're at lunch, they're playing games, they're earning money. When they're on, uh, in transit going home, they're earning money. And they're having fun while doing it. And we've found that that model, once you implement it, it's so difficult to break away and go back to a traditional model of playing a game for fun, but then you're also paying money to actually enjoy that game instead of getting paid. And that's only available uh, in Web3 with true ownership. Okay, so I'm gonna ask, first of all, apologize to our friends in Hive. Uh, I think we are supposed to just focus on Taiwan, but I think everyone just opened up a Pandora's box. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and actually, we had an interesting debate right before this session in a, 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 in a speaker's lounge. And I think Chris and Evan, uh, who both of them are actually veterans of the uh, uh, gaming industry, uh, has slightly different perspective on you know whether Web two and Web three games, who's going to win now? Is one going to kill other? And I think Chris has a, a, a more evolutionary I think perspective uh, on this space. Uh, so maybe Chris, uh, you can share uh, with us what you were actually saying earlier in the in the speakers lounge. Sure. Yeah. So my belief is that Web three will now replace Web two. I believe that. Uh, Web2 company will be integrate Web3 features, such as token, NFT, into their application. And this will be the future. And the main reason is that there are advantage from both technology. In the Web2 space, a lot of time, it's just much faster and cheaper. But in the Web3 space, it's, just very, it's a very good way to handle assets, to handle NFT, to handle ownership. So I believe the economic side or the asset side, the NFT stuff, will be in the Web3. A lot of Web2 company will integrate this feature into the application. It's not that Web3 will replace Web2, but that they will coexist. And Everett, you had actually a little bit more <laughs> straight opinion that ultimately Web3 gaming company is going to have Web2 gaming company for lunch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, right now, Web2.0 companies are essentially in a chokehold. Um, the, the VCs are all investing in crypto. Uh, last year, there was $27 billion invested in, in crypto. Largely, most of, those, the, most of that investment went, went to Web3 projects. So the Web2 are no longer getting those funds. So they're essentially getting choked out of the market. And then, essentially, once blockchain, and everything does take time, usually these jumps from 1.0 to 2.0 to 3.0, they typically take about 10 years, right? So. Um, they're essentially 2.0 is being choked out and uh, fr from an investor side and then the developers are un under pressure to implement these ownership properties within their games uh, and tokenize a lot of it. And they don't want to do this because they're so accustomed to owning everything. If you think about traditional video games, it all started in an arcade where someone owned the entire machine, you had to go to the physical arcade, you had to pay every time you played. And then once you actually, as a player, had the equipment in your pocket or at your home, 
then all of a sudden you started to get a little bit of that power, but you still had to pay for it. And now with Web3, the developer is there only to set the parameters of the game. The economy. The players are the ones driving it. They're the ones earning money from it. And the developer also earns money from it. So if you take, for example, uh, Axie Infinity. So the Axie Infinity is a, a, uh, a game similar to Pokemon, where Pokemons are fighting each other. Most of the people will use Axie Infinity as an example of the play-to-earn uh, type of game in this space. They currently, <coughs> I think last year, they made about 1.3 or 1.4 billion dollars doing this. Now, if you take, for example, and that's with 3 million customers, that's 1% of the global marketplace for games. That's coming from one developer, small developer in Vietnam that made this for the, the Southeast Asia market. And it's they, they, it about 1.4 billion they make, 1% of over global revenue, but that's 3 million customers, but 127 million customers are in Candy Crush. And they make about $0.1 billion less. So that's in the freemium model. Mm. So when, once you in, implement this, this ownership capability, the developer actually makes more money with fewer players. And that's going to catch on more and more as blockchain advances. Yeah, thank you, Evan. So I want to actually bring a question also to other from investors' point of view. Is Web3 gaming is going to kill Web2? But I also wanted to uh, share some of my perspective. I actually tend to agree with Chris that I don't think Web3 is going to actually completely kill Web2 and other games because, you know, I still play like all console games, even though that's no longer in favor. And then, then you know, people are still going to be playing traditional online games and, and Web2 web and mobile games. But Having said that, if someone asks me, so Akio, what kind of game companies have you invested in the last year? We only invest in <laughs> blockchain gaming companies. So that's, that's our reality. And Arthur, as also a, a fellow investor, how do you see this debate here? Sure. Uh, I would say that, first of all, you know, pure, I would say again, I, I'm, I'm with Chris on the Web 2 versus Web 3. I, I personally think it's a spectrum. And I think it really depends on uh, what your users want and really uh you know i really don't see it as a big debate ultimately i think a lot of it would be abstracted away from a user standpoint uh you may have centralized components you may have nfts but uh in our in our opinion in my view it's all going to be you know based on the user experience right the web 2 games never had access to nfts in the past um some web 3 games are you know, taking on a very crypto native approach, uh, that's never going to scale to the masses. So I do think a hybrid approach, in my view, will be what um, really emerged, um, you know, even now and then also into the future. Thank you, Arthur. I think you, I think you have a career fit for a politician. That's a very nice neutral <laughs> <laughs> summarizing everyone here. Now, I know uh, we have about a few mi minutes left, and uh, I wanted to actually make sure everybody took home something that's useful from this panel. So I came up with actually my own question. So we have, you know, four panelists who's right now in the middle of all the latest stuff that's going in the world. And I actually wanted to ask my panelists, if they are giving um, advice to their own children, their sons and daughters, what to study in school? Now, not of course, I'm not assuming that their kids will, if you have kids, they will listen to them actually, but uh, still, as a parent, knowing what you know about this industry, what do your children to study? And what do you recommend? So, maybe starting from Chris. <laughs> I will probably ask my children to study computer science. I just think that in the future, everything is going to be using technology, everything is going to be on the internet, and it's going to be essential skill in life. All right. Uh, what about Gordon? Yeah, you have uh, kids? Yeah, <laughs> I, have, still I have two, two oh, kids. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think there are three, three key, key points. Uh, the first one is um, uh, they need to be passionate 
yeah, uh, uh, be patient that they can, uh, so that they can learn new things. And the, the, the second one is always be open-minded and learning how to learn. And, and the third one is, I, I agree with uh, the, the <coughs> I agree with uh, Chris, uh, you, you sh I think our kids should learn about computer science because it's the, the, the human interface uh, in, in the future. We need to, we need to know how to communicate with the, the machine, just like we, we learn uh, English for okay. now. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, what about you, Arthur? <laughs> uh, really, any subject that uh, interests them, uh, but I would say Web3 created this very interesting mechanism with tokens, and it basically redesigned uh, incentives and how we incentivize people and participants in this ecosystem. But it comes at a cost, uh, and that cost is really trust. So problem solving, trust, anything that teaches you how to communicate with others and build relationships with people. That's a very different answer from that last two. <laughs> and Evan. I'd definitely say, you know, study what you're passionate about, about in general. But um, with my sons right now, what I'm, what I'm really enjoying is teaching them uh, about some of these play to earn games, specifically uh, crypto unicorns. Um, we're, we're, we discussed this in the back. Um, my son's learning about staking, compound interest, uh, all of that, that kind of stuff. Very advanced. Yeah, and, and he's nine years old, but he's really enjoying it. And actually, this new generation, they see true value in NFTs, right? It's part of their lives uh, already. So um, the fact that they're growing up with this sense of ownership over these NFTs, and the fact that he's now paid his three years of tuition at TAS just by playing this game, um, I, he's really happy about it. And um, I, I, I would encourage everyone to uh, find that passion in their life and uh, make money while doing it. Great, thank you, Evan. I think with that, actually we are right on time. And I would like to wrap up this session with those useful uh, answers for hopefully some of our uh, 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 audience members here. But uh, please give a big round of applause to our offline panelists here and online panelists, um, Arthur. Thank you very much, guys. And thank you for Hive for inviting us here. It was fun. OK, great. Thank, thank you, you, guys. Thank you all. Thank you, Arthur. For the last speech, we will be inviting the former uh, CEO of Google Taiwan and the current chairman of APR, Qian Lifeng, to discuss with us the future of enterprise. Let us give him a warm welcome. Thank you for st staying till now. <laughs> I got some privilege from the organizers, and, and I will present in, in Mandarin. In some sense, I'll help local participants to summarize today's speech. Uh, um, I will be giving my speech in Chinese, Mandarin. I think this is a privilege for retired people like me. I've had a lot, of, I have many takeaways for, from the summit today. As my mentee Gordon mentioned, now my my topic today will be the future enterprise. I came um, at noon, which will uh, add in my perspectives as well as my own takeaways from the summit today. Um, my topic today will be more from a developer viewpoint. 
how do we create new industries from a new perspective, but this will be from a technological perspective. So we've learned a lot of things like AI continues to progress and advance simply based on uh, existing AI technology, distributed AI systems will be even better. Well, just like a drone, one drone can already do a lot, but hundreds of drones can do things that humans probably would never be able to achieve. We've also learned that uh, meta is not quite the same as metaverse, but the metaverse is like, uh, is a vague concept to everybody and it means different things to everybody. It's kind of like uh, the American Super Highways that has advanced into the internet now. I don't think I'm quite that old yet, but Web3 is really uh, passing me by. I think by the time we get to Web4, we'll all be within Web3. I've also learned that uh, Web3 has brought decentralization. Is decentralization a buzzword or really achievable? I don't know. I don't believe it because our current infra uh, infrastructure Communications infrastructure is not decentralized. It's only a decentralized layer, but the infrastructure is not quite there yet. It gives us an imagination and a possibility uh, that decentralized de decentralization can achieve many things in the future that was never possible in the past because of the trust industries. And we don't necessarily simply need blockchain by the time we get to 6G or 7G, that might even be more decentralized. And looking at the uh, re Ukraine war, we are also seeing low satellite, low orbit satellites. The importance of low orbit satellites. Uh, at the eve of war, the most important thing is the internet, not necessarily missiles. If your internet is still alive, you have still a possibility of surviving. If you no longer have the internet, then unfortunately, you will not even be able to call for help. And that's something that is very important for Taiwan to consider. We've also seen smart manufacturing applications. Um, this is something very crucial for manufacturers. Um, because Taiwan Semiconductor is so valuable to the whole world, but we're losing talents. We have incredible talents that is moving towards metaverse, AI, blockchain, but that requires AI. So I'd like to think of this from another perspective that is not technology, as we've talked about a lot of technology perspectives already. We have a lot of enterprises that have transformed digitally. Maybe they're digitally, and we have digitally native enterprises as well. We have a few questions. Our operations, our customers, our employees, and our operation, our products. Now there, there are different perspectives from an organizational perspective in terms of the future of enterprise. I think the enterprise model that I taught at Google a few decades ago is still probably the future of enterprise for many enterprises today. Now for a lot of uh, digital native companies, the future for them is different, but fundamentally these four areas will be quite similar. I think more and more so uh, the service, the clients we serve in the future may not necessarily be people but we don't know if we're in the metaverse. I, even I'm confused if we're in the metaverse right now. I don't even know if you guys are humans right now. Are you? Why are you staying here so late? Are you avatars? Are you digital twins? I don't know. Um, but in the future, many of these businesses might be engaging with customers in the digital world or virtual space, and the service is no longer available in a physical space. For example, a lot of, game, uh, a lot of young people that play games in the future maybe tour guides in the game world in the future. They guide people in playing games. In terms of optimizing your operations, uh, there's a lot of technologies in smart manufacturing in Taiwan. But I'd also like to talk about two different points. So we now know that data is incredibly important. 
and your customers are no longer who you necessarily imagined. They are not necessarily physically in front of you, but rather in many different channels. How, what uh, signifies that your customers are completely beyond your imagination? They leave data that represents their behavior. And those behaviors represents your customers and who you are as well. So when we're engaging in our future customers, the model will be absolutely different. Um, now for enterprise, whether it's your customers, your employees, those are changing as well. If we take a look at COVID-19 in the past two years, a lot of graduate students and college students never even entered their campus, so ever set foot on their campus, and they were able to get their degree. According to Harvard, COVID-19 bred a whole generation of students that were incredible with uh, collaborating with each other and synergizing with each other because they are able to fundamentally work remotely uh, with all their classmates. These are also going to be your customers in the future as well. They're very different. If you don't have the capability to attract them, they might, oh, those are your future employees. And if you're not able to attract them, unfortunately, you will lose them. Now, with the emergence of remote work, Honestly, remote work is quite easy because now people with the emergence of remote work can work anywhere in the world. Why do they have to work for you then? So we've already faced uh, this new era. We've seen that companies that have survived uh, the COVID-19 pandemic are already very resilient and have developed resiliency. We see now that businesses are all progressing towards zero zero contact businesses. This has led to um, this has sped up and accelerated digital transformation, and brought us into a new world with the blockchain and the metaverse. But more importantly, they've also accelerated remote work. I benefit from it. Seventeen years ago, when I joined Google, um, there were. 3,000 people, employees working for Google at that time. I completed 10, 20 projects in Google Taiwan. At that time, I didn't have any colleagues in Taiwan yet. 99% of Taiwanese corporations still have yet to achieve um, Google 17 years ago. So when we talk about the future enterprise. I think maybe many companies will have to look at the past two years first. So these kind of uh, resilience, if I would like to conclude today's uh, topics and conversations, I would like to use this uh, topic, this title, intelligence at scale. Regardless of the kind of technology you use, regardless of the type of business you are, in the future enterprise, there's one thing that is of utmost importance, that we have to be able to scale the intelligence. And when I say scale, I mean, the information you've acquired from a single customer must be able, uh, must be applicable to 10 customers, tens of thousands of customers even. Uh, what a single employee can accomplish must be scalable across tens of thousands of employees as well. So from the, the information you acquired from one person, are you able to use your organizational structure so that information and knowledge is applicable to tens of thousands of people? Um, so I've worked at Google for 10 or so years. They have that capability to achieve scalable intelligence. I don't necessarily know if they can achieve, if, it's, uh, if they can accomplish that if there's 200,000 people though. So that's something that I think we could all think about. Now, I'd, I'm trying to get you guys home. Let me quickly finish this. So I talked that I, I mentioned that our new employees and new customers are all uh, who what we call digital natives. I think many of you are, many of you aren't. Digital natives have this characteristics, which is they're multi-tasking. Uh, they do many things at the same time because technology enables it. They have many devices uh, that they're accessing at the same time. They'll have multiple tabs. You have 10 fingers, but they can operate so many things at the same time because they'll have agents and digital twins in the future to help them with that as well. 
which means it, it will, if we're thinking of it per unit, will be doubling the uh, population of the world. Also, they work just for fun and they would leave the job whenever it becomes not fun. They prefer games to serious work. 70% of their time is dedicated to games. And so their online world kind of replaces their offline world. They're probably better communicating online than offline. This is your future employee. I'm sure that in the next three to five years, your employees will have digital natives, will be digital natives in the future. This is the case for Google's maybe 10 years ago already. Now, lastly, maybe I'd like to give you a conclusion uh, about intelligence at scale. I would like to share my Google experience 15 years ago to share with you guys or interpret, further interpret what intelligence at scale means. This is a slide that I used 10 years ago and also the onboarding slide that I saw when I was uh, joining Google. This was talking about Google then, but it is talking about the future of Taiwanese companies. So let's take a quick look at this. First of all, embrace change. That's something that we always need to do. What do we need to embrace? Well, talent in the world. If you have distributed enabled, uh, capabilities, then you have to look for everybody. You have to look for employees from everywhere in the world. My CTO asked me when I was at my Google interview, how many people was I able to uh, bring on board? They could. They only hired one out of five people from Stanford and one out of six people from MIT. When I got 10 people on board in the first year, he told me I exceeded expectations. I had to interview 600 people and went through 3,000 recommendation letters. How do we achieve this today? Well, the bar is the same, but we can now use um, computers. So we go through LinkedIn websites. LinkedIn is Microsoft. Um, but we go through LinkedIn websites. They go through uh, successful engineers, successful uh, work employees, and they're able to successfully predict who will be their future employee. This is the talent of the world, and this will be how enterprises look for talents in the future. If you don't know talented people, if you don't have that network, they won't be able to find you. I think this summer I saw that in the US, um, when you're applying for work to this website, they don't tell you what jobs are available. They give you, they ask you to submit a resume and then tell you what jobs are applicable to you. Um, another thing is uh, during this era, regardless of how we use technology, communication is always important. So organizations must be absolutely transparent and inclusive in order to share all that knowledge and information. Google has achieved that um, many years ago with TGIF, with town hall meetings between senior executives, everybody can talk, everybody can have these conversations. Um, all employees are able to ask questions and your managers, your senior executives are required to answer, respond, and then you can even question them. This was my experience 15 years ago. And I think a lot of enterprises are still learning this communication skill. Um, now, innovation is always a bottom up, while efficiency is always uh, top down. So the bottom up, top down is always going to be in that mix. It will not change because you are a future enterprise. Now, data, data, data. The My takeaway in this afternoon has become information, information, information. Not just that, but also knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. If you can connect all that data to, to uh, generate information and even knowledge, that would be wonderful. We see now that there are many forest fires, but there are no more fatalities among firefighters because we have drones. Firefighters now have uh, 
vision from the sky. They know where to run. They know where to fight. This concept is the progression or bridging from data to knowledge. They connect the data that they see to create knowledge. But that's not knowledge quite yet. That's information. What knowledge is, is after they've generated the model to prevent fires, forest fires. That is what we call knowledge. And we're already developing such kind of models. Um, but we also have to run fast. People that have that are, that have the knowledge, they will run fastest. The tools that I gained 15 years ago is the GCP, uh, the Google Docs, Gmail, all of these things. I was shocked because we were able to edit collaboratively. I, but I, to this day in Taiwan, they still like written meeting records and they don't add anything to it. It's always just approved or disapproved. The organization's information or knowledge will not get passed down in meetings, but all Google document or Google meeting documents are searchable. And the machine learning model will actually uh, store that information and then reinterpret that information for reapplications. When Google engineers are developing apps, they're considering who uh, their target customers are and how they create that foundation for future engineers to build upon. Now, lastly, um, within intelligence at scale, the most important thing is still leadership. I think it's all the leaders that are not here today. Uh, the, all those leaders that are working hard at work at their office, but if they're not engaged with the innovative conversations, they don't know where the tsunami is coming from. They don't know who they're losing out on. So this is what we call the world is fat or the world is flat and who stole our jobs. So if your intelligence was not scalable and has not been scaled up, you won't know who stole your job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chen for concluding our Galaxy Summit. This concludes our summit. Thank you uh, to everybody that participated online and offline. We'll see you next year. Uh, we've also prepared uh, the Blue Lake Strategy book by Mr. Jeff Chen. Please make sure to pick it up on your way out. Thank you very much.